So uh, we're going to get started um, this morning on the, the May 20th, 2020 uh, Board of Regents Spring Meeting. Um, we are still waiting for uh, Regent Dombrowski to join via video, uh, but she is, um, she is calling in and she can hear our audio. Um, uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please note that the call is being uh, recorded uh, and this meeting is open to the public with options for public participation. This meeting is also being live streamed a uh, recording of the call will be available on the Montana University System website, and we will begin the meeting once all board members have joined. The roll call is taken. So that being said, uh, I'm gonna call the meeting to order and ask Amy to take roll. Thank you, Chair Lozar. We'll start with you, Chair Lozar. Here. Thank you. Regent Nice Tune. I see you up there. Regent Sheehy. I'm here. Thank you. Regent Miller? Here. Thank you. Regent Rogers? Here. Thank you. And I know we're working with Regent Dombrowski and she's she can hear us. Uh, Commissioner, or I'm sorry, Regent Tuss? <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Christian? I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Governor Bullock, I know, is joining us this morning, as is Superintendent Elsie Arnston. I'm here, Amy. Thank you, Bob. Hi. I'm back, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, so we got everyone uh, somehow connected into this. Uh, thank you all. Before we start uh, today's business, uh, I'd like to first and foremost uh, congratulate our Montana University System class of 2020. Uh, we continue to be inspired by your agility and your resilience and your courage you've shown in the face of challenges you couldn't have imagined when you began your college journey. Uh, that said, I don't want the challenges of the past few months to overshadow all the tremendous achievements you have made since the day you began your education. I thank you for entrusting your future in the best university system in the country. And I know you'll make the most of your hard earned diploma or your credentials you now hold. So on behalf of the Montana Board of Regents of Higher Education, I wish you a lifetime of continued personal and professional success. I look forward to the important contributions you'll make in Montana and in the United States and across this globe. Like our graduates, we have all made adjustments and sacrifices over the past couple months. And on that note, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Montana State University Northern. As you all know, this meeting was originally scheduled to be up in Haver, and I'd like to thank Chancellor Kegel and his staff for their willingness to host us and their flexibility as plans have changed. And we regret that we can't be on your beautiful campus today. I also know that a, a great deal of uh, advanced work went into setting up this new uh, virtual format. And I wanna thank Amy Unsworth for her efforts to make today's meeting run smoothly. I know she has hosted many uh, separate calls, one-on-one -on -one calls, group calls to make sure that we are ready to go. So thank you so much, Amy. Many of you will notice that you cannot turn on your video or your sound, and this is by design. In a moment, I will ask Amy to walk you through the technical aspects uh, of the meeting this morning. While this is the first time in years that we haven't been able to hold our meeting on the scheduled campus, it's only a small adjustment compared with the changes our university system has already made in response to COVID-19 and the challenges that lie ahead. The pandemic has touched every member of our Montana University System family, from the graduates whose commencement ceremonies were rescheduled or held online, to the student who lost their part-time job, to the faculty member who continues to work long hours to provide their students with a high quality remote learning experience. COVID-19 has impacted every facet of our operations and will continue to challenge us as leaders for some time to come. But our system's remarkable response over the past couple months gives me confidence that we have the resilience, the ingenuity, and the agility to continue our mission to make high quality, affordable higher education available to all Montanans. That mission 
is, is much more important now than ever before as we fulfill our role as a driver of our state's economic recovery. In fact, our COVID-19 response will occupy a considerable amount of our agenda and our time today as Commissioner Christian and his staff brief us on the various elements of the response. Additionally, uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, Trevor will talk about the present law budget adjustment for the 2023 biennium and long range building plan priorities. Deputy Commissioner Trevor will provide an overview of our proposed legislative initiatives. Also of note is an informational item uh, from Acting Chief Legal Counsel Helen Thigpen on board review and approval of all new, uh, approval of new athletic programs. Deputy Commissioner Tessman is gonna walk us uh, through our two-year mission fulfillment during the two-year community college committee. Helen will also provide us an update on the Bitterroot Valley Community College Initiative. And then Dr. Tessman will lead us into the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee, which we have a very full agenda in that committee. Uh, lastly, we'll take a public comment. Uh, we will consider action on today's agenda items, and then we will have our officer elections. So with that, um, again, I wanted to thank uh, everyone in the university system from staff to students to uh, the family members who had to make changes in the, this past spring, the faculty members who quickly jumped on board and changing their learning uh, format. We really appreciate uh, you, you being open and willing to take on um, the innovation that has come to our, our university system. With that, Amy, I will uh, turn it over to you to address some of the technical components uh, for today's meeting. Thank you, Chair Lozar. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Chair Lozar indicated, many of you will notice that you cannot turn on your video or sound. Again, this is by design. Please note that the board members will be displayed throughout the entirety of the meeting as we navigate through committees and items. If you are a presenter or speaking to an item, Ochi will put you into the panelist view mode when it is time for you to present, and Zoom will prompt you to turn on your camera. Please be, please be prepared to unmute and turn on your video when prompted. A quick note that the Zoom system will alert you when your line is muted or unmuted, when your video should be turned off or turned on, and if your raised hand has been acknowledged by the host. If at any point you need to step away from the meeting, please do not exit the meeting from Zoom. Simply mute yourself and make sure your video is turned off. For those who are joined via Zoom today and not watching by the live stream or the phone, please stay logged on through the entirety of today's meeting. For campus CEOs that are joined through Zoom today, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment during the meeting, please use the raise your hand feature from the participant panel near the bottom of your screen or dial star nine, that's the asterisk followed by the numeral nine, if you're joined to audio by phone and wait to be called on. There is a time scheduled for public comment and additional instructions will come at that time. Written public comment may also be sent to me, Amy Unsworth at aunsworth at montana.edu. If you run into technical issues at any point, please email Jared Smith at jsmith at montana.edu for assistance. Jared is on standby to assist you. Again, Jared's email is jmontana.edu. Back to you, Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, so we're gonna turn to uh, approval of the minutes. Uh, we've got uh, meeting minutes from March 5th and 6th, and then we have uh, meeting minutes from April 16th for our conference call. Uh, board members, I will entertain a motion to approve both meeting minutes. So moved. Moved by Regent Miller. Is there any discussion or corrections from members of the board? Seeing none. Is there any discussion or, or comments from campuses? If so, please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if joining by phone. Seeing none, is there any public comment? If so, please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if you're joining by phone. Good 
Good deal. Seeing, seeing no public uh, comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Okay, motion passes. The meeting minutes have been approved. So I'll turn it over to Commissioner Christian for his system update and system report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome to everyone. Thank you uh, for participating in uh, this new format. Uh, we certainly miss being in, in uh, the great city of Haver and on uh, a beautiful campus we have up there at Northern, but uh, we will make do with this and uh, appreciate every appreciate everyone's uh, indulgence as, as we work uh, through this. Um, as the chair noted, we have a number of uh, COVID-19 related uh, responses and, and explanations uh, for you today. As we know, uh, that has touched a, a lot of us. Um, and then we'll also take a few minutes to walk through uh, sort of where we think we go from here. Uh, but before I get into that, I would like to uh, just make a few quick announcements, uh, starting with uh, a very important announcement to us, the 2020 Regents Awards for Excellence in the University System Citizenship. And that goes to uh, a staff member from uh, the MUS. That process uh, is to recognize uh, a staff who have really risen uh, uh, above and beyond the call of duty and, and reached an outstanding level of service. These uh, nominations are provided to us by MUSA or the Montana University System Staff Association uh, for consideration. And we're very proud to announce that this year's recipient is Jody Todd. Jody is a, a grant support specialist for the College of Humanities and Science at the University of Montana. Uh, she was chosen uh, for, as we said, her excellence in service and her work above and beyond uh, the normal course of duty. Um, she's maintained a productive research grant pipeline at the University of Montana, serving as the college's sole grant specialist, helping initiate 50 new grants this last fiscal year while continuing to maintain a portfolio of 120 ongoing grants. Meanwhile, she also took on roles as budget analyst and others as department vacancies needed her services on campus. Her efforts have directly contributed to the college's prominent standing in discovery, innovation, teaching, and learning. And her worth ethics and dedication and leadership have made her a very uh, uh, worthy recipient of this Regents Award. So Jody, thank you very much. I'm sorry you're not here in person to hand you your award. Uh, we have sent it to you. And I just asked the board to take a moment to recognize Jody for her service. Also, I uh, would like to move on and, and take a moment to make a, a, another recognition, and that is uh, of our own uh, OCHI staff member, Viv Hamill. Viv uh, and I had a conversation in January uh, and talked about her pending retirement. After 40 years, uh, Viv has decided that uh, she's had enough of us and state government <laughs> and all things that come with it. And that's certainly uh, an honor that she deserves. She will be, in fact, retiring. Her last day with us will be uh, uh, June 5th. Somehow uh, Viv has uh, earned that name like Madonna. She's just a, if you say Viv anywhere in state government, they know exactly who you're talking about. Uh, her leadership and formidable legal acumen will be sorely missed uh, across uh, the Montana University system and, and certainly throughout state government. I just want to take a moment uh, after a 40 years of service to recognize a few of the, the uh, milestones in, in Viv's career. She started uh, as a clerk in the California appellate system uh, for Judge Lilly. She also clerked uh, at the Superior Court for Judge Cohen and Judge McDonald. She spent 11 years in private practice there at her own firm of uh, Hamill and Wolf, which probably should have been Viv and Wolf, but uh, Hamill. And she served as a city commissioner in San Francisco. And that's all prior to getting to Montana. In Montana, she served as uh, legal counsel for the Department of Administration, chief legal counsel for the Department of Labor and Industry, legal counsel, and then later chief of staff for former Governor Brian Schweitzer, and uh, certainly uh, for the last uh, 
eight years as uh, MUS Chief Legal Counsel for us. So I just want to take a moment to congratulate uh, Viv on a career well done and uh, wish her the best of luck in retirement. She had a lot of travel plans. That's how the June date came about. Uh, June 6th, they were headed overseas, and those, of course, have been postponed, but uh, they'll be back on the docket as soon as uh, travel resumes, and uh, we wish her well in her journeys. Then uh, a couple other announcements. Um, it, it, on that last note, I, I want to make sure everybody understands we will still be in good hands. Uh, Helen Thigpen, who's been associate counsel for a number of years, will serve as uh, acting legal counsel till uh, sometime in the summer when we start to figure out what normal looks like, and and we will move to. Uh, fully staff uh, our legal team here on campus or at uh, Ochi and she'll she'll be working with campuses um, in an oversight role uh, and certainly advising the board on all legal matters. So we welcome Helen to that position. Also uh, wanna welcome Sandra, Sandra Bowman to uh, the acting Dean CEO of Helena College. Um, as you know, uh, Laura Vasepka, uh, had a, a number of challenges uh, related to the COVID and her family and, and some needs to go back uh, home to Michigan. And so she's done that. And we have uh, put uh, Dr. Bowman in, in uh, leadership position there. She's been part of that team for a number of years now. She understands the college inside and out. Um, she's familiar with the Montana University system. She understands the needs of the Helena community. And we really believe that she will... Uh, hit the ground running. So I want to thank her for accepting uh, that appointment and stepping into that role in fairly short order and uh, welcome her to the position. I also want to thank uh, Chancellor Edelman, who has recently been appointed to uh, serve on the governor's uh, board of veteran affairs. Uh, as a U.S. Army veteran himself, he comes uh, well equipped to help our state and our country uh, with a, a number of issues that surround veterans. And so we welcome him to that position. So with that, I'd like to dive into uh, a few topics for um, the commissioner's comments this morning. And uh, got uh, Tyler and Brock uh, on standby here. They will deal with parts of this from another room, which is kind of odd, but again, we'll make it work. Um, you know, I, I guess we really can't have this meeting without talking a little bit about uh, COVID-19. Um, we met not long ago in uh, Dillon, Montana, and uh, as a group, it seems in some ways like a really long time ago, in other ways uh, just yesterday, but uh, eight weeks ago, it wasn't long after that, uh, changed the world for a lot of us in a number of ways uh, around uh, the state and around the country. I, I you know, don't need to go through the list. I think you all know what has happened and it's been well reported, but a number of changes occurred in the Montana University system from moving to remote learning to clearing campuses to, uh, you know, figuring out ways that we can still be open to serve the needs of some students that needed to be on campus and some students that needed to learn on campus and faculty and others. So, uh, we worked through uh, some amazing times there, and I, I truly want to send my thanks to student, faculty, staff, and of course our administrative teams on those campuses for uh, just an outstanding job well done. We're, we're not always known for our ability to move quickly, and uh, yet uh, I think we showed incredible resilience, dedication, flexibility, perseverance uh, as a team, and I, it was a team. It was uh, students helping faculty to learn new uh, formats like Zoom and faculty helping students uh, to continue their learning objectives. And uh, it, it, it truly was uh, uh, an impressive response uh, to a pandemic that, um, you know, in some ways uh, didn't take us by surprise and in other ways took us by surprise. I, Deputy Commissioner Tessman and I were talking yesterday at the March meeting. We gave an update of what our uh, plans looked like. And uh, I, I think his closing comments were uh, something like, we're as prepared as we can be. Uh, of course, I don't know what that means, but we were as prepared as we could be. And it didn't all uh, play out exactly as we'd scripted, but that's the nature of it. And I think we responded to it. 
I also want to, you know, recognize that many of these decisions move quickly um, and they don't come uh, easy. But in, in order to do that, it took uh, a great nimbleness from other people around the system. And I want to at least recognize a few of those, certainly our campus leadership teams, response teams on each campus, but also some sort of unsung heroes like Tammy Harris and uh, union leadership on campus that had to rally troops and, and really identify uh, through shared governance channels what needed to be done, how it needed to be done, how it could best serve students and keep faculty and staff uh, safe at all times, working with shared governance channels with students and other participants. Those were uh, important pieces. They weren't always allowed the level of uh, uh, time uh, and input that we hope for, but we certainly did uh, reach out and receive tremendous feedback uh, quickly uh, to help us make some of those decisions. And then honestly, uh, I, I thank the board for your uh, engagement throughout this. Um, you took calls on Friday night at 11 o'clock and you took calls at Sunday mornings at 6.30 a.m., uh, to be apprised of some of the things that were going on and, and provide input for these decisions. And I, I really think as a team uh, from the Board of Regents through the administrative uh, branches, uh, the OCHI team here, students, faculty and beyond, uh, we, we made remarkable change and I appreciate everybody's uh, efforts in that. With that said, uh, that was the first step of this journey. And now we need to figure out how we make the next step. And that's returning safely to campus uh, with the pandemic uh, still uh, in effect. We've certainly seen some uh, improvements in the illness rates, but uh, we know it's out there. We know that uh, most of the epidemiologists uh, predict either a late summer surge or fall surge uh, that could return to higher levels. And so we need to work through that because honestly, uh, we need students back on campus. Students want to be on campus. Uh, faculty want to be on campus teaching. That's what everybody signed up for. Uh, that level of engagement, that interaction uh, with students face to face. And I've even heard from a few parents, they're ready for their students to be back on campus. Uh, and that's a good thing too. But to do that, we've seated, um, uh, a task force that's being led by uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. We refer to that as the Healthy Fall uh, 2020, and that really is working through. It's a, it's a broad uh, task force that engages people from the administrative level, but throughout what it will take to get people back on campus. Um, that means registrars, that means facilities, how we will utilize the campus in new ways, in different ways than we have in the past to approach uh, what will need to be somewhat of a new normal this fall. So I've asked Brock if he would share a little bit of the work that's going on there. So Brock, if you're on and can hear me, oh, I got a thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, let us know what you're up to. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, be happy to. First, I do want to confirm that that uh, my audio is working. I got a thumbs up. Okay. Um, well, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Christian, you know this spring really was uh, quite a bit about crisis management. Um, as uh, we were prepared uh, as of the March, uh, March board meeting for for the COVID nineteen crisis. Certainly, there were some unscripted challenges along the way, and and so the spring was very much characterized by that crisis management. But also, uh, life did go on in many different ways. I think, as you mentioned, our faculty and students did a great job adapting to remote delivery. Uh, in fact, we did graduate uh, uh, our our set of uh, graduating students this spring. And although the commencement ceremonies weren't exactly what we had planned. I think uh, everyone is very proud of our campus's ability to get students through. Uh, other elements of normal life went on. You all know as board members that the Perkins 5 state plan was approved and will bring about $60 million or more uh, to the state of Montana over the next decade or so. And at, at any rate, my point is that we have to start thinking about the longer term. And so really as April got underway, we started to see around the corner uh, we we're in constant communication with public health authorities at the state level, 
at the local level, uh, other statewide authorities. We had our eye on national trends and state projections. And at that point in time, we really did begin uh, planning for a healthy return to on-campus instruction and on-campus student life uh, this fall. And Commissioner Christian uh, charged me with uh, uh, convening the Healthy Fall 2020 Task Force and having us work with uh, campus networks, uh, my colleagues here at Ochi, uh, and, and certainly public health authorities in order to develop a set of planning guidelines for campuses to operate with as they begin to make uh, specific detailed plans for a return this fall. And I'll, I'll tell you, I think it's been mentioned already, I don't want it to be lost. We have real informed projections about uh, what, what the situation will look like this fall. However, we'll always be monitoring the public health situation. We'll always be in close communication with uh, public health authorities and other statewide authorities. And, and of course, we'll adjust along the way as necessary. But our best plan, our best projection is that we'll be able to take uh, uh, the appropriate precautionary measures and really be able to deliver a very high quality experience for students and employees uh, that also mitigates the, the health and safety risks that we know accompany COVID-19. So just very briefly, a little bit more about the Healthy Fall Task Force and communication with public health authorities and other statewide authorities. In, in of course, uh, the best alone way. The task force itself, our best plan, our best project, relatively small, is that we'll be able to take. I'm sorry, Amy, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, the task force itself is relatively small, it's kind of a core planning committee. And so we pulled together 12 uh, uh, leaders from across the system student affairs leaders, academic affairs leaders, because we felt that's the core of the experience, both academic and otherwise, that, that we wanna be able to provide our students. We brought those folks together. And since that point, the task force has really gone through a process of internal discussions, but then very much external consultation, uh, seeking feedback from larger campus networks, campus communities, and again, uh, public health authorities. So it's been kind of a rubber band process where we get together and do some focused work, but then reach out because we realize that it takes uh, a great deal of wisdom and a lot of different perspectives in order to put together the right set of guidelines. The second thing I'd like to emphasize about our work is that the guidelines we're developing are really planning guidelines. Um, we are not putting together a specific plan for each and every campus throughout the Montana University system. It's my conviction, I'm quite sure it's the commissioner's conviction uh, that each campus understands the ins and outs of its own uh, environment, its own uh, uh, qualities and cultures. And so while we'll produce basic guidelines, sideboards, if you will, the campuses will fill in these planning guidelines with their own operational tactical level plan as the summer progresses. And the last thing that I would note, uh, of course, is that as campuses go through that process, they should continue to engage multiple stakeholders, students, staff, faculty, uh, campus community, and in surrounding communities. We know that there could be adjustments to this plan uh, or to campus plans as the summer goes on, but now is the time. This is a complex effort and uh, in order to produce a healthy fall environment, we really do have to get in, uh, engaged in this kind of planning uh, in the present. And, and while uh, the work is certainly in progress, we are uh, nearing the conclusion of our, our task force work, at least for now. And I would hope in the next two weeks or so, I'll have a, a draft set of guidelines to present to the commissioner and, and I'm sure he'll communicate to the board and, and ultimately we can get those to the campuses so they can continue their planning uh, in earnest. Uh, way we've organized the document, and just to, to give you a, a bit of a flavor, we've identified the operational areas that constitute the day-to-day -day business of our campuses. In other words, sort of the things that campuses do, um, everything from delivering high quality instruction to providing student housing, uh, conducting business operations, maintaining buildings and facilities. So we have about 10 of these operational areas and what we've done is identify essential planning guidelines. And these are things that campuses really do need to take into account as they build their own plans. And then we've identified planning considerations. And these are um, 
suggestions, uh, tidbits uh, that we think campuses could use as they, uh, as they will, as, as they build out their plans in earnest. There are also some integrated guidelines related to things like travel policy, uh, the use of technology, communications policy. So I, I could go on for quite a bit because we actually do have uh, a lot of our work uh, done, but I'll stop there and I'll let you know that um, our campuses will be ready to welcome students back uh, and deliver the kind of experience that they've come to expect from the Montana University system. I think this is really positive news. I think there are some ways in which our campuses will be uh, even stronger than they were before this crisis. And I'm really looking forward to see the campuses uh, put out their specific plans and to see uh, all of our students and, and parents back in August and September. Uh, Commissioner Christian, I will stop there. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or perhaps they're best saved until later. But thank you very much for the chance to give an update on this. Thanks, Brock. Uh, we appreciate that. I, I, I guess a, a couple thoughts. Uh, we, we are planning um, for a uh, healthy return to campus. And I know some areas, some systems, some campuses are still sort of waiting through if there will be decision points throughout the summer or that. I, uh, What I've heard over and over and over is congratulations, good job uh, for moving to remote online learning in a hurry when it was necessary. But uh, we very much uh, need, want, and enjoy the, the campus experience. And, and so the task is to figure out how we do that safely. I think we're uh, well on our way to having some good recommendations and to having uh, the support of our state and federal or state and local uh, health advisory uh, panels to uh, make certain that we're doing this in accordance with the guidelines that are provided, but also uh, just in, in taking care of our students and uh, making for a healthy environment. Um, there, we, we are going to have much more on this as the day goes on. Tyler's talking uh, about some of the finan financial implications, the stimulus rollout uh, and other things in the budget committee. And then uh, Brock will also speak to more of these items uh, in, in Region Sheehy's ARSA committee. And so we'll be able to address some of those, but I do wanna just pause for a moment. And, and if people have questions, uh, we can get to questions that that are in your head now, so you don't forget them for later. But just know, I, I, I'm, I'm certain, given all that's going on, everybody's thinking we just want more information, and we're going to have more as the day unfolds. But to Mr. Commissioner, uh, it looks like Regent Sheehy has has a question. Regent Sheehy, thanks, Chair. Um, I just want to point out at this juncture that the work of the Healthy Fall Committee is work that I think should be conducted by the board or delegated by the board. And um, I understand the need for nimbleness during times of emergency, but there, I think there should be board involvement in some of these decisions because they're policy-based. So I would uh, encourage, uh, as you plan for the future, that the plan includes board involvement in a more um, uh, regular way, as opposed to informational. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Um, yeah, certainly we can, we can, uh, make that happen. And, and, um, we, you know, we, we will in a more consultative way, we have, uh, certainly have calls with the leadership team and, and we will, we'll work to figure out how we get broad input as we work through this. Other questions or thoughts? Okay, we'll uh, we'll return to that topic. Did, did you say? Yeah, yeah. I, no, I wanted to follow up on Regent Sheehy's point. I think Regent Sheehy make a, a a great point. I think having um, you know very consistent communication uh, over the next uh, two three months as we get closer to having our students back on campus. I think that's a, uh, a that that makes a lot of sense. So um, we we can count on that consistent communication. I, I also wanted to, to, to pause on that same point and, and thank the members of the board uh, for this spring for, uh, and, and the commissioner and the deputy commissioners that helped to keep us informed throughout, uh, certainly throughout all of 
all of April and as, as decision points and things came up uh, on campus as we were looking towards the fall um, that, that the commissioner kept us, kept us informed. So as we move forward, uh, we'll continue to find, um, find the opportunity to engage, uh, update, seek, seek input and counsel from, uh, from members of the, the board. So thank you, Regent Sheehy, for bringing that up. Casey, I want to be really clear about something. I appreciate information, but I think that we are the decision makers. I think that's our constitutional obligation. And so I think that as a board, we should, we should be delegating this authority to plan the policy for how we'll come back online. And by online, I don't mean online. Uh, but I think we're decision makers, and I don't think that we have made these decisions. So I, I get what happens in times of emergencies. I understand and appreciate the nimbleness of Ochi. But uh, to be clear, I think this is our job, and I think we should either conduct this or delegate it officially. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Uh, Regent Nystuen? Thank you, Chair Lozar. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, endorse the comments that Regent Sheehy has made. I, I feel like you've had to make a lot of decisions in uh, weighty decisions that need to do occur early and fast and be nimble. But I think now is a time that we as the Board of Regents should elevate our game with more than just information, but to actually be involved in this as we look at the financial consideration, enrollment, recruiting, a number of those types of factors. So I would appeal to you, Chair Lozar, Commissioner Christian, to elevate the communications and involvement on the behalf of the Board of Regents. Thank you. So noted. Thank you, Regent Nystuen. Any other questions, comments on that topic? I think Paul wants in. Oh, we can't. Oh, we don't see Paul right now. Um, you just yeah, click that. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep, Regent Tess. Yeah, perhaps perhaps a question um, for for commissioner or your staff. Um, how, how coordinated or not is is the fall schedule for the Montana University system going to look like as we compare that to other systems? Not that that's critical, but is there is there a rule of thumb or certain rules or what are other systems doing and how close are we to kind of the, the national norm if there even is such a thing? Uh, Chair Lozar, Regent Tuss, I, you know, I'm not sure there is a national norm because I'm not sure the pandemic is affecting the country as a whole in the same manner as you, you look across it. So, you know, there's a number of, of uh East Coast schools, some West Coast schools that are harder hit. Certainly the East Coast has been incredibly hard hit by the pandemic. They, uh, you know, in, in some cases, they won't even have the facilities back in their own uh, control to, to try to move back on campus. So they will address this fall much different. Um, I think Montana, uh, through some wise decisions throughout our, our in, is in a really good place right now. We, we still have the lowest uh, per capita infection rate in the country. And that's something that all Montanans should be very proud of. Uh, and the leadership should be very proud of uh, for our state. And we applaud that effort, um, but we're in a little different boat. So we probably can approach fall a little different than uh, some around the country. So I, well, well, and, and Brock mentioned, you know, we're, we're seeking input from other systems. Um, we get a lot of advice through national associations. Uh, I have a call every other week uh, with the SHEA organization, and we have a call every other week with the WICHE organization to see what's going on around the West and around the country. Uh, best practice, and we're certainly trying to involve that in, in the planning process. Um, our presidents serve on committees uh, throughout too, from uh, intercollegiate athletics to the uh, ACE and other national organizations that are providing feedback. So we're monitoring that closely, but I still think that we will probably need to sort of make our own way as we move to fall. Uh, 
and what fits Montana best given uh, how the, the pandemic is affecting us here locally. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? And we can't see everybody all the time. So sometimes a hand wave doesn't work uh, in the chat boxes, the raise your hand feature, um, but different people can see different tiles of people on Zoom. So if you see somebody waving, let us know. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Then the last uh, thing that I want to pause for just a second, just want to uh, welcome Regent Dombrowski. Um, we see you got your, your video working, so welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention, and then we'll go to some of the other items in the commissioner's report, but um, many of you may know or, or may not that on May 6th, the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Education released the new Title IX regulations. There is some pretty sweeping changes in those. And they govern how university colleges and K-12 address reported sex-based discrimination, which is very broad from sexual assault to uh, other forms of harassment and misconduct to equitable funding uh, for uh, sex-based uh, allocation. Um, so we will be looking at those. Jessica Weltman, who is our compliance uh, person at OCHI, will be leading a team to try to review and understand the rule change. Um, I, I would mention that uh, the most of the national organizations asked for a year to implement these changes. We were given till August 14th to implement them, which is a very short fuse given some of the other things that we're dealing with as a country, but uh, we will work toward that goal. Um, we're again working with national partners. Uh, there's a lot of uh, NACUA and other legal teams that are working on this around the country that provide uh, a resource for us. They're having uh, meetings every week to every other week uh, to discuss the changes. And we will be uh, learning more about this and we will be bringing more information to you all as a board uh, in future meetings. Helen, Jessica, and the entire MUS team uh, have this on, on their plates and, and will work to uh, do what is necessary to implement the changes. The system will uh, continue to prohibit sexual misconduct under Title IX. Uh, and we will see that each campus address uh, any reported activities of sexual misconduct, sexual harassment, and beyond in a fair and respectful manner. We'll continue to provide support to those that are harmed and proactively offer robust prevention and awareness programs as we've been doing uh, in the past. I, I want everyone to know we take uh, sexual misconduct of any kind uh, incredibly seriously. And we want every student to be able to pursue their educational goals across the university system. Uh, and we want every faculty and staff member to be able to work in that system uh, in a safe environment. And that is the goal, I, I believe, of the rule changes, uh, but it certainly will be the, the guiding principles for the university system as we work to implement those rule changes. So more to follow. It's, it's fairly uh, new out and it's uh, fairly lengthy. We're really in the process of trying to digest the changes right now. Um, like I said, some of them are pretty sweeping and pretty involved. Uh, so we will uh, do our best to to bring back uh, information along those lines. Any questions on that? Knowing I don't have too many answers on that just yet. <laughs> um, all right, well then uh, I'd like to turn uh, to the next item on there and, and to Deputy Commissioner Trevor uh, for a, a quick enrollment update. Regent Tusty. Regent uh, Johnson had a comment there. Sorry, Regent, Regent, Regent Johnson Miller. Uh, early on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, John. You've been no, elevated to hey. CEO of uh, Edward or <laughs> Regent Miller. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I just have a question about that uh, task force um, that you were saying was going to look into this. Who will be involved from that or with that task force from Ochi and from the board? Um, 
Chair Lozar, Regent Miller, uh, if I said task force, I'm not sure I meant that. The, the We have a legal team that is reviewing it right now. Um, maybe we'll create a task force, uh, but we're trying to just sort of get our arms around what needs to be changed. Uh, and so we can start to look at what the, the implications are across the system. But if we uh, form a task force, we'll certainly seek for some guidance on what that should look like. Perfect. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? Okay. Then uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, if you're on uh, a few bars about the enrollment, please. You're on mute, maybe. Yeah, Mr. Commissioner, there you go. Mr. Commissioner, members of the board, good morning. Hope you can hear me well. Uh, I come to you from the fireside room here at Ochi. A couple of bars about the enrollment report. This is our annual uh, enrollment report. Um, just as a uh, line of reference, we have a fall enrollment report that gives you the update as we head into the fall semester. And then in the spring, at the end of the spring, we combine fall enrollment with spring and add, also add in summer and give you an average of what it is for the years, the average annual fiscal year report. And that's what we have for you. And I believe Heather could open that report just one click. And just some basic tenants about the report. It's a focus on student FTE, uh, again, in the fall, we'll bring you FTE as well as student headcount and demographics. The reason that the fiscal year report focuses primarily or solely on FTE is that we use these figures in our budgeting process. And so also unique to this report, or at least the last several reports that we've brought to you in this new era of our dashboards, uh, is that this is really a storybook or a self self-service report and up across the top you see there's gray boxes that have text in them and you can literally uh, click to I, I believe the right and it'll take you through um, resident student enrollment non-resident student enrollment graduate programs enrollment by campus enrollment by community colleges and also give you the ability to change attributes within the report that will change the charts that's sort of the, uh, the, the nature of our dashboards. Uh, we have uh, a variety of other dashboards uh, that are also linked from this page. I, I'd be more than happy to, uh, I'm being told maybe I'm a little bit too loud. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you have specifics. Uh, with that, Mr. Commissioner, I'd turn it back to you. Uh, to help facilitate. Yeah, so we have, uh, where we're in different rooms, um, Tyler doesn't really have the clicker and to walk through them. I, I think uh, they've done a great job with that storyline. We will have uh, links that we can provide to certainly all the board members, but anybody else that wants to, to look through them, um, they're pretty self-explanatory as to uh, where we're at. And as Tyler said, they're used for internal planning purposes uh, to create uh, the budgets that you will see in the process moving forward. Any questions there? And again, you know, as, as I'm sure COVID questions come to mind, we will address some of those in the budget committee later today, what the, the impacts and what the projections both nationally and, and in state look like. Okay. Um, if we could then, again, the campus reports are uh, posted. We're including some of those uh, different campus events now in the musings as well. So look for those in both places. Uh, I, I think we're uh, reaching a, a pretty broad swath with musings these days. Uh, I think there's 3,500 or something subscribed. So it's good that we're getting that message out. We're trying to include different features uh, as we go along, but uh, certainly these campus reports also provide a good glimpse into what's happening at campuses. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of an interesting format for uh, 
the introductions, but I know we do have some. I, I know, uh, raise your hand if you do. We can go to Seth because I know he's got one. It looks like Beth does too. Uh, who's on? Is Beth. Beth is on right now. So Beth, if you want to go ahead and we'll come back to Seth. Muted. Beth, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I, I have two items I'd like to share. And the first is that after four years of really excellent work, our provost, Deb Hedin, will be leaving us to become the president of the University of Maine at Fort Kent. Fort Kent. Um, this is a great loss for us, but it's I'm very excited for Deb. She'll make a wonderful president, and it's definitely the gain of Fort Kent. She really came to us with the experience and the energy that um, we needed to help us build on the promise of experience one. And just to mention a couple of her accomplishments, she created a more robust, sustainable academic structure. She better aligned academic and student affairs, supported faculty professional development, and created ways to foster student leadership development. She led the creation of a new strategic plan, which you'll hear about. And she's just been such a, a positive uh, presence, both on our campus and in the MUS. I know that, that we all wish her all the best. We're really gonna miss Deb. I'm clapping. <laughs> and then um, I'm very pleased to share that Dr. Jenny McNulty will be joining us as the interim provost starting on July 1st. And I wanna thank Presidents Bodner and Cruzado and Provost Tarber and Makwa for helping us to quickly identify excellent candidates. Um, it just was a, a, just such a good process. Um, Jenny is, has been the associate and then the interim provost uh, at UM. It's their, of the uh, College of Humanities and Sciences, UM's largest and most complex college. She's a full professor of math, and I think she's just going to be a great fit. Can't wait to work with her. So thank you so much for the opportunity to um, share these two transitions. Thank you. We appreciate that. And, and uh, best of luck to uh, uh, Deb and, and welcome uh, on board. So uh, any, other, any other announcements, any other introductions? Mr. Chair, uh, I believe then we are ready to turn this back to you and we are right at our appointed time. So that would work well. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Just a, just a couple things I wanted to underscore. I know we we will be talking more about um, sort of plans and, uh, and our responses uh, due to the pandemic for this, this upcoming fall and what we've done uh, so far this spring. But I, I wanted to underscore two things in your, your report and one being the Regents Award for Excellence. Um, you know, this was a something that we had had in our, our policies for on almost 20 years, um, and we've had conversations with Musa over the past two or three years, and and with their leadership and 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 your leadership as the commissioner. Uh, personally, I'm very excited that uh, we are now really leveraging this policy and uh, shining a spotlight on on staff staff members in the system who are doing uh, incredible things and make, having incredible achievements. So. Uh, thanks to you and and, and Kevin for um, making sure that uh, we're honoring our staff and and, and again congratulations to to Ms. Todd for uh, for this year's award and then lastly just want to underscore um, how big of a deal the Perkins Five is and I know uh, you briefly mentioned that but this board has seen updates uh, for the past couple years on on Perkins Four and and plans for Perkins Five so. You know, sixty million dollars uh, in in our state for ten years is is a really big deal. So thank you, uh, congratulations to your staff, to Jackie, and and all those that worked on making sure that we could bring those resources to bear uh, in the state of Montana. 
So with that, um, we'll transition um, to the next part of our agenda. And I, I see Governor Bullock is, is online. He's, he's one of the individuals on our tiles up on the screen. Uh, Governor Bullock, uh, we'll turn this over to you and uh, look forward to listening to your, your comments, your remarks. I just wanted to extend our gratitude uh, to you, Governor, for all the work you've done the past couple months and making sure that uh, that our citizens are healthy and, and that we're, uh, our economy is, is looking like we're on track to recover. So, Governor Bullock. Great, thanks, Chair uh, Lozar and members of the regents and staff. Uh, it's great to get to spend a little bit of time with you this morning. Uh, first, I want to thank you for taking the initiative to really keep Montana students, faculty, and staff safe during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know that the decisions weren't easy ones to make. I've been having regular conversations, certainly with uh, the commissioner, but I think you made the right ones for individuals and communities. And also thank you for guiding students through one of the most challenging eras in the history of our state and nation. And to Chair Lozar's point, I mean, we, including you all, did take aggressive action. Uh, you know, we'd closed our K-12 schools before places like New York, New Jersey, uh, Washington State, stay-at-home order well before over half of the states in the country. And those results showed. I mean, we have the lowest hospitalizations per capita in the nation. We have the lowest positive cases uh, in the nation per capita as well. And I know that, uh, well, that's been a challenge. I also know that there's been a lot of uncertainty around it. As leaders in our education system, uh, the struggles of faculty, staff, and students are deeply felt by each and every one of you. And, but because of actions like yours, we are in a much better position. We have to continue this effort to keep Montana's healthy as we reopen our classrooms, residence halls, libraries again. I just announced yesterday going to sort of phase two of the reopening of uh, starting June 1st. Um, as we reopen, we want to reopen safely, though. And we also want to ensure that what we've learned over this last eight weeks isn't forgotten because really keeping us safe. Montana's keeping safe. It's on each and every one of us. And the only way we can do this is collectively as a community. And I have no doubt that just as uh, you're creative in making decisions and arrangements for online schooling, now doing the same as we look to next year. And I've had conversations with just as, first of all, and to step back, uh, like even as we open gateway communities and things, one of the things that we're really doing is working with them to ensure that not only is the messaging correct and understood, but also that we have the testing capacity there, both for surveillance testing and frontline worker testing and continuing to know what's happening with this virus, because we got to figure out a way to live with it, with it still in our presence. And I've had great conversations already with Commissioner Christian about ways that we can partner uh, providing state resources to do what higher ed will need along the way. Um, and you certainly have my commitment to doing that as we go forward. And love to say that everything is going to be just like it all was before um, all this started, but at the end of the day, it is, we've got to figure out just the ways to adjust and move forward. So really do appreciate all of your efforts and uh, the good work that higher ed continues to do. And I think it is another one of those demonstrations of, or understandings even that much more that, you know, in times of challenge, we often even better recognize the important roles that institutions uh, play in our communities and our state. And I think that's definitely been the case uh, with higher ed. So I don't know if you want me to answer any questions or if it's just remarks. 
if you do have questions, I'll be happy to try to answer any of them. Thank you, Governor Bullock. Um, any any questions from from members of the board? Amy, do we see? Not seeing any. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Christian? I, I just uh, would like to extend my thanks to the governor and the governor's staff. Um, we've, we've had a number of conversations over the, the last eight weeks, and they've provided a tremendous uh, amount of resources to help us navigate some of these waters and provide information on where we're going and where we need to be to be compliant. Um, so you, you've, uh, you've picked up the phone at all hours and all night uh, of the day and night. And I, I truly appreciate your, uh, support, uh, through this. Appreciate it, commissioner. Yeah. And we'll continue to do the same as we go forward and, uh, you know, that it, that it is one I've appreciated your all's creative thinking and the way you're already thinking about even, uh, next year and you got a partner out of uh, me and my office thank you you've certainly uh, been supportive of us uh, and and we just can't say enough uh, for what you've done for the university system but also for the state of montana we're in a good spot and that's uh, comes from good leadership so thank you thank you very much thank you again yeah thank you uh, governor bullock for for your commitment to higher education we we uh, certainly appreciate you're always prioritizing education, um, and I think education uh, over the next uh, uh, couple years is going to be critical as as we retool and reskill uh, our workforce. So we appreciate you always leaning into to higher education and, and for your leadership. So moving on, um, I think next up on our agenda, we have uh, remarks from Superintendent Arntzen. Is Superintendent Arntzen on. He is. And Heather, if you would just uh, navigate to the left or right, there should be an expand arrow. And we can get her pulled up. Perfect. Good morning. It's uh, a new Good world. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair, Commissioner, and Regents. What an interesting world we are. I can see kind of like a classroom going on right here with everybody uh, being so attentive. Um, I appreciate even in this Zoom world that we're in to be part of your meetings. So thank you again for the invite. And Amy, thank you for putting all of this together through our office. I appreciate it. Um, just to let you know, uh, we are being very positive on reopening schools. And I want to think forward, not so much backward. Uh, going forward, schools have opened. I want to thank the governor that on May 7th, and it was my birthday, which was a great gift, to have our public schools uh, becoming more of a local control. I applaud the leadership of those schools that remained closed, that remote learning is still taking place. I applaud the leaders of the schools that did open, either in a soft open or in a very uh, welcoming sense in our very rural communities. So we have strong leaders in our K-12 world. We are a local control state, and I wanna give them as much credit as that is possible. So we are beginning uh, two task forces to understand what this means. Uh, the first one is starting today, and it's Montana Flex 2020. Montana Flex 2020 is having our school leaders come together. We have about uh, 30 plus of them in a four Zoom meeting uh, situation that will be completed by uh, July. And then we will go forward to the Board of Public Ed. The flexibilities have to deal with any hurdles of what remote learning might look like, what we've learned within remote learning, uh, what challenges there might be. So these are statutes, these are rules, these are federal guidelines, uh, these are federal, possibly more waivers. These are the flexibilities. So, and it is a partnership with our education advocates. Um, we have the governor's office on as well. We um, are looking forward to see exactly what it is that this new advent of public education may look like. And that's the Montana Flex 2020. Another one is beginning tomorrow. It will have the same uh, contextual look of flexibilities. 
but it's more on learning. It's instruction. How do we help our teachers, our teacher leaders, our parents, and more importantly, the focus on our students on what does learning look like? And coming again, what did we learn from being in remote learning for at least 10 weeks now and till the end of this school year? But when those school doors open, what does what need of help is needed in curriculum development? How can I professionally develop? What does licensing look like? How should we do all of these things to focus on student learning? There are no dollars attached to any one of these committees. There will not be any discussion of, of an expenditure. Uh, we are uh, wanting these to be then completed by July. Like I said, they will also go in front of the Board of Public Ed. And then these other, these two committees, so Montana Flex 2020 and the Montana Learn 2020 will be funneled all the way through to the Board of Public Ed. And I, I believe that that is important, that it's another venue uh, that uh, gets to look at this. I'd love to share with you um, as well in your next meeting, the, the, um, the pathway and the dialogue that we have uh, created and going and moving forward. But I also want to put this under safety. Um, since that terrible event of Parkland, we have created a health and safety division here at the OPI. And as I've said, you know, I've got a middle name of cursive and I've got a middle name of safety. And safety is extremely important because we're in this world, this new world, because of a virus that is created so much uncertainty. And we need to have uh, our students safe, our families need to be safe, our employees need to be safe, our buildings, our facilities, everything. So we have a safety committee that will be looking at part and parcel of what comes out of Montana Learn 2020 and Montana Flex 2020 to make sure that when our school doors do open, that our county health officials are there, that we are understanding if social distancing is still in whatever framework it would be, in whatever phase we might be, that that is first and foremost as our doors open again in the fall. So we're excited about that. And that's the future look of where we are. I do want to say with just a little bit of reflection going backward, we've received over a dozen waivers from the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture to have nutrition flow to our children in Montana. And not just our students in Montana that are in public education, but our children in Montana. So this is from the birth all the way up to the age of 18. Now, I know if you've got an 18-year-old, they don't want to be considered a child. But how important that is. These waivers then were how we feed our children, when we feed our children, what we feed our children, and the manner that we do, all under the guise of safety. So I would, I'm so excited about our school safety team. And they put out great guidance that has mirrored the CDC in how foods are put together and how they are delivered so that safety is number one. It's on our website. Please, if you have any opportunity, um, I believe it is a shining star for the nation as much as it is a good resource for our schools. Um, let's talk about some normal business, ACT. Um, we did get one of the ravers from the um, uh, Secretary of Education to pause our testing for this year. That means our entire accountability system is going to be looking different. We don't know exactly what that means because test scores were part of that. Um, the ACT is a partnership that we all share and wanting to make sure that the ACT is available to not just shout out the success of what might have happened in secondary, but also put that bridge into your world in post-secondary. So we have had discussions and I know um, Commissioner Christian, there'll be more coming forward on what does this mean of, with the ACT, how it can be used uh, to better shout out that bridge into your world in post-secondary. Perkins dollars, that's another uh, conversation that is a partnership with uh, you as much as it is in our agency. And um, I pre appreciate the, the leadership that um, Deputy Commissioner Tessman has put together and want to applaud the conversations. And I can tell you, some partnerships aren't easy. Some conversations aren't easy, but we've stuck to it. 
uh, in both worlds, because this is so important. We have a new rollout for Perkins 5. It's extremely important that the focus is on the student and whatever that dollar of opportunity can glean and give to that student benefits you, benefits the K-12 system, but most importantly, it benefits our Montana communities because we're building the future for Montana through Perkins. This is career technical education. This is badging certification. This is making sure that we have a cohesive view uh, in a community of what does post-secondary and K-12 leadership look together. So Perkins 5 can go all the way to middle school. Um, we are very excited for Perkins 5, and we know that it gives us a great view of our future and opportunities. So I've talked a little bit about the task forces as well. Um, I can tell you just from an agency standpoint, about 95% of our 370 employees are remote working. That means then that they are doing the business of the people of Montana from where you are, and you're at your desk at a kitchen table, and I'm so impressed with the employees of the OPI, knowing that they are putting students first wherever their work has been. And it's been challenging having a, a small screen rather than having your screens up, um, having you know family members walk through, or having you know your pets, which are also family members, you know interrupt a Zoom session or a go to meeting. And I know there's fatigue. We all know that there's fatigue of this type because we are, as Montanans, we're resilient, but we enjoy we enjoy contact. Whether we live in uh, Eastern Montana where social distancing is the norm or whether we live in uh, a larger city where it's important to get out and to see entities and individuals. So it has been a challenge. And I know in the university system, it's mirrored that very same way. But I'm going to come back to that opportunity and being a, a, a positive person here. Your university system may look unique going forward. That's okay. Let's do what we do best in education. Let's learn from where we, at where we were. Think about where we are right now and what resources we can do to add in a partnership together. So together, we can do much, much better. So not that it's a challenge, Chair Lozar, but I do believe, you know, and I'm data orientated and I'm very heavy on to budget and all of these other things, but let's have more of these uh, conversations. Now they need to be as public as possible, but how, what has happened with COVID in our, lear in our world of K-12 in learning? Let's put our resources together. I know you have task forces. I know I'm doing my task forces like I've had, but let's show leadership and have a discussion with the regions on what it is that I can do to help you and what you can also do to help our students that are like my granddaughter, Harper, who's in kindergarten, who wants to become a doctor. She's gonna need you. She's gonna need that pathway in math and science to be able to get to be serving our patients in Montana or wherever she's going to be. So with that, Chair Lozar, kind of like a challenge, next time we meet together, not that we put he's it on a percentage up. of how many committees we uh, have had a conversation with, but let's, let's put something together that we can offer the regions in more of that bridge of a partnership of what we've learned through COVID and how we're going to um, put our learning to good use for our students in, in across our state in Montana. And with that, Chair Lozar and Regents and Commissioner, I can stand for any questions. I'm here to serve. And I am working here, but I have done remote work. Um, it doesn't matter if you're at a kitchen table. Uh, it is still the work for the good people of our state. So with that, Chair Lozar, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Superintendent Artson, uh, a great update. Um, I wanna commend you uh, as well on the innovation and the agility that has come through your leadership for all the, the K-12 schools across the state of Montana. I, we really look forward to um, learning more about the two task force that you're one kicking off today and the other one tomorrow. Um, and, you know, I kind of turn to the, the, the commissioner as we look at how we collectively between K-12 and higher ed can think about joining and, and partnering on, on 
understanding sort of best practice and what has been working and understanding how we can improve that pipeline between K-12 and, and higher education now with our, suit, our new set of sideboards, our new norm that we're operating in. So I appreciate that challenge that you, you provided to us. Um, I know we got a couple uh, hands raised from members uh, of the board, but I just wanted to personally thank you, superintendent and, and the, the school, the teachers across the state of Montana. I've got four little ones and they've been adapting uh, <clears throat> under some incredible teachers, adapting to the new curriculum and the new learning style. And I, I really commend uh, the work that's been happening, particularly here in Helena, um, but certainly around the state, the teachers have done an incredible job to really find the best in, in, in um, during these difficult times. So with so, that, uh, I think Regent Sheehy, you had a comment or a question, Regent Sheehy. I do, I have two. Uh, thank you, Superintendent. And I apologize for the person mowing the lawn outside my window. Uh, first of all, uh, I accept your challenge. I think we should be talking about education, not just uh, higher, but coordinating with you. But I had a question about something you talked about earlier, which is the USDA food waiver. Yes. And you said that applied to zero to 18. I wondered if that was a waiver um, that's pandemic related or whether it's um, unrelated to the COVID-19 and continues on for some period of time. Is there a time limitation to that? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Lozar and Regent Sheehy. Um, yes, these are waivers means that it's a pause in the regulation and it's a pause of uh, to uh, create a different action. And um, one of the things, because this, this occurred March 15th, um, that uh, we began looking to see exactly how we could uh, give nutrition. And in our world, we do know that with poverty levels, doesn't matter where you are in the state of Montana, they exist where our homeless exists that sometimes that nutrition that happens at the school is the only nutrition and that's our all our whole child approach um so these waivers we're looking uh, of course with secretary purdue to see exactly and that's part of that flexibility to make sure that is this needing to be continued on uh how we serve children during school year is different than how we serve children during the summer so some of those waivers of those dozen waivers had to deal with, could we now then create that pathway to serve from uh, backwards? In other words, can I serve children in the summer in a remote location because we're in remote learning? And that was where those waivers happened. But I can give you um, an update at our next uh, meeting on exactly what has been removed and uh, what we are asking for for more. And uh, always asking for more, I think. I had a good talk with uh, Secretary DeVos last Friday, and I, uh, I hold Montana very, very high when it comes to local control, that I do know that our community leaders, our school leaders, wherever they may be in Montana, know more. They know more than I do. They know more than our legislative body does, and they know more than they do in the federal government. So I shared with her that within all the flexibilities that we have received out of her department as much as any other department, to share with the president that Montana wants more flexibilities. And I wanted to tell her that she, I will give her a reason to say yes on what we are coming out of with our task forces. So I can give you an, an update at our next meeting on the time duration and what we have asked for for more. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Thank you, Superintendent. <laughs> I think uh, Regent Rogers, did you have uh, your hand up? No, okay. Uh, Regent Nystuen, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Chair Lozar. Uh, Superintendent Ardson, um, could we get an update, kind of a year-end recap as to what transpired with one, two, three? Um, uh, it'd be interesting to know the, you know, what ultimately happened with the students that have been involved with this past year and what, if any, changes will occur this fall. I know some of that probably still is to be determined. And then again, an update with regards to the fiscal impact and where do we go from here with funding this program and thoughts as to ultimately where we're going from here. I think it'd be appropriate between now and our 
September meeting, which is a long ways away, that we get an update from the commissioner and the superintendent for the region's consideration as we move forward with one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lozar and Regent Nystrom. Of course, that is a simple yes. We'll be more than happy to do that. Maybe that's part of the uh, challenge that I've given, that we can look to see what the impacts of COVID has happened since March 15th and where it is that we want to go forward within all of this. Plus also looking that we are less than six months away from a new legislative body seating. And of course, I know coming in front of our um, legislative fiscal committees on what this might mean as an impact to make sure that our students are served in the manner that they should be. Thank you, Regent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Regent Nystoon, um, and thank you, Superintendent Arnson. Um, any other comments or questions uh, from members of the board or from the commissioner? Uh, yeah, Regent Miller. Oh, John, you're still Super you Superintendent Arnson, thank you so much for this update. I find it extremely helpful. Um, just to inject some humor into this, can you uh, tell me if uh, cursive comes before safety in your middle name or if it's safety hyphen cursive? Thank you so much, Chair Lozar and Regent Miller. You know, I appreciate humor. Um, I had a joke on my, when you walked into my classroom, I taught for 23 years, fifth grade. So if I can get a fifth grader to laugh at, to laugh with me and also laugh at me, you know, that means I got him. And that means that math lesson, that reading lesson was going to go really well. But um, I do believe safety is first because when it comes to uh, cursive, uh, I don't know if you could read my handwriting and my cursive, uh, but I appreciate the humor. Um, I have multiple middle names, and one of the things that I also engaged my students with was um, I have a very Scottish middle name that starts with an M and has a lot of Zs in it and ends in an A. And um, I would tell them that if they invited me to their graduation party, not only would I come and I would eat their cake and visit with their families again and give them, you know, some uh, card with some green cash in it, but I would also share with them what my middle name was and why I'm alluding to that. And I got invited. And um, it's amazing to see uh, individuals that reach that graduation level uh, after I've had them when they were 10. And I, and I want to just say, if I could, Chair Lozar and Regents, graduation is a celebration. It's just going to be a different type of celebration this year, as you are experiencing across your campuses. And making sure that that um, celebration is meaningful and heartful. I know a lot of our school leaders are doing that. And now that we are in phase two or will be as of June 1, I know that means that there'll be an other opportunities for maybe other family members to share in this, even as we are going to be social distancing. So with that, thank you for the humor, Regent Miller. I appreciate that. I'll send you one of my Laffy Taffy jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, Commissioner? Yeah, I, I just want to extend my uh, gratitude. Superintendent, you, you used in your remarks the word partnership uh, a number of times, and I, I really do have to say now starting my uh, 15th year involved with uh, higher education, I, the partnership has never been stronger, and that comes from good leadership from you. And we uh, acknowledge that, we appreciate that. We're anxious to continue that and to continue to work together. So thank you for your outreach to us, your willingness to accept our outreach to you. Uh, I, I think you you understand the importance of the continuance of this P20 uh, enterprise that we have and, and we'll continue from, from my end and, and I know from yours to make that all that we can for students across Montana. So thank you and thanks for being here at the meeting. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I think before we, we move on and, and take a short break, um, I believe President Bodner's on and um, he'd like to make uh, an introduction or an acknowledgement. Uh, President Bodner? And Seth, you may have to unmute your line. Thank you. Yeah, sir. I, I, uh, sorry about that for the, uh, the technical difficulties. And I don't know why my camera doesn't seem to be uh, doesn't seem to be showing up. I apologize. Uh, 
One moment here, Seth, we'll get your video started. You should see a prompt shortly on your screen. There it is. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay. I, uh, I'm grateful for the, uh, for the promotion. Um, and, uh, and, and want to thank the, uh, the board for the opportunity to, uh, to share one, uh, as I mentioned, our campus, a bittersweet announcement from the University of Montana, and that is that we announced uh, yesterday that uh, our provost, uh, Dr. John Harbour, will be uh, departing U of M later this summer to, uh, to pursue an exciting opportunity uh, for, for him and for his family. Uh, he'll be returning to, uh, to Indiana and to Purdue University. Will, he'll, he will take an exciting new position uh, with Purdue Global, uh, their online uh, entity. You know, and I characterize this as, uh, as bittersweet because we're sad to see John go. He's been a, uh, a, a great partner and leader. He's been incredibly committed to, uh, to UM success. And uh, obviously many on this call know that the job of provost is not an easy one, uh, but John has uh, dedicated himself to UM success. And, and it's, I say bittersweet because that, that part is difficult, but we're also happy for John. It's an exciting opportunity that's in line with his interests, his expertise. And it's a great opportunity for him to be in a place that he knows well and for his family to all be together in, uh, in Indiana. And, and the other good news is that while, we're, uh, while we'll certainly miss John, I'm uh, deeply grateful to have a very strong team uh, in uh, academic and student affairs here at the University of Montana, both in the provost's office uh, as well as a great team of, of deans. And uh, we will start a search uh, for the for the provost position immediately, but I'm happy to announce that uh, Dean Reed Humphrey, the dean of our College of uh, Health, will serve as acting provost uh, while we uh, while we finalize that. And I want to thank uh, Dean Humphrey for uh, stepping into this important position. Thank uh, the rest of our uh, our council of deans uh, here on our campus for pulling together, as well as uh, our leadership in the provost's office and the provost staff. I uh, Always uh, transitions are difficult, but uh, but in terms of uh, our preparedness for this transition and the great team that we have around us, I, uh, I feel very confident uh, moving forward. And again, congratulations and uh, thank you to, to Provost Harbor. Thank you, President Bodner. And again, thank you for uh, to, to, to John for his commitment while he was in the, the provost role at the University of Montana. We certainly wish him well and, um, I'm sure he's excited about returning back to uh, to his family and in his new role, and uh, and we also want to thank uh, Dean Humphrey for uh, serving as the the acting provost. We look forward to his leadership. Um, with that, uh, members of the the board and those that are online, we're going to take a a ten minute break. So please do not disconnect from the meeting. Um, all lines will be muted and we will reconvene in 10 minutes. So uh, right around 945. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's um, hope everyone had a nice 10 minute break. Uh, we're going to, we're going to keep rolling here. We've got a, a full day's worth of committee um, committee meetings and, uh, and reports. So I, I will turn uh, the meeting over to uh, Regent Tuss, Chair Tuss, uh, to the Chair of the Budget Administration and Audit Committee, uh, Chair Tuss. Thank you, Chair Lozar. Um, as I believe everybody can see on their screen, we have the Budget Administration and Audit Committee agenda um, in front of us. And for those regents who do serve on this committee, they have seen this agenda and they've gone through these particular items. And this has obviously been noticed for the appropriate amount of time. We have a number of consent uh, item uh, agendas and uh, you can see what they are. We, we have items A, B and C, which are staff items. And then we have uh, emeriti faculty items that go from D to, I can't quite see, D to T. And we have a facility item from U of M Missoula. And then we have another item, item V, 
which is a request for authorization to renew operating agreement between MSU Billings and the MSUB uh, Foundation. So those are those are all consent um, agendas uh, or agenda items. Uh, is there any desire by any member of the board to remove any of those items from the consent agenda and put them on the action agenda? And Amy, you can certainly tell me if anyone is raising their hands electronically so we can do that. Certainly, Paul. At this time, I'm seeing no hands raised. Okay. Seeing no interest in removing any of those items from the consent agenda, we will move to the action part of the committee's agenda today. And the first action item, uh, action item A is present law budget 2023 biennium. And with that introduction, I will turn it over to um, Deputy Commissioner Trevor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I hope you can hear me better this time. Yes, we can hear you fine. Great. We have for you, uh, for your approval, uh, the present law estimates for the Montana University System, specifically the uh, MUS education units, our eight education units. Um, also included in this request is for our uh, agencies, the five agencies of the Montana University System. I'm gonna focus primarily on the education units. And um, the, re the reason why is that present law combined with the pay plan uh, and our LRBP request have traditionally marked the top of the top of the list in terms of priorities for our legislative uh, endeavors. And that is to receive our present law funding uh, to enable the university system to continue operations at existing levels from a prior biennium. So, just a couple notes here before I, I walk through some of the numbers on the process. And uh, I give uh, all of the credit to, um, well, our campus budget uh, officers, as well as our own MUS budget director, Shauna Lyons, for doing the heavy lifting on this. There's an incredible amount of detail that starts at each individual campus and rolls up into what now is a very simplistic view of this. We have other attachments that give a little bit more detail. If we have questions, I can uh, move to those attachments, but I, I would just stay focused on this one slide. And this slide is um, uh, work, works through a series of categories that provide the totality of what our present law request would be. And then I'll, I'll work you through what it ends up being in its terms of its request that we will then enter into the state's budget system and then begin work with the governor's office uh, to agree upon the numbers and, um, and work them into the, the executive's budget. So sometime in November, uh, we'll see the culmination of these numbers uh, come out in the governor's budget. So the categories, uh, we start with uh, the primary, uh, I guess I wouldn't say primary, but uh, one single item uh, that is uh, e easy to uh, understand and focus on, and that is the annualization of the pay plan. We increase pay this biennium. Um, next biennium, we need the same amount of funds in order to continue at this current pay level without any increases. So the pay plan would be ex external to this um, the $4.3 million per year there uh, is the amount of funds it takes to annualize those pay increases. We then move to the, to the next category, which is entitled other personnel costs, uh, made up largely of projected increases in health insurance. Um, a portion of it also allocated to employee leave, uh, unlike other state agencies, we have to um, uh, come up with our leave payouts. We have uh, an individual leave. We, we, we pay for um, the vacation accumulated, for instance. Um, we also then have a structure that's different than any other state agency, uh, and that is the faculty 
structure with uh, promotions from assistant to associate to full professors and also merit uh, uh, attributes that might be included into um, union contracts. The third category is a category that is applicable to all state agencies. Ours might be a little bit um, uh, shrunk uh, down because of the nature in which we interact with ITSD, for instance. Uh, but we, in this category, uh, request funds for increases to our insurance, uh, also that we receive from the state, also um, the amount of funds that we are required to pay to legislative audit. Uh, as well as some IT costs, for instance, the um, access to the state budgeting system that I just mentioned. The fourth category uh, relates to higher education specific increases, and these are unique to um, not, not our system. You'd find these at any system of higher education, education across the nation, but unique to our branch um, of higher ed in relationship to other state agencies. We have uh, utility costs, of course, and then library and journal costs to, in, to uh, keep up those professional and academic journals that we uh, subscribe to on campus. IT maintenance is a, a very large component of this. Other contracts uh, and then specific compliance and safety issues as well as rent. And then rounding out the list here is uh, new space O&M. So for any new buildings that we construct that come online during the next biennium, that the state has agreed to pay a portion of the operation and maintenance for. Um, we also include that as part of our present law request. So that totals to numbers that range between 23 million and, 20, and 30 million per year. Uh, we then take what percent of our current unrestricted is funded by the state versus tuition. And that turns out to be 42.5% in the current fiscal year. And we apply that to, let's say, the $23 million that you see there in FY22. Uh, the math comes out to be $9.9 .9 million. And that is the dollar amount that then moves forward um, in a decision package that would work its way through our Education Appropriations Subcommittee eventually and, and then into House Bill 2. Mr. Chair, um, I, I mentioned the attachments that are also included and the agency dollar amounts are also there in, a, in one of the attachments. Um, we'll refrain from opening any of those unless there are any questions. Thank you. Paul, I see no questions or hand raised at this time. Mm -hmm. Regent Rogers had her hand raised. Sorry, raised a little late. Um, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, what's driving the big jump in the health insurance? Um, Mr. Chair, Regent uh, Rogers, um, since I can, and she's sitting directly to my right, I'm going to defer that question to the person that knows the detail better than I. She may have to slide this way. Uh, introduce yourself first. Mr. Chair, Regent Rogers, this is Shauna Lyons, your MUS budget analyst. So we are projecting that there will be an increase in our health insurance premiums based on what our actuary is putting forward for us. I don't have those final numbers, but we use what their estimates were for the build on this. Regent. Paul, you're muted. There we yeah, go. I was. I'm sorry. I was. I was muted, uh, Amy. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, th thank you for that. Um, are there additional questions? I thought I saw a hand or two raised. I'm looking now. We'll give it just a couple seconds to see if anybody's hand does go up. I'm not seeing any raised hands at this time, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Um, Deputy Commissioner, can we move on? Yes, sir. Um, it, it appears that we are on action item B, long range building program priority list. Is that correct? That is correct. And we have Mr. Muppick on our end here, ready to take this item. 
Thank you, Ron. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So action item B is the 2023 Birmingham Montana University System Long Range Building Program Priority List. As you recall, we brought the draft list to you in March and provided details of the projects. This is the final list uh, submitted to the board for adoption. Uh, there have been no changes uh, to the capital development projects. Uh, there's been a couple adds to the major repair projects, nothing that's uh, significant. And uh, we can take a look at the list here uh, that was presented to you in uh, March. The long range building program list, as I kind of started getting into, there's three categories. There's the capital development projects, there's the major repair projects, and there are the authority only projects. We have a total of 266 million uh, in projects listed up there with 185 million of that being uh, requests for funding and 81 million being uh, legislative authority requests. The LRBP uh, process uh, is our mechanism uh, for obtaining state funding and legislative building authority. As a state agency, uh, the NUS is required to participate in it. And we're happy to participate in it. Uh, our priorities will be carried forward uh, from, uh, from the board. We'll work with the state architecture and engineering division and the executive branch to include our priorities in the statewide uh, priorities going into the legislative session. Uh, what you believe this list reflects the appropriate priorities of the system and meets the state and board uh, of regents requirements. I'll stand for any questions or provide any additional detail if needed. Mr. Chair. Are there, are there questions from the board about our long range building program priority list for the coming biennium? Um, one, one of the questions that I have, and I, I perhaps had mentioned this during our budget committee meeting previously, um, Deputy Commissioner or, Ron or, or, or Commissioner Christian, could, could, you, could you talk just briefly to the board about um, the new mechanism that the state is using to fund infrastructure relative to what I believe was passed in the past session through um, leadership, I think, of Representative Moore and how that applies to what we're doing here with our LRBP priority list. Certainly, Mr. Chair, uh, I can handle, I can take that one. This is uh, Mr. Muffick. Uh, you're correct. It was uh, House Bill 553, sponsored by Eric Moore, uh, that revamped uh, the long-range building process as far as the funding process goes. It uh, added a formulaic component to the process and certainly changed our approach as it relates to the major repair section. If you look at the major repair section, we have two uh, attachments, one from the MSU side, one from the U of M side, where we have to provide the detailed information for these projects in the Historically, we would receive a lump sum of, of money and we would put those towards projects. Now they're going to specifically fund projects. And there is a, uh, a formulaic approach, as I mentioned. Um, maybe Shauna could help me on this. It's a certain percentage of uh, some of the, of the general fund. The general fund. Right. And uh, we think that major repair amount will be about $26 million per biennium. And it, that goes across the entire state. So we would expect over time, historically, we would get 60%, maybe 65% of that money because we have that percentage of the buildings and square footage in the state as the university system. The other piece is for the capital development, there's also a formula there and it's based on uh, the available, available bonding from the state. It's debt service with the revenue from the general fund as well. Okay. That I think comes out to about 40-ish million, 39 million, uh, every biennium that should be available depending based on projections that were done um, from the, the fiscal note when the bill came through. But that still needs to be kind of, we'll wait and see how that actually pencils out in, in reality. Thank you, Ron. I knew, I knew that there was a change, and uh, that, that's, that's I think, good news for us and the entire state. Um, thank you for that explanation. Are there additional questions or comments from members of the board on this on this item? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Uh, Regent Sheehy? Thank you, host. Uh, Ron, I had a question about the list. Um, assuming, and who knows what our assumption should be, but if COVID is around for another 
year before we get a vaccine. Are there any items on this list that might change that maybe we change our priorities or is there an increased priority? And I'm looking specifically at the key system. That system, a higher touch system, less touches, less contact. Have we thought about that at all? And um, does it matter? Mr. Chair, Regent Sheehy, absolutely we have. In fact, uh, the, the system-wide key uh, security and electronic access project fits right into uh, the tracking and ability to control access uh, as it relates to COVID. So it's actually very timely for this to be our top priority. Uh, the others on the list, I would say the Montana Tech heating system, that's a critical uh, issue that they have there. Uh, their, their steam lines are, are leaking significantly, and that's a, a, a project that will need to be done uh, to keep the campus from uh, facing something catastrophic as far as not being able to heat the, the building. So I don't see those top two uh, going anywhere. Thank you, Marana. Good, good question, Regent Sheehy. Are there additional questions or comments from members of the board? Amy, are there any hands? Regent Tuss, I see no raised Chronically hands from raised. board members. You good? Yeah, yeah. Ms. Kaplan. No, no additional comments or questions? It doesn't look like there's any additional questions. Okay. Chair Tuss. Thank you. Um, it got a little splotchy there. Um, let's let's move on then, if we can, to action item C: request to increase tuition and fees from Dawson Community College. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is an annual request which comes to us from uh, Dawson Community College, and, and just as a, a reminder that uh, for the uh, ed units of the Montana University System, we address tuition uh, every other year at the beginning of each biennium. Uh, for our community colleges, uh, they have the option to do this or they have the option to do it annually. And um, my, I mean, Dawson Community College and Flathead Valley Community College take that option uh, to do it, to uh, address tuition annually. Uh, Flathead Valley is just not bringing a, a request to us this go around. And so we see Dawson's request for increase in tuition and fees here. And this is a very reasonable request that uh, ranges, depending upon the category of tuition and fees, between uh, three and three and a half percent increase. Um, they've uh, presented it in the um, requested fashion that we normally expect to see. And uh, Mr. Chair, um, we have no uh, concerns and would recommend that the board move forward. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Are there are there questions or comments from members of the board on this item? Mr. Chair, if, if I could just add one thing to that, I, I think it's important to note and, and to remind everybody that this is acted upon by their local trustees. This is a recommendation that's been approved at the local level that moves forward. Thank you, Commissioner. And that was certainly a question that during our committee meeting, uh, from a governance perspective, we did have that conversation with the committee. So thank you for that reminder. Are there additional comments or questions from anyone? Regent okay. Tess, this is Amy. I'm seeing no additional questions or hands raised. Okay, thank you, Amy. Well, let's then move on to our next item on the budget committee agenda. And I believe that we are now at action item D, request for authorization to design and construct a student wellness center. And that is a request from Montana State University. Yeah, we'll start with Ron Muffick. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, this item authorizes Montana State University to expend up to $60 million to design and construct a comprehensive student wellness center. This project will not only replace facilities that were lost in March, 2019, when we had uh, three gymnasiums and the university's uh, natatorium were all damaged by historic snow load with the three gyms being total losses, but it will also include space for student health services, providing medical and mental health services to students. We have a, a team at MSU that uh, led by President Crisado who would be right here to provide more detail. President Cruzado, are, are you speaking to this item? 
Yes, I am. Good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for um, bringing the, um, this uh, board item to your attention. As um, um, Deputy Commissioner um, Muffek has expressed, uh, we're coming to you with this request uh, in large part because of a natural disaster that we had March. March of 2019, literally on the eve of a, of a Helena Board of Regents meeting when we lost um, our three gymnasiums and the university's natatorium. Um, what happened after that, we put together a group, uh, a large group, a representative group uh, composed of students and faculty and staff and alumni, uh, uh, community members, uh, uh, OG representation, and they started to uh, envision what do we need to do at this moment. Um, it was also a great uh, example of how our students continue to provide us with inspiration about when what to do when life uh, gives us lemons. And they also decided to put their attention on our Swingle Health Center, um, which is a structure that dates back to the 1957. Um, and despite our best efforts, it's a, it's a structure that it's also being left behind by the evolving nature of healthcare and including um, new regulations and compliance. So this group came together and um, with this concept that we are about to propose to you today. But before I ask uh, John Howe, who's director of campus planning and construction to tell us a little bit about the project and Betsy Asserson, our director of counseling and psychological services to just describe briefly what will go inside that new uh, building. I want to say, I want to thank uh, so many people who were instrumental in making this happen. Certainly the, the planning committee um, that I just uh, mentioned, but also um, thank you to deputy commissioner uh, Ram Mafek. Uh, my heartfelt uh, gratitude to Commissioner Christian for guiding us uh, during this process and a big shout out to the State of Montana Risk Management and Tort uh, Defense Division who helped us immensely um, during this process. So with that, I would like to ask uh, John Howe to explain the building and then immediately after uh, Betsy Asserson to talk uh, a little bit about the health services that will go in this new structure. John. Thanks, President Cruzado. Uh, thanks, Chair and, and Commissioner and Regents. Uh, as as Ron had mentioned, this is really a, a new and exciting time for us on campus here. Uh, right now, our students have to actually visit five different locations across campus to access uh, health, wellness, and fitness facilities. And through the planning committee and, and our work here at the design team, our goal really is to move this into a uh, holistic, integrated model, kind of a one-stop shop facility for students, faculty, and staff on campus. And so. Uh, with that, as, as President Cruzado mentioned, we're going to be moving Student Health Center uh, across the street from Grant uh, to be uh, adjacent to the fitness facility. Uh, if you're familiar with our campus, it'll be right across from Romney Hall. Uh, that'll be uh, 21st century health and wellness uh, health care facilities. It's going to be about three stories tall. Uh, as you move down the facility, then we're going to be uh, replacing the gymnasium that were lost. Uh, again, we're, we're going to replace those with three gymnasia, a multi-activity court, uh, but then we're also transforming the, the space to be more functional fitness to adapt to changing needs on campus as uh, we've seen uh, fitness space and fitness trends change dramatically here in the last five years. So we're trying to create this as a flexible area. Um, lastly, that, that something was mentioned in the report there also that we are going to be pre repairing the pool uh, along with the, the roof over it and modernizing that. Uh, currently, our facility is not ADA accessible, so we'll be changing that. It'll be an ADA accessible pool. We're going to be bringing in natural light uh, and basically just creating a, a, a great facility for students, um, whether or not they want to go for a workout or not, to be able to come to the, the site and utilize those sources. So uh, that's just a brief overview. I think that the vast majority of it that Ron mentioned is in there uh, along with the board item. And I think I'll turn it over to Betsy to talk about the specific uses within the facility and our integrated healthcare model. Thank you, Chair Tuss and members of the committee and John and, and President Crusado for um, 
sharing some of the background and the future design of the building and where we're planning to go um, with the proposed Student Wellness Center. I won't take too much of your time, but I want to just briefly talk about um, the mental health needs and the importance of this facility for meeting those needs of our campus community. As John talked about um, engaging many constituents in the planning process, what we found is that students really identified that mental health is the, the top need and their top priority for this new proposed student wellness center. What I see as our greatest opportunity in this proposed new space is that it will allow us to bring together all of the different offices who um, may be able to address mental health needs. The integrated holistic model that we're talking about is really key for us to help students succeed both during their time here at MSU and beyond. In the new facility, we'll have, um, as John mentioned, the student health services, counseling and psychological services, wellness services through the Office of Health Advancement, as well as recreation and sports fitness facilities. As you know, an integrated holistic approach to mental health really is the key for enhancing that for our students and helping them to um, feel engaged in their campus and also to be able to engage in their academics while here at MSU. At Counseling and Psychological Services, we've seen a continued increase in the demand for mental health services. This facility will allow us to take that integrated approach, allow us to expand some of our service offerings, including group therapy, mindfulness services, outreach and prevention efforts, as well as ongoing individual counseling services as well. I'm so proud of our students. Um, they really have led the way with this and let us know that addressing mental health in a, a setting and in a building that really promotes mental well-being is key for their success. And we're excited about the prospect of moving this forward and having an integrated student wellness center. Thank you so much for your time. I think John and I are both available for questions if there are any. Thank, thank you, Betsy. Um, I will open it up to questions, but I will start with my own. And I, I'm sure that in the narrative included as part of your explanation, um, you discussed the, the financing for this. Uh, I, I don't know if this is a, a Ron question or a Mr. Howe question. Um, but, but certainly if you could just for the record, talk about um, how this $60 million facility uh, will be financed, that would be outstanding. Chair Tuss, uh, members of the committee, this is Terry Least, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, so as you know, there's a, a big insurance component to this facility, that's the, the majority. Um, and then there will be some uh, existing um, student fees that we can apply to debt service. So because of our enrollment growth, um, and we had some um, some of those uh, more fees, obviously with more students uh, that were paid from uh, previous um, approved fees. And so we've taken everything that we can do to minimize the increase in fees going forward. And so, but then the, the students did approve a fee, which is another item that we'll talk about here in a little while uh, that the, the students approved. So essentially it's the insurance and then the, the student fees, whether that's existing or the new fee that we're seeking approval today. Thank, thank you for that explanation, Terry. What is, what is the dollar amount of the insurance that MSU is receiving? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the insurance is $36 million for this project. And we have a little over um, right at $2 million in existing fees that we can apply. And then there's um, it'd be $22 million remaining that would be funded through debt service, which we would come back to the board at a later time to seek financing approval for that. Thank you, Terry. Uh, are there additional questions from members of the board or comments about this item? Yes, um, Regent Rogers. Thank you so much. Um, first, I just want to note how impressive it is that the student government came together and had such a good turnout. Um, I really want to thank uh, President, former President Taylor Blossom um, for all of his work on that. I think given the circumstances and everything that was going on to have a record turnout is really impressive, especially during this pandemic. Um, and just so excited to see such strong student support for this project as well. Um, my question is just a little bit more out of curiosity for Dr. Asserson. Um, 
I know that uh, in Gallatin County here, we've seen a, a great increase in calls to our two-on-one mental health uh, line here. Um, how has the response been uh, for the campus community? Thank you, uh, Regent Rogers. Um, and I appreciate that question. And I think um, it really highlights all of the work that uh, mental health providers have been doing, trying to respond to the mental health needs during uh, this pandemic and this unprecedented time. So here at MSU, what we're seeing is um, somewhat consistent numbers with those who had already been engaged in mental health treatment when we moved to um, all the, the remote um, learning time. And at the counseling center, what we did is move to an online modality for that. So we've continued all of our services through telemental health. We've maintained our crisis response and crisis intervention services, and then added some new things too, with some drop-in virtual spaces for students to be able to come and get some group options and group therapy options through different online modalities as a way to reach some of those students who might otherwise um, struggle during this time to be able to connect um, with a mental health provider. And what we've seen with our students as they've gone home and moved all over is they're really creative at finding ways to still engage in mental health treatment. So we have students who are using their phones and, and finding a little nook and cranny in a bathroom to be able to engage in their counseling services or finding some privacy here and there to be able to engage. So we've seen students continue to reach out, continue to seek um, counseling services. And our expectation is that growth will really hit um, coming down the road. So as we look at mental health in response to disasters, what we see is there's this kind of initial phase where people are kind of meeting their basic needs and attending to those things. And then down the road is when we really see the impact of the, the, the effect of social distancing, the effect of the isolation and the loneliness that really will, will, will see the cumulative effects of that. So at this point, we're really also preparing for that long-term response um, to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to hear that the telehealth is going relatively well. Thank you guys for transitioning so quickly into that. Thank you, yes. Thank you for that important question. Um, I believe that Regent Miller, did you have a question? Okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to let the board know that I've spoken with several students at MSU um, within the Montana Associated Students um, including the outgoing president of both Mass and ASMSU, Taylor Blossom, who are all in support of this item. Um, as we just heard from Bree, there is record turnout uh, for the students in support of this item. Um, and because of that, uh, I would like to voice my support as well um, for this fee increase, the $58 fee increase to students, um, as well as the entirety of this item. So thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Regent Miller. Um, are there additional comments or questions from members of the board? Hey, Regent Dom oh, Chair Lozar? Uh, I believe Regent Dombrowski has a question. Uh, yes, I do. Can you hear me? We can. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you, Chair, uh, both Chair Tuss and, and uh, Lozar. I, I really, uh, from the healthcare standpoint, certainly support the holistic and certainly support the mental health. It's, it's critical. I would just like to state, I think we need to be uh, wise as to the additional funds that may be requested of us and also to challenge the design committee to take advantage of what we've learned virtually as it relates to square footage and space and the opportunity to provide services in a very different way. And I think we do have that opportunity because the design has not yet happened to um, really, again, challenge the design to the design committee and the design team to look at incorporating successfully virtual mental health and virtual everything to potentially minimize the square footage that might be necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Dombrowski. That's a great point. We're learning every day. Um, are there additional questions or comments from members of the board? Yeah, Chair Tuss, this is Regent Lozar. Uh, more, of a, more of a comment. Um, uh, and to share some gratitude for the many number of people that have been a part of this this project for the past 
but is it President Cruzada the past 15 months or so? Um, I know there has been a, a wide range of different facility designs and thoughts and strategies and um, certainly you've taken um, you've taken the responsibility to figure out how to best pair the needed services uh, at the campuses, really leaning into the students and and leveraging the resources that are, are currently available through through the ins insurance to really put together something for the regions to consider. Um, we know, I think, this particular project um, we've been, um, you know, a part of and, and listened and watched and uh, I know it's shifted and changed. And so just wanted to thank everyone for being innovative and being patient with each other and really proposing um, something that we know is gonna have really positive impact uh, for the campus community, for the students. And I, I piggyback off on uh, what Regent Dombrowski said, said is, you know, there are things that we may have learned in the past couple months that uh, can be incorporated into sort of final design and build out uh, of this particular facility. So. Really look forward to uh, the team sort of looking into Region Dobrowski's uh, great uh, idea and suggestions. So, with that, uh, back to you, Region Tusks. Thank you, Region Lozar. Uh, additional comments or questions from members of the board? I see none. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, let us. Now move on to the next item if we can. And it, we're on action item E, request for authorization to increase a building and facilities fee for Student Wellness Center, Montana State University. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor here. I'll kick this off. Um, as the item reads that this, this is a request to increase a mandatory fee um, in the building and facilities category of $58 per semester. So this is the financing arm that uh, Vice President Lee spoke to in the last item. This item really is intrinsically related to, to the previous. So they are coupled together and really don't exist without each other. Um, the necessary items here for the board to approve this are in place. And I would mention just as a reminder, um, the board addresses mandatory fee increases uh, every other year at, be at the beginning of each biennium, except in two cases. One is if there's a building project or program, new program that comes forward that has some sort of fee related to it. Um, and then the other one is if there's a student driven fee. And so obviously this is one that's related to a new building. And so we take those in off cycle meetings and that's why you're seeing the fee increase at this time. Uh, also required is a vote of the students. And uh, as we discussed in the previous item, they have a vote. And in fact, I'm going to turn the mic over uh, to the ASMSU president here in a moment to speak on this item. Uh, and as well, they've uh, also attached their tuition and fee table to uh, demonstrate the uh, exact increases to these fees. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would uh, turn it over to Taylor Blossom, I believe, or and or President Cruzado. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. I see that uh, Taylor is with us. Um, and your microphone is, is not muted. Um, I recognize you at this point, Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair Tuss and Deputy Commissioner Trevor. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to address the board on this item. Um, I first off want to start by thanking um, the MSU administration as well as the consulting firms that worked with us over the past year. Um, they did a really great job making sure that from day one, the, the driver behind this uh, whole project was what students wanted. And there was a tremendous amount of work that, that went in last fall and over the summer. Um, into making sure that we were getting feedback from students and making sure that everything in this project was addressing a real need students saw on campus, um, which I was really pleased with. And then going into this spring, when we kind of presented this to the students with the, the final product, if you will, um, we got a lot of really positive feedback from students. Um, 
as was mentioned previously, mental health came out early on when we were doing surveys on what the needs were in this facility as really a top priority for students and something they wanted to see addressed. And we did a, a lot of work to make sure that that was a big part of this facility. And we could also integrate that with general student wellness, physical health, mental health, um, and just create a holistic facility. Um, and I think students really saw the value in that and saw the importance of this facility and what this can do for the future of Montana State. Um, going into the election, I was when students voted on this, I was really nervous that we were going to have a very low voter turnout due to um, everyone being away from campus and the whole election being online. Um, and the turnout we got of 16.3% was higher than we, the turnout we had last year in person um, and was better a better turnout and a better show of support from students than I could have ever dreamed of. Um, and I think that just really shows the value students place on this project and how big of an impact they see it having on campus. Um, and so with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions, but I would really encourage um, and appreciate support from the board on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, President Chris Otto. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to repeat what um, Taylor said um, how impressed we are with our with our with our students. Um, uh, to to be absolutely frank, a week after we were under the uh, shelter at home provisions, I called Taylor. I was so concerned about you know will students have the focus at this moment to to pay attention to this and I. I just need to, to say uh, Taylor Blossom is many things. He's an extraordinary student. Uh, he will be a wonderful uh, engineer and anything he, he wants to do, but he's an extraordinary leader. And he just said, no, I think that we're ready for this vote. The students have really devoted a lot of time to this conversation. This is a project that they want to see happen for generations into the future. And, and Taylor was right. Um, our students just came to the plate and, and did the right thing, not only for themselves, but also for students in the future. Uh, and thinking, as we have underlined this morning, in a holistic manner. Uh, yes, we wanted to pay attention to the buildings that we lost that were devoted to student fitness, but this generation understands that we just need to take care of the complete human being and the complete student in this case. So I want to thank Taylor for his leadership. ASMSU Senate was absolutely amazing. And the students of Montana State University who have just given us an incredible lesson of uh, what leadership means and thinking about the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Cruzado. Are there additional comments or questions from members of the board? Yes, Regent Nystuen. Thank you. Uh, question is, um, uh, are, is there any consideration given to those students that are just simply working in an online environment as far as their inabilities to use by virtue of working, studying remotely, you know, fitness facilities, swimming pools. I realize that they would be available for uh, using mental health services and so forth, but is there any kind of consideration for those students that, that maybe even a Gallatin College that don't perhaps come to the campus all that often to, um, to pay these mandatory fees? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Tyler here, I'll start in on that. Um, uh, online students uh, are exonerated from or waived uh, from certain mandatory fees. Um, I'm looking at the table right now in uh, MSU, and that is the case for students that are solely online at MSU. They uh, do not pay either one of the building fees. Oh, good. Very good. Thank Along you. those lines, Deputy Commissioner, thank, thank you, Regent. Nice to, did I interrupt you? I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Paul. Um, 
Deputy Commissioner, how, how does that apply to um, the students that Region 9 has been referred to, um, the Gallatin College students? If, if they're in, going in person, are they paying the fee? Mr. Chair, um, I didn't quite get all of your question. It bleeped out a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, Region Eisen had also mentioned Gallatin College students. Um, will they be paying this fee? Mr. Chair, uh, one moment. I'm, I'm looking it up as we speak. Um, I, I'm positive that Vice President Least is able to answer this on the fly, but we're going to test our ability here as well. With it, my guess is that there are building fees attached to that, and um, I am assuming that they pay the same building and facility fees. If we give us just two seconds here, I'll be able to answer it. They're to the right. Mr. Chair, I'll have to get back to you on the answer on that. We certainly have that data at hand. I just don't have it off the top of my head. I see that Terry Lease is here and is unmuted. Thank you. Yeah, Chair Tuss and uh, members of the committee, yeah, I believe the answer to that is yes. Gallatin Co uh, College students, if if they some some mandatory fees are only um, if you take seven or more credits. Um, others are are start at one credit. So, but. My understanding is that the Gallatin College students have access to these facilities, have access to these services, and therefore do pay the fee. Thank you, Terry. Mr. Chair, we confirm that, that they do pay the same fee. Okay, thank you. Additional comments or questions for members of the board? Are there any? Yes, Regent Miller. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, one more question along the lines of that mandatory fee. Um, I know that students can opt out of um, certain fees, for example, the ASMSU fee, which allows access to the gym. Um, if they opt out of that fee, uh, are they also able to opt out of this fee, or are you saying this is a completely mandatory fee for each student on campus to pay? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, this is a mandatory fee that all students must pay and there is no opt out. The only instance when you wouldn't pay is if you were an online student. Perfect. Thank you so much for that clarification. Thank you. Additional comments? Additional comments or questions from members of the board? Yeah, Chair Tuss, this is uh, Regent Lozar. Uh, you know, I just want to make sure that we're sort of keeping keeping our eyes on the prize just in terms of, you know, you know, paying for and um, really heeding sort of the advice uh, through, through the students and the support of the students um, that voted on this particular fee and uh, sort of prioritize this facility for their use. You know, perhaps uh, Taylor might be able to speak to sort of wide range of different students um, that, that voted as well as you know, the wide range of different uh, so use of the proposed facility among the students. So uh, maybe Mr. Blossom has some, some color on that. Certainly. Uh, thank you, Regent Lozar and Chair Tess. Um, with the, like I mentioned, there was a lot of outreach done last fall. And within that outreach, we really prioritized um, reaching out to as many different student groups as we can or as we could. Um, so that looked like, you know, going to all the different clubs on campus, all the fraternities and sororities, um, you know, reaching out to freshmen, reaching out to seniors, and really just getting as many different um, perspectives from students as we could. And I think the, the final pro product and the vision we have for what this facility is going to look like um, is going to be, as has been mentioned previously, a really uh, holistic facility um, and one that has something for everyone on campus in it. Um, you know, there are students who are really into climbing. And so a, a climbing wall is going to be a big draw for them. But then there are other students that maybe don't really use um, our, our fitness spaces right now and have rarely been to the fitness center during their time at MSU, who maybe go there for some health services and see what's offered 
in the wellness and the fitness side of it um, and are able to take advantage of those services and vice versa as well. Um, and so I, I think we did a lot of work to make sure that we were getting a really representative sample of students and making sure that this was not um, the the products were that are going to be in this new facility are not niche to any particular group. Um, I think there's something for every student on MSU um, in this facility. And I think you we saw that with the vote, with the overwhelming support we got for it, um, that this wasn't, you know, this wasn't one small group of students that was really driving this initiative and was going to benefit from it. I really see benefit for the entire student body um, in this facility and what it's, and yeah, what it's going to do for the future of campus. I hope that answered your question, Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Taylor, it did. Thank you, Mr. Blossom. Um, additional comments or questions for members of the board? I see no hands being raised. Okay. Um, well, thank you uh, for that presentation. And let's proceed on to um, the next item, which is item F, request for approval to restructure the ASUM activity free. And this is an, an item from the University of Montana, Missoula. Mr. Mr. Chair. Tyler here again. Um, I'll kick this one off and then hand it over to the folks at the University of Montana. This is again an off cycle request for an increase or a actual change in structure and an increase um, to a mandatory fee, the activity student activity fee at the University of Montana. Uh, specifically, it would uh, charge students who are enrolling in um, between one and six credits, um, a, a new fee. They pay zero right now. This is a, a request to charge them $35 per semester. Uh, students that are that are enrolled in um, a higher number of credits actually pay into this fee currently. And um, the university and the students, um, student-led, this is a student-driven fee, uh, voted on it, the appropriate information and the affirmative vote is attached. Uh, they've included uh, their fee table to be completely transparent in their request. And I believe we have uh, 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 ASUM representative Abigail Belcher on the line as well as Vice President Paul Lassiter to further address this item. Thank you. Um, Abigail, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the board, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the outgoing ASUM president from the 1920 academic year and a recent graduate from the University of Montana. I'll just give a quick explanation about the reasoning behind this restructure. It was placed on the election ballot for a variety of reasons and was passed by the UM student body by 68%. First and foremost, part-time students who don't pay the ASUM fee are unable to access ASUM services and participate in student groups. By nature, ASUM services like child care and legal services are beneficial to all students, regardless of credit load. Student groups are also an important piece of the college experience for part-time students and full-time student alike. And at ASUM, we believe that it is important for students to be able to interact with their peers of differing backgrounds. As it currently stands, many part-time students who wish to utilize ASUM services and join student groups are unable to. These students end up paying the full fee partway through the semester when they make the decision to access the service or join the student group, but it would be much easier for these students to pay a reduced fee at the beginning of the semester and then have the ability to access ASUM services at their leisure. This is also an effort to align with most of the other fee structures at UM by eliminating the opt-out option and offering a reduced rate. This restructure will also increase revenue at ASUM and open up more opportunities for part-time students. Thank you, Abigail. Um, and we, we have a comment from the administration as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chair Tass, uh, Chair Lewis, our members of the board. Uh, administration supports uh, this fee as proposed by ASUM. 
Um, I think it is important to note if, if uh, reviewing IPEDS data for the past five years, anywhere between 19 and 22 percent of the total student enrollment at the University of Montana is in fact part-time. So there is a substantial um, volume of students uh, that would be able to enjoy the benefits of this fee uh, if enacted. So we are in support and thanks to Abigail and her team for bringing it forward. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question, Abigail. Can you, if, if you recall, uh, I know that this went through a, a student vote, correct? Was it a, a campus-wide student vote? Can you talk a little bit about that and, and the percentage? Did you have a good percentage of students that voted on this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So this was approved by the Senate to go on a ballot in, the res in a resolution during the fall semester. And then it was approved by 68% of the students who voted. And I believe we had about a 13.8% voter turnout. So most of the students who turned out to vote um, approved this fee, and we also had an increase in turnout from the last year as well. Okay. Thank you very much for that answer. And perhaps, Deputy Commissioner, I have one more question for you, and then I'll open it up. Um, how consistent is this type of policy with the other student activity fees that we have on other campuses? Are they charging the students at that lower, that lower end of the, the credit spectrum um, student activity fees as well? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, there is a wide range of spectrum here um, from campuses that uh, are at zero and then campuses that tear up from um, as uh, more of a uh, connection to the number of credits. So it starts at $4 and, and maybe goes up to 25 before it hits the uh, full-time student. Um, and then other campuses that uh, have uh, somewhere in the range of $20. Uh, so this would be higher than what I was able to find at the other campuses for part-time students. Yet we do have campuses that charge in the neighborhood of $20 for part-time students. Thank you. Um, are, there, are there other questions or comments from members of the board on this item? Yeah, Chair Tess, uh, I think Regent Miller's got a question. Yes, I, I see that. Regent Miller. Great. Thank you, Chair Tess. Um, I would also like to voice my support for this item in conjunction with talking with Abigail, with the Montana Associated Students, and with the vote that happened on the University of Montana. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also speak up uh, for, for the University of Montana Associated Students. So um, with that, thank you so much for all of your work, Abigail and Paul. Um, and that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Regent Miller. Uh, additional comments or questions from members of the board? I see none. So thank you for that presentation and we will move on to the next agenda item. Um, we are at a G, I believe, is that correct? No. That is right. Yes, request for approval to increase the ASUM student activity fee. And another request, correct? That's correct. Mr. Chair, uh, Tyler here again. I'll kick this one off. This is a request uh, to increase the same fee uh, for students enrolled in more than six credits to increase that fee by $3 uh, per credit, moving it from $73 to $76. Uh, the campus, um, similarly to the previous item, has submitted the appropriate information in terms of the vote and the tuition and fee tables. And once again, we have uh, our ASUM representative, Abigail, and uh, Vice President Lassiter on the line. Thank you. Uh, Abigail? Yeah, thank you again. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about this one, the increase by $3. This was voted on the same election and passed by 63%. Um, and it was also thoughtfully approved by ASUM senators and a lot of work has gone into this one throughout the year. Um, ASUM has struggled financially as a result of declining enrollment and thus declining fee revenue. This has impacted our ability to fund our agencies and student groups at the required amount of $6 per student. This policy dictates that during annual budgeting, the monetary equivalent of $6 of each student's fee must be allocated to student groups. And I've said before some of the benefits of student groups. 
This year, ASUM transferred $30,000 out of reserve accounts to meet this requirement. Additionally, our organization has spent well over $100,000 of reserves to cover costs associated with asbestos found in the child care facilities in early 2019. Furthermore, ASUM child care has suffered an additional loss of over $100,000 as a result of complications related to COVID-19. While our reserve funding has sufficed to cover these costs, at our current projected fee revenue, ASUM is not financially prepared for any new emergencies in the near future. Additionally, per personnel policy, wages of student employees and some staff positions are tied to the minimum wage. As the minimum wage continues to increase in Montana, costs associated with personnel and staffing are also continuing to increase for ASUM. Student needs are also growing. Although enrollment has declined, participation in ASUM student groups has increased, as has the scope of their activities. In the past year, ASUM has supported a trip to Africa, purchased recreation equipment, and funded numerous well-attended campus events. Studies show that student group activities are integral to student retention, and many students at UM have found a sense of community in an ASUM student group. ASUM has also expanded by adding the UM Food Pantry, a critical service for students facing food insecurity at UM. This program includes a student coordinator and an AmeriCorps VISTA. ASUM Legal Services has found new needs among students. Specifically, there is an increased need for landlord, tenant, and consumer protection law resources. In order to meet the demands of students, ASUM Legals should increase its capacity by at least 0.5 FTE. Lastly, I must emphasize that all increased costs at ASUM have been to meet the needs of students where they are. At the current level of enrollment combined with unforeseen expenses, it is becoming increasingly difficult to fund the basic operating costs of our agencies and adequately support our student groups. I thank you for your time today and welcome any questions. Thank you, Abigail. Um, Vice President Lasseter. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Tusk, Chair Lozar, members of the board. Um, administration supports uh, ASUM's effort to increase this fee. I really want to applaud um, ASUM's efforts, uh, number one, to you know proactively service the students of the University of Montana and the host of ways that they do. I know that in confronting the fiscal challenges that they've had, um, they've not only evaluated the uh, potential for increasing this fee, but they have sought to reduce costs um, in several areas and they have taken proactive action in doing so. Um, nonetheless, in order to provide a, a minimum level of service, this fee would in fact provide the funding necessary to do so and the administration supports the ASUM's effort in that regard. Thank you, Vice President Lasseter. Um, my, my question is, is uh, I, I think I heard this improperly, it is a total um, $3 increase. It's not $3 per credit, right? Okay. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Indeed. Are there are there other questions or comments about this particular item, members of the board? Yes, Regent Sheehy. Um, just wondered what kind of input was gathered from students. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. So our executive team started looking at this. Yeah, <laughs> looking at this issue probably all the way back in August. And throughout that time, we just sort of evaluated our experiences with students coming into the office um, and the kinds of things that they were experiencing and also taking a look at what students were asking for and our ability to meet those needs. And it was becoming very difficult throughout the year. Um, then further in the semester, we wrote a resolution that was officially passed by our representative body at UM, the ASUM senators, and I believe that passed almost unanimously with a couple abstentions and only one no vote. So almost all of the senators were on board with um, both the increase and the restructure at that time. And then after that, the senators, I know, put a lot of work in communicating with students about the future changes and how that would affect them and how it would affect their bill. So that by the time the election came around, we were able to do further education and outreach from a distance, of course, because of the coronavirus situation um, via Facebook and Instagram to get more support from students. And then by the time they had the ability to vote, it passed by 63%. So I have a follow up question actually for Paul. Um, Paul, you, you always have a particular opinion about increased fees. And I just wondered if this kind of fee offends you or meets with your approval? What, do you have thoughts about this that are different than your thoughts, for example, on the turf? You know, I, I think it's incumbent upon all of us 
as leaders um, to try to keep our costs as low as possible um, in delivering the services that we provide to all of our constituents. Um, so, I mean, there's a balance between um, seeking to um, keep costs as low as possible and also provide quality, excellent service in the ways that we think are important to deliver. Um, this fee doesn't particularly uh, offend me in any way, no. Um, I, I support it personally. The administration supports it. Um, the good work that is done at the ASUM, I think, uh, warrants consideration of this uh, request and uh, stand behind it. You know, the, the total increase for um, a student taking 12 units uh, here at the University of Montana, a, a resident student will see their total cost increase between fiscal 20 and fiscal 21, again, at that 12 unit level, of 0.79% before this fee and after this fee, 0.89%. So less than a 1% total increase with regard to total tuition and mandatory fee charges. Non-resident students would see their increase go from approximately 3.89% to 3.91. So it, it's a very small change, but I think um, in, the, in the broad scheme, but in terms of the dollars that it will generate for ASUM, I think it, it, it is critical. That's helpful. I was confused by the fact that there are two Pauls. I actually was querying my fellow regent, oh. Paul Tuss. <laughs> well, I apologize. Thank you. I apologize. No, I, I, uh, I, have, I have no concern um, about this. And, and I think that uh, in particular, I think that Abigail has, has done a very nice job of explaining the need for this. Um, I always concern myself with uh, assuring the, the student body uh, has, has had an input on this, not just student government, but an actual vote of the student body. And oftentimes we look at those percentages of, of students that show up at the polls to vote for this, and they're relatively low. But I believe that Abigail indicated that 13% of the student body had actually gone to the polls and voted on this, which I, I think um, for these type of things in, in the MUS is is kind of on course and, and on par for what we what we're used to seeing. So, um, those those are my thoughts about this. So I, I'm sure. Thank you. Are there are there other questions um, from members of the board or other comments from members of the board? Well, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, uh, and and regents, I uh, I'd be remiss if I if I didn't just thank Abigail uh, for her really uh, just tremendous work over the past year, and, and in particular over the past several months. You know, as uh, we we rightly take uh, issues like this, fees and costs for students, very seriously. Uh, as you well know, the level of student engagement at the University of Montana is incredibly uh, uh, robust. Uh, and, and I think the, uh, it's been a big focus of ours uh, over the past year is, is really making uh, this a supportive, inclusive, um, nurturing uh, uh, environment for our students. And, uh, and so as we consider fees like this, we, uh, we, we take the, uh, again, the cost impacts very seriously, um, but we, uh, we take the important role that ASUM plays uh, equally seriously. And, and I just want to commend Abigail for the thoroughness with which she's approached this uh, and the way that she has uh, just, you know, more broadly, uh, and since she's here been uh, such a tremendous advocate for students as we've navigated uh, daily calls over the past two months, Abigail has, uh, has participated in those and has been a, a wise voice uh, and, a, and a key member of our leadership team. So uh, we're very proud of, uh, of Abigail, very grateful for Abigail. And uh, I just wanted to uh, publicly recognize and thank her. She has uh, been a tremendous leader uh, and uh, we're very excited to see the, uh, the impact that she will have uh, over the coming years as she, uh, she departs our university and, uh, and, and goes on to her next, uh, her next adventure. So thank, thank you, Abigail. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> thank you, President Butter. Um, additional questions from members of the board or, or comments on this item? I, I see none. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's proceed then 
And the last action item request for authorization to execute a lease for a shop warehouse on behalf of MSU Montana State University. Chair, yeah, this is Ron Muppin. I'll take this one. Uh, so Miltech is a subunit within the Vice President of Research at MSU Bozeman, and they are seeking approval to enter into an off-campus lease for space to accommodate required research and development functions. The lease is in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where Miltech staff currently works. He requires a shop facility to house the equipment and materials to perform the prototype work. Their scope has grown into a point where they need more space for a shop slash warehouse. It is 1,750 square feet at $16 a square foot, which is within the market range for the area. Uh, how we know it's in the market range for the area, because this is uh, rare to have a, uh, a lease that's out of state. MSU has really done their due diligence here. They've worked, uh, they have a real estate specialist in their campus planning area who has worked with a licensed real estate broker in, from the local area in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, key to this, uh, Lease is also the fact that there's no tenant improvements. The lease is for 24 months at a cost of about 20,000 a year. So we're talking 56,000 ish uh, dollars for the term of the lease. And Miltec does have the funds to pay for the lease. The lease has not been executed yet. Uh, they are waiting for the board to approve to move forward. And when that lease, uh, before it's executed, the legal will make sure that they uh, take a good review of it. So stand for any questions. And Vice President Lease, I believe, is available as well if there's any questions. Thank, thank you, Ron. Um, you know, T Terry, you can't, you can't get by with having an agenda item for Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with having <laughs> at least a question or two. So would you, would you like to explain the item just a little bit more? Sure, uh, Chair Tuss and members of the committee and the board and, and everyone. I, I knew that this question was coming and, and uh, you didn't even have to give me a heads up. So, um, yeah, so our Miltech, uh, Operation is a, a research center here on campus, and they they do work um, for all four branches of the military, and uh, they have um, industry partners in, in various parts of the country. Fort Lauderdale is is a high concentration of those folks, and they have a, an employee down there who's been working out of his apartment, and uh, quite honestly, uh, just with the growth, he he can't continue to show the the models and the uh, he's got mannequins set up. This is body armor and other types of things that they're they're working on with um, both the, the military directly and with part, other industry partners that uh, actually manufacture these goods. And so this lease is needed so that this individual down there can continue to be productive and, and work with those industry partners and the military. Um, happy to answer any other specific questions, but that's generally um, what's happening here. And I, I've done my due diligence because this obviously was uh, an unusual request. And so I appreciate your, your question. Thank you, Vice President. Um, additional questions from members of the board? Yes, uh, Regent Rogers. I just wanted to speak in favor of this one. Um, it's so impressive what Miltech does and they're over $14 million of research expenditures. So I appreciate all the due diligence that went into this. And uh, it is a curious sounding uh, proposal, but I think that I've, I've discussed this with uh, the director and um, I'm, it's, it's impressive that um, so much thought and effort has gone into making sure that it's done right. And it's great that they have two years of funding already in hand. Thank you, Regent Rogers. And, and Vice President Least, I know that in the narrative you discuss that uh, the proposed rate is, is based on fair market value or fair market lease rate. Um, just for the record, can you can you speak to that just a little bit? Certainly, yeah, Chair Justin, members of the committee. So yeah, we looked at the, the, the range down there and it is in the 12 something to 16 something. And this is on the higher end, but keep in mind that because we are working with industry partners and whatnot, we uh, they needed air conditioned space to be comfortable. You can imagine um, how warehouse space would be if it wasn't air conditioning and you're showing um, various um, garments and that type of thing. So it's on, it's, it's it within the range. It is a little on the, the higher end of the general market, but that's just because it's air conditioned and it's nice enough space to be um, sort of a, a place where you could take industry partners and customers to, to look at this, these items and work together. Thank you. Thank you, Additional comments or questions from members of the board? Um, 
Oh yeah, yeah. So Regent Nystuen. Thank you. Um, could could you just give us a little bit more color back on how does this impact the the campus and the citizens here in Montana as it relates to this operation in Florida with good work they're doing, but how does that translate back to the good for the people of Montana? Thank you. Yeah. Regent uh, Nice Dune and uh, Chair Tuss and members of the committee. So, I mean, this grant is is granted to Montana State University and, and Miltech. And so, you know, there are other employees obviously that are based here. Uh, they're um, all part of these grants, the, the facilities and administrative costs that come back help pay for space, not only in Fort Lauderdale as this request would have, but also um, overhead costs here for um, space and other things that support our overall mission and the, the research, the, the very good research that uh, that Miltech is, is working on and the, and the projects that they have. So. Um, I don't know if that answers your question to its you know, full extent. If you have something more specific, I'll try to answer that. But it certainly does have a, a big impact on, on Montana from the overall grant component. This is a, a pretty small piece of, of the roughly $4.7 million that is already in hand in grants that is uh, part of this particular project. Additional comments or questions from members of the board on this item? Okay, I see none. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so now we're at the, uh, nearing the end of the agenda, but we're at the information um, part of our agenda today. And uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, um, can I turn this over to you uh, for perhaps some comments? Uh, yes, please, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'd like to uh, just start by taking a little bit of a sidebar from what's on our agenda um, uh, before we go into information item one there to briefly talk about COVID-19 and uh, give you an update as it relates to um, the MUS budget and finance uh, and some of the work that we've been doing. I've had some individual conversations with regents, but I don't know for sure collectively we've all had an opportunity to hear um, just kind of some of the general comments that I have and so if we took maybe five minutes here and uh, I, I kind of outline that for you so um, this is an area where we're, we received hundreds of questions what is fall going to look like you know, are we going to be open and what is it going to do to our enrollment is it going to affect out-of-state students in-state students how does that translate um, into revenue and, and, and then ultimately how, how um, if it is a, a negative impact, how do we make it through? And so um, I first and foremost want to say, I don't have the answers to those. Uh, I can't, I can't uh, precisely answer any of those questions, but I, I guess what I can do though, through work and conversations that we've had continuously with the chief financial officers and and folks in our office here and the governor's office in particular is just kind of give you a framework of a way to kind of think about and digest um, the information as we move closer to fall and as um, information and data uh, materialize. So now I, I wish I had a PowerPoint presentation and I know I'm a long way from the screen here, but it, I, I think about it as a, as a triangle here. And, and at the tip of the triangle there, we have enrollment. And then over here on this side, we would have budget. And then over on this side, we would have stimulus or relief funds. And then somewhere connected to this too is the state operating budget. But, but, but let's, let's just stick with the, the triangle there that I outlined with enrollment, budget, and relief. And, and start with enrollment and talk about um, what we know at this point in time. So we've had largely informal conversations with campuses individually. We're in constant contact with them. And uh, what we've seen from campuses and what we know about how we look at enrollment this early before fall semester is that there's multiple uh, pods of information. We start with the applications that come into the university system. 
And then we convert those applications into actually admitted students. And then those admitted students end up registering for classes. And then those who, those, uh, who register for classes ultimately end up paying. And it's those paid students that we count on the 15th day of class to give you a preliminary look at what fall would look like. And it's not until the end of the fall that we have the official enrollment. Um, so uh, that complex up and down of, of information as we, we work towards fall semester, um, we ask campuses, how are you doing? And, and just kind of in a, form, in, in a real informal fashion here, uh, completely upon my own framework, I can put those campuses into different categories. We have some campuses that are um, doing similar to what they have in the past, uh, maybe slightly down, maybe flat. We have another group of campuses uh, that at this point in time, is just too early. Uh, you can't, can't make heads or tails out of it. And then, then we have other camp set of campuses that, that would be showing some declines. And, um, and, I, and I guess I would frame those declines in the sense of what we know nationally. And so we hear from our national partners at SHEO and ACE and, and others who have done surveys uh, throughout the nation and continue to do so, that one out of six students are worried about the fall and that there may be some concern for those students not to return. So, um, you know, I, I kind of round that to 15%. We, we could say somewhere between 10 and 20% of the students um, might still be in flux in terms of whether or not they're going to come back this fall. And, and so for us, and campuses are, as they're developing, keep in mind in September, we have the approval of our operating budgets. And those operating budgets uh, work largely on this same framework that I've, descri that I've described here. And, and so campuses are modeling out um, on a daily basis as things start to materialize uh, what their operating budgets would look like and adjusting to meet those changes. So here at the system, we can model as well. And uh, we don't do as specific of a job, but um, we can take into consideration uh, where uh, collectively our campuses would be. And, and really a worst case scenario, if we lost 15% of our enrollment, we can then turn to our tuition revenue and see how that might be affected. We look at the auxiliary portion of our budget and, and, and talk about the, the dollars that would be um, uh, in, in the deficit there. Uh, effects on uh, things like athletics, obviously, are, are concerning sales and services, the events that occur on campus. Um, and, and all of this then connects to that third box. And I think that third box is over here, uh, which is the stimulus or relief funds. And so we compile that information and uh, any opportunity we have and the dollars that come to the state of Montana or potentially are coming to the state of Montana, we make our case based upon um, the, the information I provided you with the relation of enrollment to budget. And um, we have received some stimulus dollars. Those stimulus dollars up to this point um, have $31 million for the state in the CARES Act um, under the, uh, I believe the Office of Education Stabilization Funding $26 million directly to the Montana University system. And so um, with that comes rules. And so of that $26 million, half of it we've supplied directly to students and, and we're required to for emergency aid, primarily related to operations that were disrupted this spring semester. And so we're in the process of, of getting those funds out. That leaves us with $13 million. Um, we refunded close to $12 million for room and board this spring. And so our campuses are using those funds uh, to, uh, if they can, some campuses don't even have enough funds to fill the, the totality of the hole that was created by those refunds. Um, but that eats up a lot of what uh, came in the first, first tranche uh, of funds. Um, we know that there's other funds uh, available um, through the governor's relief uh, funding. Um, we are in constant contact with the governor's office and responding to questions that they have uh, immediately and we'll continue to work with them. We keep our eye on the federal government and um, future stimulus uh, funds that we see um, working their way through Congress. And we hope that there are uh, relief funds in there that'll uh, apply directly to the university system and, um, and, and really just keep in constant contact with our fellow chief financial officers on campus 
uh, to be uh, as nimble as we possibly can. Uh, Mr. Chair, I hope that uh, brief overview there uh, provides some light on the situation we have. I would be happy to stand for any questions. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that good presentation. Uh, are there questions from members of the board? Re hey, Chair Tess, this is Regent Lozar. Yes. Uh, I do have a, a, a question for uh, either Tyler or, or, or Clay, just relating to the relief funds. Um, you, you said you've been sort of tracking um, maybe some of the conversation around if whether or not there'll be a sort of a round two of funding or a round three or whatnot. So I'm wondering if uh, if any of your contacts sort of nationally have a sense of whether or not higher education will will be prioritized in, in future uh, really funding. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Lozar, I could certainly take a stab at that. It was still much unknown. As you know, last uh, Friday, I believe the, there was a version of a CARES, uh, uh, the name HOPE, Hope Act. Uh, HEROES Act, sorry, <laughs> that passed out of um, the House, and that has actually some identified funds to go directly to higher education, 30-some uh, billion dollars within it that is more directed at uh, backfilling. You know, there's some language in the current CARES Act that doesn't allow for backfilled revenue and some of that stuff. It was more relief to the individuals. This is more broad. That's certainly worked at uh, SHIO and other organizations have pushed hard on that, you know, um, we, we need to help the individuals that participate, but we also need to help stabilize the institutions. And so uh, there is fund requests in that conversation, and uh, there, there are some identified in, in the act that passed. Where it goes in the Senate um, is yet to be determined. We certainly have been in conversation with our uh, Senate delegations uh, at, at the DC level provided their offices with information as we go and we'll continue to work closely with all of our congressional delegation to try to see what the opportunities are for relief funds. They're incredibly important in terms of sort of stabilizing our picture. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Sure. Regent Nystuen. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of a broad question, and I don't expect the answers right now, but one of the things that it, as uh, individuals and businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19 have struggled to uh, work through all of this is they've had to rely on other than PPP loans. Um, one of the things is clearly any type of investment, savings, and so forth. An area of concern of mine continues to be the level of reserves or lack thereof for some of our campuses. And I, I'm not asking to single them out, but I think it'd be interesting as members of the regents for us to have understanding as to, so belt tightening goes so far, use of existing financial resources gets called into play here. We have to look at our various different uh, belt tightening types of measures and so forth. but. You know the 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 paychecks still need to go out. The uh, you know there's a lot of uh, additional costs that the campusers are facing these days, and I'm concerned. Do they have enough money to to weather through this right now? I, I think Tyler did a nice job of explaining the current situation, but ultimately, where are we from a reserve standpoint, globally, and and sometime I'd like to know more on an individual campus basis. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner, do you have thoughts or comments on that? I'll speak um, to that Mr. a little Chair, bit. Members of the committee, uh, certainly we have uh, four designated reserve accounts that we approve in each operating budget, and uh, those are related to our current unrestricted fund, um, the fund that provides for the education and general operations of our campuses. So we see those annually, and, and we are uh, very much in tune and in touch with those accounts. Um, campuses may have reserves related to, you know, plant funds that they're using for uh, minor maintenance and operations. Um, we certainly can uh, put out a survey to the campuses to um, understand more fully what those reserve accounts are and, um, and, and we'll do so. 
Mr. Chair, if I could, I, I guess just two other observations. In, in some cases, unlike private sector, we have limits on the amount of reserves that we can have. Uh, and sometimes uh, when we've built up reserves, they're often swept up in the next legislative session. So that's a little bit of a double-edged sword that we need to deal with in higher ed. Um, but the other comment I would make is that there absolutely is belt tightening going on. I mean, really any sort of discretionary funding is being eliminated. Uh, events are being canceled. Travel is being canceled in, in some in re response to current regulations, but even future travel is being scrutinized at a much different level. And we will, uh, yeah, it, it, it's gonna have to come from a lot of sources and, and we are looking at sort of any uh, amount of spending that we can forego uh, to try to add to the overall uh, coffers as, as we look to move into fall. And uh, we'll continue to do that. I know campuses are taking a serious look at um, expenses on all kinds of levels. Th thank you, Commissioner. Um, Regent Sheehy, I think that you had a question. I do. I have a couple questions uh, about stimulus, Tyler. Um, are most of the stimulus funds expected to be federal funds? Mr. Chair, Regent Sheehy, yes, all of them. Okay, so we'll be in competition with a lot of other entities for those funds, I presume. Will there be, is there anything about the way we budget biannually or the fact that our legislature meets every two years that puts us at a disadvantage for the stimulus fund competition? Mr. Chair, Regent Sheehy, I'm not so sure disadvantage. Obviously what makes us unique is our dependency upon tuition revenue. Um, and that tied to 18 year olds and their you know decision-making on going to college or not. Um, that's the always the catch 22 for us. So um, that makes us, I, I would say more vulnerable in a lot of cases. Um, so, I, I, but I don't know about uh, as a disadvantage. I, I don't believe I, I can think of one. Do you feel that there's anything that we need to do to position ourselves either legislatively or as a board to be a top runner in the competition for the stimulus dollars? Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Sheehy, no, I don't believe there's anything more that we need to do. We have uh, been in very close contact with um, our governor's office staff, um, congressional staff, and um, may ha have made our case very well known. Okay. Um, and my, my final comment is just an observation. All of these pieces are moving and they're moving in directions that we haven't really seen them move before. So we don't know what to expect more so than ever regarding the budget. As somebody who's going to be voting on the budget, or perhaps I won't be, um, I think it's important that you keep the board informed along the way of these changing developments. Uh, keep the information flowing because at the time of deliberation, we should be fully informed. And uh, given all the changing circumstances, I think that requires a flow of communication throughout this process. Mr. Chair, Regent Shee, absolutely. Thanks. Deputy Commissioner, could, could you talk a little bit more about the competition? Um, who, who are we competing against for these funds? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, depending upon the source of funds, the, the first um, uh, one I uh, indicated on, ed, on the education stabilization funding, um, we weren't competing against anyone. Those were actual line items determined right. by campus on enrollment and the number of uh, Pell students and prescribed in the bill. So those came directly to each campus. Um, the other set of funding is the governor's uh, emergency relief fund for education, specifically for education. So, um, you know, so it's the whole gamut of education from K-12 uh, through higher ed, public and I believe some private. Um, and then we have the governor's broad relief funding. Um, and that's all of state government and the operations of uh, everything from public health through the, you know, the 
everyone invested in the mitigation and um, and and tracking of the disease. Uh, that's that's a really broad set there, um, and there's a lot of um, stipulations related to those funds. For instance, we're, we're not at all sure that those funds can be used for revenue backfill. For instance, so. Um, that's that's really where we're at, uh, at least as far as I know. Okay, that clarification. Um, Regent Rogers. Good. Thank you. Um, so looking at the three pillars, enrollment, budget, and stimulus, um, you know, this is my background. I, I come from a legislative background and a little concerned about the ability of the federal government to pass additional stimulus bills this year, uh, given that it's election year, um, given the division government. Um, do, like in your budgeting process, have you factored in the potential reality that we do not receive additional stimulus funding? or that it doesn't come until a lame duck session very late in the year? Are there specific timelines that are important for the MUS budget that funds need to be received by? Um, like how much of a cushion or flexibility do we have here without addi additional stimulus funds? Mr. Chair, Regent Rogers, uh, you know, that's um, very campus uh, specific and, and on, it depends upon what the for one, what the enrollment turns out to be, the enrollment mix and the revenue that campuses are able to produce from that. So I'm not gonna be able to tell you a, a specific you know, line of demarcation of when we have to have a certain amount of funds in, in order to continue to operate. I, you know, I, I will say that um, the, the, the best approach to this is for our office to remain in very close contact with each individual campus um, work through issues, uh, uh, you know, straight up transparent communication is, is absolutely vital in this type of situation. And then to look at strategies for any type of backfill that might have to occur outside of some sort of help from the federal government. Um, and, and those again, go to the reserves that we have, uh, the cash flow campuses have on hand immediately. Um, and, um, and really just working through any of that that type of planning um, to produce operating budgets that uh, the regions can can see clearly in September. Uh, I mean, I don't want to uh, get anybody's um, expectations too high here. The, the, the clarity of this is going to take a few months for sure. Um, but we'll keep you updated as we know things along the way and um, communicate early and often. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, if, if I could add to that though, just to be clear, we're, we're asking campuses to model without any stimulus dollars. Um, and, and that's what we'll continue to do. We're gonna have to present to you structurally balanced budgets with what we know, uh, not what we hope for. So that that's the modeling that's being done now and, and we'll continue. And, and uh, you know, I, I think I've said a number of times, we will plan for the worst and hope for the best and uh, we'll see where it lands. But I, I, I think that's what we have to do as we build budgets going into the fall. And, and you know, I guess not to paint the picture more bleak because it's pretty bleak, but we also have, uh, uh, we approach a, a legislative session as somebody mentioned earlier in six months away and we're gonna have to work our way through that too. Um, and look at sort of how that unfolds as we move into fall, uh, working with the governor's budget office, but also sort of our own analysis of where we think that may land and where our present law adjustments that you are looking at in this uh, meeting today, how, how they're received by the governor's budget office. And so all that will be taken into account in the modeling, but we'll model for a structural balance um, regardless of where we're at. Chair, Chair Tuss, this is Regent Lozar. Um, you know, maybe a question on the same lines as uh, Regent Rogers, um, and, and certainly recognizing Regent Sheehy's um, underscoring, you know, transparency and communication. Uh, 
you know, I think in September is when we, as a board, look at operating budgets and we approve operating budgets. And certainly there's a lot of factors that are going to come into play between now and, and whatever it is, September 15th. Um, certainly, you know, I guess I looked at Commissioner Christian around just making sure the board is updated on those, re the, the stimulus conversation, relief conversation, conversation around um, uh, the state of Montana's coronavirus relief fund, of which I think Tyler mentioned that it's a very narrow focus use of funds on that. And certainly who knows where that will go. I know the first round of funding has gone out primarily for uh, sort of safety net, uh, business support and public health support. But as those additional funds uh, are released, I think that the state of Montana got one and a quarter billion um, that, that we're aware of sort of where higher education is in that. Um, and, the, and the second, I mean, I think it was helpful, Tyler, you sort of explaining the, you know, the different pods of, of pods that you're tracking in terms of the sequence of enrollment projections, you know, starting with a number of applications through those that have been admitted today, those are still making decisions. Um, and in a typical year, we sort of wait in September for those numbers. We usually, they're not final numbers for us because it's usually not on the 15th day for at least for some of the campuses. So I guess keeping us up to date on any sort of drastic shifts outside of the, some of the projections that you've made, Tyler, uh, around enrollment would be really helpful. And maybe, maybe embedded in this commentary is, is a question around if you see if there is any sort of timeline or, or point in time along this continuum of understanding enrollment. Um, maybe it's in July. Maybe it's in you know early August or something that will give us a little more stability and understanding of exactly where we stand, so that we're way more informed going into decision making and taking action on the, the operating budget come September. So if there is any of those sort of benchmark indicators or benchmark timelines, um, I think it'd be really helpful for the board to know just knowing uh, how, how many different factors are at play. Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Lozar, uh, I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, we'll keep a a close eye on that and an eye toward um, looking at benchmarks uh, on enrollment that are earlier than normal, um, you know, and and I don't have a, a specific date in mind there, but uh, we'll do some analysis and uh, keep you up to date as much as possible. Thank you. Um, I, I don't see any additional questions or comments. Oh, Regent Sheehy. Um, just an additional comment for Tyler. Uh, as you grow to understand the process for obtaining those stimulus dollars a, a little better, I'm sure that that's also an evolving process. If it appears to you that there is a process um, that we can use that would be helpful, like in fact finding or presenting information with respect to those dollars, uh, we are uniquely situated because we're spread across the state to hit those campuses, have open meetings. There's distance ways to do that also, but we do that in president searches. We've imposed that duty on ourselves for name changing of universities. Um, it's easy to do. And so with a little advance notice, if there's information that you think we should be obtaining in order to make a good case, as you figure out this process, just let us know because that's something that we could be very useful. Thank you, we will do. Other comments or questions from members? I, I see none. So, uh, Deputy Commissioner, thank you for that. That was a, a needed and important conversation. The first agenda item on the information part of our agenda is um, faculty tenure, proposed revision to our board policy. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Kevin McRae, Deputy Commissioner for Human Resources. Heather, if you would open the attachment, please. So board members, this is an information item uh, for a proposed policy revision that would come back to you at your next meeting if all looks to be on the right track in your view. You are looking at uh, board personnel policy 706.1 faculty tenure. And this is a classic tenure policy that uh, generally maps or outlines the, the pathway for uh, faculty from the point that they are hired new into the system in a probationary status and, and how faculty then uh, move uh, through the promotion and tenure procedures and ultimately attain tenure. And as Heather has done, we've scrolled to the bottom um, and we are proposing in this information item a pretty concise policy revision that we think will improve clarity and practicality in helping our campuses be uh, successful, competitive uh, employers, uh, recruiting employers when it comes to uh, securing campus leadership talent, uh, particularly in academic affairs, but sometimes administrators as well in the CEO positions. So as you see, the, the very bottom of your board policy, this section three, Current language says that persons hired into administrative positions from outside the Montana University system may be granted faculty tenure status in accordance with the terms of this policy. That's current language. Those words in accordance with the terms of this policy sometimes give rise to a little bit of ambiguity and confusion because as we scrolled down to the bottom, you saw that 99% of this policy is really geared towards that situation envisioning how does the new probationary faculty member, for example, a brand new assistant professor over the years, um, follow that pathway to, to uh, become eligible for tenure and then apply for tenure and ultimately achieve tenure. This section of your policy that says persons hired into administrative positions from outside the system may be granted faculty tenure status was envisioned and intended to allow our campuses to be very competitive employers when it comes to recruiting administrators. Um, across the country, it is not unusual for universities and university systems in certain situations uh, to offer tenure, faculty tenure, to incoming administrators. And an example would be um, if a hypothetical campus in your system were recruiting for a chief academic officer, um, and it turns out that one of those candidates who's an external candidate holds faculty tenure on his or her current uh, campus because he or she has been through the rigors of achieving tenure at an accredited institution elsewhere, um, it, it's not unusual for uh, the recruiting university or system to offer a process by which that administrator could also hold faculty tenure in our system. Similarly, uh, when we promote people internally through competitive selection into our uh, academic administration positions, it's not unusual for that person to retain their faculty tenure when they have been promoted internally within the Montana University system. You, we maybe have a department head in, in a Montana department who is promoted to dean it's not unusual for that person to hold their faculty tenure. And then when they are potentially promoted to associate provost or provost, not unusual for them to retain their faculty tenure. So for some kind of uh, equitability and also competitiveness, this concept applies when there's an external candidate. Now to the language, the, the stricken language, uh, the proposed stricken language that says in accordance with the terms of this policy is just, become sometimes confusing and a little bit ambiguous because then when you look up to the rest of the policy, it, it really doesn't guide us. The rest of the policy says kind of what happens when you hire a brand new faculty member and how do they progress over the years. So this clarity is proposed um, after the commissioner of higher education asked uh, deputy commissioner Brock Tessman, uh, Provost Bob Makwa, Provost John Harbor, to look at this language. And Heather, if we scroll back to the bottom of it, then again, to, to see the language in red, 
scroll down. Um, the, the language that that work group came up with says that essentially when we are hiring people into administrative positions, that if the president, if the commissioner ever wanted to recommend to the board that uh, the individual be awarded faculty tenure, we right. would do so after consultation between the campus administration and the commissioner's office. And then when the commissioner recommends to the board uh, the, the tenure uh, recommendation, then it would be up to the board to act. And the reason we propose that is each campus has slightly different procedures for how these work now when a faculty, when, a, when an administrative person is recommended for tenure. In fact, uh, some campuses have that incorporated into their guidelines. So the bottom line is um, the, the presidents and the commissioner uh, like this language uh, after asking the uh, deputy commissioner for academic affairs and the provost and myself to look at it. We just think this uh, allows for a little more flexibility that more accurately um, allows for the campus procedures to work. So it's an information item for you at this meeting. And if it looks to be on the right track, it probably comes back to you at the next meeting for action. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for that explanation. Um, if, if this is on our action um, agenda item in September, um, it, between now and then, will we be receiving um, in, input from faculty, including faculty senate? We could. We, uh, Mr. Chairman, we could. It could also go on the agenda, the, the summer meeting as well. But if we wanted to um, be more deliberate in that, we could affirmatively ask uh, for comment on it. Uh, wh whatever the, the board and the commissioner want your staff to do, we will do. I forget about the summer meeting. Uh, I, I was just curious about assuring that we receive appropriate amount of input from um, those obviously most concerned about tenure issues, and that's our faculty. Um, additional comments or questions from members of the board about this item? Yes, Regent Sheehy. Um, I take it this has happened. That has happened? I mean, I take it that uh, we've been in this situation in that we're different than other institutions when administrators come in, that our process is not clear as to whether we can grant administrators tenure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Regent Sheehy. Um, it, it's not so much that it's not clear as to whether we can grant the tenure, but what is unclear is by the time the tenure recommendation gets to the board, what process should have actually been followed it before that. And, and right now it, it just says, look, read above. And, and what's really practically happening is each campus has followed kind of its own process and successfully. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments from the board? I don't see any, okay. Kevin, thank you. Thank you. Let us let us now move on to uh, information item B, proposed revision to BOR policy athletic program guidelines. Yes, uh, hi, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I thought before I jumped in my comments on this item, um, and for the record, this is Helen Thigpen, uh, Associate Legal Counsel for the Montana University System. I just wanted to take a quick minute while I'm unmuted and have uh, the opportunity to express my personal gratitude and thanks to Vic Hamill for leading the legal office over the past uh, several years. I feel incredibly lucky to have had the opportunity to work with Viv and I will uh, very much personally miss Viv's presence and guidance. Um, and I just wanted to thank her on behalf of the legal office for everything she's done. And I know I speak for everyone on the legal team and beyond when I say that she will be greatly missed, but I do know how to find her. Um, and I'm sure I will be in touch regularly with, with Ms. Hamill. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I will jump right into this next topic, which is the board's athletic policy, as you mentioned. Um, if you happened to be reviewing board policy, you would see that there's really only one policy that addresses athletic 
programs on the MUS campuses. Uh, that policy, which um, hopefully Heather can um, pull up here, is 1202.1. It was issued in 1999 and has not been revised uh, since that time. Uh, as your staff, over the past couple of years, we have received a few questions about whether board approval is necessary for new athletic programs on the campuses. Um, and to be uh, perfectly honest, we haven't always known what to say, I think, in response to that question. Um, without a doubt, um, athletic programs provide significant benefits uh, to the campuses, to students, and to our communities. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, adding an athletic program can have a significant impact both financially and otherwise on a campus. So uh, in that vein, we are recommending um, a few revisions to bring some clarity around this topic. Uh, the revised language would specifically require board approval of all new intercollegiate athletic programs. Uh, it would also require proposals to include some basic information regarding the proposal, including the projected number of student athletes for the program, as well as the projected revenues and expenditures. Um, it's pretty basic but we think it will allow you to better assess these programs and make a final determination as a board on whether the program is a good fit for the campus and within the system. Um, so not a, a huge change, but just really trying to uh, clarify that the board will have to sign off on a new program uh, from a campus. And Mr. Chair, happy to take any questions that you may have. Ellen, thank you for that explanation. As 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 one regent, um, I myself was surprised that we didn't have this policy previously. That that when we initiate new athletic programs, that it doesn't have to be approved by the board of, of, uh, of regents. I was surprised by that. Um, are there are there comments or questions about this? Yes, Regent Sheehy. So new program, um, I understand this to address entirely new programs, but what about substantial changes to an existing program, such as a transition to pay to play? Um, can you clarify your question a little bit? I'm not sure what you mean by, um, do you mean changes recently from the NCAA with respect to allowing athletes to um, recover some of those costs? Yes. Should our departments go to that um, to that type of payment for athletes? Is that something that should come before the board in revising this policy? Is it something that the regents want to have um, exert authority over? Um, Regent Sheehy, I think that's an excellent question. It's a, certainly a topic that we've been tracking and have um, learned about as uh, the California legislature made that move. And I think the NCAA recently made some adjustments to their, their guidance on this issue. I think it's, it's probably a topic that you will want to consider as a board, um, um, obviously going forward. I think this policy is really trying to get, um, this specific recommendation is really trying to get at the approval of new programs. If it's something that you want to have us bring back to you um, when this is considered at a future meeting since this only is informational, we can certainly look at that and see if there's anything else we want to include in it. But um, I would leave that to your decision and the boards in, in general. I'd ask the board to think about that and whether um, that so substantially changes nature of sports at our institutions that we would want to be involved in the method that uh, we either transfer to that system or adopt it or, um, but because right now it's just going on um, campus to campus based on the athletic director's determination is my understanding. And uh, anyway, I, I, I'm concerned about it. I think it's something that we should think about because it's, it's I, in my mind, it is a substantial alteration to the way that we conduct sports in Montana. Certainly. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Thank you. Um, other, other questions? Other comments? Yeah. Chair Tuss. Uh, yes. So I, I have a question for Helen. Should we um, approve this? I'm just curious about how often we will be applying this board policy, or in other words, how often do we actually have new athletic programs? Is it way more than we would expect or is it a, a couple every couple of years? Uh, 
Chair Lozar, that's also a great question. I would also have to defer to the commissioner for some additional um, thoughts around that. And since my time here, I can think of a couple of different programs that have come up. Um, there was one um, years ago in Billings, if you recall from your, your last um, Regents meeting in Billings, that there was um, the addition, I believe a triathlon, a women's triathlete program down there. And then recently at um, Tech, there was um, some discussion and, and maybe that's already occurred um, with the addition of the cross country at Tech. Um, so it does not, it happens, I would say infrequently, but it's not, um, you know, out of the realm of things that do occur. So it is a question that has come up, but uh, Commissioner Christian, I'd turn it over to you if you have any additional thoughts on that. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Lozar, the, it is infrequent is the answer, the short answer, but there has been, and, and I think part of the reason that sort of this approval process was lost, including to Chair Tessa's comments, I'm surprised by it, but because uh, I was surprised by it as well. But in many cases, like softball was added in Missoula about five years ago, but there was also a facility that was needed and a fee that went with it. And so there was a lot of interaction from the board in approving the use facility, the lease and the fee associated with it. So many of these have come forward uh, with a fee. So there's been conversation. It's not like they happened on their own, but there is no current step to approve or not. Um, yeah, and, and it doesn't require additional fees. It's a reallocation of some resources, but um, we Montana Tech has recently added uh, cross country um, and, and track and, and that's fine, but if there isn't, if, if they're not a, requesting a fee increase with it, then we had no way of really knowing what was happening. And so I think it's important that we have uh, a vehicle to look at these. Um, some of how they're funded and and i guess back to the fee conversation many times how they're paid for whether they're scholarship or not how those funds are allocated does come through either our budget process or uh, the budget committee on one hand or the other so there's been input but there is not a direct approval and i think it was probably needed thank you commissioner not not that i'm Overly competitive, but I wonder if we can add to this that they'll have to win a championship within their first five years. Sure. <laughs> or go into moratorium. <laughs> yeah. Further, further questions? Uh, yeah, Regent Rogers. Thanks. Um, just sort of a random thought. You know, is there any concern that um, timing would be an issue as uh, new programs came up? Do you feel like the spacing of the region's means would be sufficient to ensure that a program could be approved and implemented in a timeline that works for student athletes and programs? Mr. Chair, Regent Rogers, I certainly do. Um, you know, it, it, there's a planning process. Usually there are facilities. Um, recruiting coaches and then ultimately even recruiting students to it. Uh, I, I think the window to add a sport, and it's probably why they're quite infrequent, but the window to add a sport, it, it takes some time, some planning, uh, in most cases, facilities to go along with it. So I, I think we would not be uh, hindering campuses' abilities to move forward by doing this. Thank you. Any comments? I see none. Okay, thank you. Um, let's let's move on now uh, to C uh, Energy Service Company Assessment Update Combined Heat and Power System UM Missoula. Mr. Chair, Ron Muffick here again. Uh, this information item just simply an update to the board that the process that we entered into in December uh, that the board approved with uh, the energy service uh, company, McKinstry, that they're working on the, the project, it's progressing well. Uh, they'll come up with some feasibility information and data to the University of Montana in June of this year. If the guaranteed maximum project cost and guaranteed savings uh, results fall within U of M's parameters, then U of M will return to the Board of Regents uh, in July or September for uh, approval to move forward with the uh, combined heat and power system. 
Right now, it looks like the projected costs are about 18.5 million with annual estimated utility savings of 1.7 million per year. I believe Paul Lasseter, Vice President Lasseter, is uh, on as well, and he can answer any questions, and so can I. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, Chair Tess, members of the board, um, this is um, a really exciting project. Um, when we first embarked um, upon exploring the CHP plant here at UM, we were thinking it might, might cost in the $14 million range and generate savings of 1.1 to 1.2 million. Well, both of those numbers are proving to be um, a bit conservative or aggressive. Um, the cost is a little bit larger than we estimated, but the, uh, the savings has also gone up um, quite a bit as well. Um, we're still exploring the exact type of equipment that could be used um, with the CHP system, um, but evaluation and calculations are proceeding nicely and all indications are, are very positive. This is um, a critically important um, project for the University of Montana <clears throat> from two perspectives. Um, first and foremost, the, the savings that will generate of $1.7 million is substantial and is funded through our already restructured um, debt capital base. So in other words, the, the debt cost is locked in. We've got that. It's about eight and a half million dollars a year for the entire University of Montana system. Um, with that amount being fixed, investing some of the proceeds that we raised in this project will then create cash flow savings that can either be used for reserve funding or to meet specific other needs or re-leveraged for additional capital investment, which is happy to take any questions. Vice President Lasseter, um, when you mentioned the entire U of M system, you're talking about the physical system on the Missoula campus, correct? You're not talking about the other, the other units. No, the the entire affiliation for the University of Montana, the annual debt service is approximately eight point six million dollars, and that is locked in. So, from that perspective. Um, looking at a $1.7 million savings in relation to the entire affiliation is a very substantial savings. Are there, are there comments or questions from members of the board? Okay, I see none. Thank you, Vice President Lasseter. Um, let, us, let us move on then to the next uh, item. Uh, D, uh, 2021 legislative initiative discussion. Commissioner, is this your item? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd make a couple opening comments. Tyler can go through the list. Um, uh, unlike LRBP, the board is not required to prioritize a list in, in, in any kind of time frame uh, to get to the budget office to work through the, the LRBP process. So that... I just want to make a distinction between the, the two different areas here. LRBP, we have to, at this meeting, approve a list, and it is prioritized, and they get entered into the, the budget process in a priority list that is set by you all uh, as the board. The discussion uh, in front of you is just to give you a sense of uh, things that we are talking about. I think to Regent Sheehy's earlier point is, as we think about the, the impacts of COVID, uh, this might be an area where we think about our legislative requests. And we'll continue to talk about these at the September meeting, the November meeting. Ultimately, uh, we will ask that they be worked into the budget, but that's sort of an ongoing negotiation with the governor's office, the governor's budget office. Uh, we wanna give you a flavor of what they are, but they're not necessarily in a priority order as of yet. Um, and there's certainly some flexibility as we move forward into the fall. So we're anxious for input on what's on the list, if it makes sense, what's not on the list, if you have other ideas. Uh, we've almost always carried into our legislative agendas sort of the, the top three priorities, which is present law adjustment, uh, a pay plan, uh, and our long range building. And so they, 
sort of ha have always been uh, on, on the list and usually uh, some of the first things we talk about, but then there's some other items and, and we can spend uh, just a moment giving you a sense of what we're thinking and then uh, as always look for uh, feedback. All right, Mr. Chair, Tyler here, I'll jump in. And I may ask Deputy Commissioner, Dr. Brock Tessman to add some comments around a few of these items um, if need be. So what, we're, what we have uh, for the board is um, essentially a, a continuum of uh, projects that go from our two-year education through research. And inside of that is wrapped in some student assistance. So I, I'd start with the student assistance initiative. Um, you'll remember last legislative session, we received funding for the Montana Access Scholarship. It's a need-based aid program. Uh, we received $2 million of OTO funding um, with the stipulation that we match those funds uh, from our foundations. And um, we are in the process of doing that and awarding those funds. I think we're gonna be able to demonstrate, I know we're gonna be able to demonstrate a highly successful program that would lend itself to requesting ongoing funds uh, to support this program. Uh, inherent to that uh, whole operation is a, a little bit broader um, administrative and operational uh, funding need that we have to um, support the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education in its endeavors to award undergraduate state aid as well as graduate and professional state aid. Um, for almost 30 years, we relied upon uh, help from the staff at uh, Guaranteed Student Loan to help us execute that. And so we have a bare bones skeleton operation here left without GSL. And we're, we're definitely in need of uh, much needed support to continue um, offering these programs through our office. So that that's the, the, the student aid program. And um, I think I'll turn this one over to Deputy Commissioner Brock Tessman uh, to talk about uh, MREADY and CTE two-year programs. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Christian, uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, uh, thanks very much. I'll be uh, really brief here. I, I do wanna just give a quick summary of what we're thinking with uh, MREADY 2.0, so to speak, and then, and then maybe a workforce development initiative. And in my mind, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Everything that we ask uh, the legislature to invest in moving forward, has gotta demonstrate a clear return on investment. And, and these, these two items, I think, uh, certainly would. Uh, MREADY 1.0, you'll remember, is the Montana Research and Economic Development Initiative. It was $15 million. Uh, invested by the legislature into uh, research enterprises uh, across the Montana University system in uh, 2015. And uh, you know these, uh, these funding initiatives created 300 plus jobs in the state of Montana, uh, led to $50 million plus in additional external funding, led to more than a dozen new private uh, businesses being formed. Uh, overall research expenditures before uh, MREADY were around $180 million throughout the system, and now they're at about $233, $235 million, expected to climb further north. So the return on investment has been quite solid. I, I think we all know about the photonics and optics industry in Bozeman, which really got a launch through MREADY. Uh, the University of Montana had a traumatic brain injury initiative. Um, Sunburst Technologies, a, a water uh, quality a, a, a testing mechanism, drone fire, which is a drones used to fight wildfires. Um, all of these things really came out of, of MREADY. And there are projects at our other campuses as well, uh, MSU Billings, MSU Northern, and others. So clear we've got a good return on investment here. And, and I guess the ask could be um, for the legislature to invest in, in something like an MREADY 2.0 that would again uh, identify key areas for economic growth in the state, I think particularly pertinent after COVID-19. And then uh, we would have uh, our campus chief research officer. process so that we could figure out how, how to invest 
to generate the biggest uh, bang for the buck. At the end of the day, this is about Montana solutions to Montana problems. Um, it's also about identifying new opportunities through our research initiatives. So we look forward to offering more details in September or as we get closer to the session. And in the second item, workforce development. I mean, this, this has been on everyone's radar uh, and now even more so. I'll, I'll talk a lot about this during the two-year committee meeting this afternoon, but we really need to think about um, the fact that across the university system, we are rightfully asking our campuses to, to belt tighten, as Regent Nystu mentioned. Um, but especially in the two-year sector, we're asking them to belt tighten at the same time, we're asking them to totally retool and relaunch Montana's economy in the aftermath of COVID-19. And we've got to make sure that we have uh, funding in order to start up, uh, successfully launch the right kinds of programs so that as we invite students whether they're recent high school graduates or whether they're recently unemployed Montanans, as we invite them back to our campuses for training, we're giving them pertinent training, really high quality training, and training that gets them back out into the workforce to serve Montana's businesses and industry. So I know we've been through this list before, but in the past, the legislature has invested one-time funding in infrastructure, machinery, equipment, uh, and I could imagine us developing a proposal for the coming session that, that would uh, cover some of those same items, yet be a bit more targeted given the reality face after COVID-19. I'll stop there and, and certainly happy to answer any questions that folks have now. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, are there questions? Members of the board, comments? I don't see any hands raised. Chair Tess, I think Regent Dombrowski has a question. Oh, yes, please. Uh, pardon me, my uh, Chair, my hand raising was slow. Um, <laughs> Deputy Director Tessman, I, I see the M2.0 and I hear you talk about workforce development and they just seem to have sort of a Venn diagram thinking in my mind, economic development and you know, focusing on taking what we've learned in COVID and focusing out in the future. Would you agree? And if and if so, how might those programs, um, I hate this word, be synergistic to each other? I'm thinking about talking to a legislator and rather than trying to put a black line between the two, thinking about how they're complementary. Thanks, Amy, for including me. <laughs> um, I think a Venn diagram is an appropriate visualization. So a Venn diagram of two circles would have three categories. Uh, the first category, we would put squarely into workforce development. And, and I could imagine that um, this kind of workforce development may not require Montana's uh, research enterprise in order to identify new opportunities or to catalyze new jobs. It would more be a, a direct response to existing needs that current businesses and current industry had in, 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 in spots they needed filled. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the other, the other end of the, the circle, so to speak, you would have um, purely new, uh, uh, new jobs, new um, ideas and needs that emerged out of the MReady grants. Uh, these are things kind of unknown unknowns, right? Things that we can't even really imagine right now, but if we fuel the right research enterprise sectors in the MUS, we could, we could find the next uh, photonics and optics industry in Montana or the next way uh, to improve precision agriculture uh, in parts of the state. So these may be areas where business and industry doesn't even know they have a need yet, but our research enterprise can help grow that need. And then in the middle, the overlap between the two, I, I think this would really be fostering areas that do exist right now, um, but are growing rapidly and could benefit from some of our world-class faculty and some of the innovation that can come from the Montana University system. So data analytics, cybersecurity, I do think photonics and optics is a good example uh, there. So uh, I, I hope that that summarizes the three parts of the Venn diagram. And I think you're, you're spot on. Uh, that middle sector where there's an overlap between existing needs and the sort of emerging needs that our research enterprise can help fuel uh, that that would be the sweet spot, I think. Thank you. Are there other questions? 
Yeah, chair test. It's just in terms of a, uh, in terms of process. Um, I'm curious, Commissioner. In terms of our process, are we kind of looking for sort of a head nod from the Board of Regents in terms of these are some general categories at this juncture, knowing that there's a there's going to be a lot of different things that come up between now and um, you know November fifteenth when the a budget might come out. So is there? Are you looking for thumb, some thumbs up? And if so, I'd love to hear or see thumbs up, thumbs down um, from members of the board. Perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. Is Martha's got a thumb up? <laughs> I mean, just she. Okay, good. Okay. Thumbs down. Any thumbs down? That's a good good question. Yeah, I, I see none. I just wanted to make so one, one question on. Oh, go ahead, Chair. Sure, just wanted to make. You know, I I think, you know, outside of uh, present law adjustment, pay plan, um, LRBP, certainly these three core categories seem to be a bit of an area where we have capacity and there's unique needs. So I, I mean, I my personal perspective is these are really great areas for us to go. And there's a lot of agility that we would have within each of those sort of three buckets. I, I think we've heard a lot over the past couple of years of, as our two years are um, um, continue to grow and expand sort of their offerings and responding to industry. I think maybe we've all heard through Regent Nystuen's uh, committee that the need for additional equipment and additional infrastructure, particularly around the CTE programming uh, at our two years. So I'm excited to see that this is uh, a pretty core component of our uh, potential legislative strategy. So um, I, I'm in full support. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Tuss and uh, or Chair Tuss. And yeah, we'll, we'll continue to work on this list. You know, there are other ideas that are out there, we you had a presentation in March about the a possibility of a rural dental uh, initiative or that may turn to an initiative. Um, so there's things that continue to be in the pipeline too. And as we get more clarity on finance, financial plans and stuff for uh, other items, we'll bring those in front of you as well and, and get some feedback whether we're headed in the right direction or not. And then that ultimately sort of guides where we go into the budget process. Commissioner, also the, the other question I have is, um, you know, knowing that there's some fluidity to this to this list, um, knowing also that we are living in a very fluid time politically and otherwise, um, I'm assuming that we will be communicating our priorities, uh, be it what they may, um, with, you know, knowing that we're going to have a change in administration um, come January, and that there will be uh, appropriate communication to, you know major party nominees for the governor's office, correct? Sorry, muted. Um, Mr. Chair, you're absolutely correct. And even before January, I mean, to be honest with you, we'll start having more in-depth conversations following the primaries in June. Uh, because I think, you know, once the ticket is narrowed a little bit, depending on priorities of the incoming or even potentially incoming administrations will help guide some of these and that'll be information that we can can provide to you all as a board to make some decisions as we consider what items should move forward and uh, what our legislative agenda is. But yeah, there's a, a lot of those conversations will start to happen. Um, Pre-bargaining on pay plans, that sort of stuff is starting to happen and it will be uh, shaped and informed by uh, the slate of candidates because ultimately we will have a, uh, a, a change in the the governor's staff and uh, a change in the legislature as we move forward. Okay, thank you. If it's appropriate, I think it's uh, time to move on. Um, if I don't see any objection to doing that. If we can, if we can hit the next item, information item E or IT priority list. You bet, Mr. Chair. Uh, back. Tyler here again, I'll, I'll kick this off and we'll, we'll step on the accelerator here for these next two items. This is a follow on to request uh, from the March board meeting uh, to talk about how does the MUS prioritize its IT projects. Uh, we have uh, 
John Thunstrom, our MUS IT director uh, online here to quickly walk us through these items and kind of give some context to it. Hello, am I here? John. Good morning. You are. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, as Tyler just said, I am John Thunstrom. I am the MUS IT director. Uh, and again, during our last meeting, the request was made to bring to the board a list of IT priorities from across the system. So I'm here today to give you a, a preliminary report outlining some of the high level projects we have going at both MSU Bozeman and UM Missoula. And some of these will also affect uh, the affiliate campuses as well. Um, I've worked with the CIOs at both of the campuses to compile this information for you today. And I thought we could just start there uh, with a few broad categories so that I can gather your feedback on what we're providing uh, with the idea that this could become a regular report for you all in the future, um, making sure that we're covering items that are most of interest to you uh, from across the system and at a level of detail that of course you're comfortable with. So if we just take a look at the uh, list that we've got here, uh, to start, we've got construction and infrastructure projects. Um, and you can see that this is a combination uh, of new construction as we see with the American Indian Hall and Highlight Residence Hall, um, and then renovations to existing facilities as we see in Romney and Panzer Halls. Now these installations and upgrades provide necessary technology infrastructure to buildings, and then of course all the people that are served by those buildings, be that faculty, staff, students, et cetera. You'll also see things like uh, data center upgrades and improvements located in this section um, with an eye on maintaining the core network and computing functions, so things like servers, uh, as well as risk mitigation in the form of relocations and fire detection and suppression. You can see those listed with uh, things like the Rennie Data Center Fire Suppression and Social Sciences Data Center Relocation Projects. MSU is also in the process of upgrading uh, network and phone connection access points across their campuses, so you'll see that listed there as well. Uh, following construction, we have upgrades and lifecycle refreshes. Uh, these are primarily software centric and mainly cover things like the maintenance and upgrade of Banner and its underlying technologies like Red Hat and Oracle. Uh, you'll also see degree works listed here that needs a major update on both of the campuses. So you'll see that listed as well as efforts to virtualize hardware resources. Um, virtualization, uh, it just allows the sharing of hardware across multiple virtual servers, which provides greater efficiency and flexibility in terms of server management for all of the campus, uh, campus projects that are going on or, or major systems. You'll also see a major website refresh effort at UM. And uh, again, the College of Nursing is implementing new nursing simulators at MSU, and that's located in this section here as well. Uh, on the administrative side, OCHI has two major projects that have affected all of the campuses that I wanted to uh, briefly touch on. And we've talked a bit about the single admissions application over the course of the last couple of board meetings. Um, this is major implications for each campus in terms of both software integration with Banner and various CRM components. And then of course, with communication to prospective students. Um, so huge project uh, that involves a lot of moving parts there. Uh, we've also asked campuses to migrate all of their payroll cycle, cycles to bi-weekly, um, and that will eliminate the many other uh, payroll schedules that are currently in use. And then it, of course, uh, lines that up with the, uh, the payroll schedule that the state uses as well. Now, this requires an enormous effort on both the part of IT and HR staff to make sure that people get paid on time and appropriately and uh, that all the adjustments are made to, to schedules to make that happen. So that's, that's a big lift. Uh, you'll also see at UM and MSU efforts around CRM software for enrollment management. And at UM, the implementation of software from EAB for student success management, and then the implementation of a data hub that will bring together uh, a bunch of disparate sources of information into a central repository that will allow for analytics to take place across uh, software systems on that, on that campus and, and actually across the, that system there. Uh, and finally, we wanted to mention some items around risk management and cybersecurity. So you'll see here that both campuses are currently evaluating their enterprise risk management plans. Now, this work is essentially ongoing and in perpetuity. They, they're doing this work all the time. 
But two items are of particular importance right now, and those are uh, establishing best practices amount around remote working. Um, for example, the use of VPN connections when working off campus uh, for members who are working from home or remotely. And then reviewing data security procedures to ensure that any sensitive information is handled safely both on and off campus for those workers that are working in, in co you know, in co-locations. Uh, additionally, both campuses are either bringing on or upgrading their multi-factor authentication systems uh, for major systems across campus. And this allows for a combination of username and password authentication in conjunction with the use of a text message or email key that, uh, that grants access to vital systems for enhanced security. So um, some major things going on there just to improve uh, security overall. Uh, there are, of course, other efforts around email and phishing that are ongoing as well to, to make sure that those systems are secure and that people are, uh, are doing their best to keep um, systems secure across the campuses. So at this point, I would just say uh, thank you for the opportunity to cover this information with you today. Uh, and I would stand for any questions about any of these projects in particular and would welcome your feedback. Specifically, I I'd like to know, is this the right level of detail for you? Uh, are there other areas that you'd like to have more information on or a particular interest? And um, with that would stand for any of your questions. Thank you, John. Uh, are there questions or comments from members of the board on this item? Yes, Regent Einstein. Thank you. This is a, a very good start to trying to understand our IT priorities as we move forward here. It, could we get a little more texture on these perhaps at the next meetings as to uh, you know, what the cost is going to be, what the fiscal impact, uh, uh, the return on investment for these types of things so that we can, I, you know, I think that there are elements of this list here that John put together that uh, should morph its way over to some of our legislative priorities from the standpoint of being able to say that we can deliver uh, education mm -hmm. in the uh, post-COVID world as well here. I mean, do we have enough infrastructure bandwidth, the, the, the whole, uh, the technology to deliver education more than just in the classrooms on our campuses? And so uh, I, this is a great starting point. Let's get more substance to this if we could, please. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, those are excellent points of feedback and I can absolutely get you more information on uh, both costs and um, you know, affects certainly on distance learning and uh, and our, abil our ability to keep that transition going should we need to in the future as well. And the ability to pay for them as well. Where, <laughs> sure. do, where do the dollars Absolutely. come from? Uh, Thank you, Regent Nystin. Thank you. Further comments? Yeah, Regent Rogers. Thanks, Chair. Um, following on Regent Nystin's thread, um, also, maybe just a little bit of detail about trends that you're seeing, especially as we see remote work coming to be more popular. Um, you know, are we investing in a big phone system that won't be used due to mobile devices? Um, just helping us to understand what trends are happening in the industry and how we're staying ahead of those and not investing in old stuff. Sure, absolutely. Other comments? I don't see any hands raised. John, thank you for your report. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, information item F, we have two lists, our annual facilities project authority update. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Tyler here again. This is really uh, just for your information, this is a board required report. We bring this to you annually um, to provide an ongoing list of our um, authority uh, approvals and assignment at each one of the campuses. As you remember, Mr. Muffick talking about authority uh, projects on each campus, uh, general spending authority and uh, specific individual project authority. This is an ongoing running list uh, for your review. We don't have much uh, analysis or commentary to provide other than that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, any comments on this? I see none. I see none. Um, I believe that takes us to the end of the budget 
committee portion of uh, this morning. I guess it's this afternoon now. Regent Lozar, I think I've blown through our appropriate amount of time and then some. My apologies, but I'm going to turn the meeting back over to you. Uh, thank you, Regent Tuss. Uh, so we'll have about 60 seconds for lunch. <laughs> Regent Sheehy has already started on this. <laughs> no, uh, there was a typo uh, in your in your packet of information on the agenda. So um, we are going to take a, a, a thirty minute lunch. Uh, we are we're just a couple about twenty minutes behind the schedule, and I think we can make make that up um, later this afternoon. Um, so we will be back at 12.55, but I just wanted to make a note that please do not connect or disconnect from the meeting. All your lines will be mute, muted and we will be back at 12.55. Thank you. Okay, for us to mute ourselves, it's really hard to figure out how to get on. What do you mean? Certainly, um, Regents, you all actually have the ability to mute and unmute yourselves. Sometimes there's just a tiny. No, no they're saying they. Oh, they don't. Their side. I no, don't do that. We right have to now. wait for you. Not anymore. I'll do it right now. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> and maybe maybe one audible as well. Uh, it seems to be working. If you guys raise your hand, that the chairs of the committees can see it, rather than electronically. Yeah, I mean, maybe both, but it seems like the chairs can respond quicker if they're raising their hands, because I don't think I don't think they can see the hand raise option. Is that correct, Amy? It's only from that's right. Admin that's admin right. Side. OK, good to know. Regent Miller's raised his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, John. Um, just an FYI, I still can't unmute myself once I've been muted by the host. Okay. So, so if you so, unmute me right oh. now, I can't unmute myself from there. Here so we go. kind of found it. Sorry. You're good. Okay. So he, we want to. Amy, this is working very well. Thank you. Yeah, good job, Amy. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Um, actually, could I trouble you or John to try the the muting and unmuting now with this new setting? Absolutely. Thank you. Looks good. Now I'm not. Hey. <laughs> Come here. I was taking it kind of personally that you had me on mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we've got that worked out. Let's uh, let's dive back in. We're running about a half hour late, but uh, we'll be able to make up. Probably some of our time this afternoon. I hope everyone had a good lunch and a nice little breather. Uh, thank you, uh, Regent Tuss, for uh, a, a very a productive budget and admin and audit committee meeting. I thought that was great. Um, this afternoon, we'll have uh, we'll start off with two-year and community college committee, and then after that, the ARSA committee. So I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Regent Nystoon. Uh, to chair the uh, two-year and community college committee meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Lozar. This afternoon, we can uh, kind of maneuver through this rather quickly. Uh, we've got four items to, to to discuss with the board. The first one is on the two-year mission fulfillment. Uh, we've heard a little bit of, of that this morning, plus a couple of COVID-19 responses from rural uh, remote delivery trades and CTE courses, workforce training and economic development, and then get an update as to where we go from here with as it relates to uh, the Bitterroot Valley Community College District uh, vote. With that, uh, we'll start out with the two-year mission fulfillment. I'd like to throw it over to Deputy Commissioner Tessman uh, and his associates, uh, Jackie Treister and Joe Teal. So take it away, Brock. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, just confirm uh, audio is okay. You can hear me fine? Okay, great. Um, well, this is a little bit of a different setting. Uh, I've taken uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor's spot in uh, the fireside room. Although it may not look like it, I assure everyone we are six feet uh, apart. We're practicing our good social distancing here and 
uh, it, it's unfortunate in some ways that we don't have a chance to get together with our two-year leaders and uh, discuss uh, mission fulfillment and the COVID update the way we normally would. But I still look forward to our discussion over the next hour or so. And Chair Nystuen, with your permission, uh, what I'd like to do is, is to have about the first half an hour or so on the mission fulfillment discussion. Um, uh, Dave Kruger uh, from Montana State University Northern up in Haver should be on the line with me and I'll ask him for uh, some brief commentary in a few minutes. It's always good to have the two-year voice front and center as we talk about two-year mission fulfillment. And so the two-year leaders got together and said, well, this meeting was supposed to physically take place in Haver. Um, why not have the two-year leader from Haver be the one uh, to speak on our behalf this time around? Before I invite Dave to give his comments though, I did want to, to briefly revisit uh, one item that came up this morning, but is really worth uh, even more emphasis. <clears throat> the, the Perkins 5 state plan, uh, which uh, truly did just come through with final, uh, final approval from the Department of Education a couple of days ago. This is going to be um, the lifeblood for CTE throughout Montana uh, on the secondary side, but also the post-secondary side for the next 10 years or, or, or more. And on the post-secondary side, currently we don't have uh, dedicated state funding for career and technical education. We're relying solely on Perkins funding. And this grant was, was more or less do or die for our CTE uh, programs across the state. Jackie Treister, Katie Brook, Dan Corrales, uh, our partners on uh, the secondary side, um, uh, Renee Erlinson, Shannon Boswell, and others, they, they came through in the clutch, and, and this will be tens of millions of dollars coming into the state, and I just wanted uh, to take a moment to thank them, obviously to thank the board uh, for your support and counsel as the plan has been developed, and, and herald this as a, a really terrific moment for the state of Montana and for Montana's economy. The other thing I'd highlight before I hand it over to, to Dean Kruger is that, uh, you know, we, we've lauded the Montana University system and actually institutions across the country for being a bit more agile and a bit more adaptable this spring than perhaps uh, we have been in the past. I, I, would, I would argue that our two-year system and our two-year leaders have been adaptable and agile from day one. And actually that's been really a distinguishing factor for our two year system uh, over, over the decades. And uh, of course that was on display this spring. We had two year campuses move from fully in-person instruction to almost fully remote delivery and then back to in-person instruction for certain trades and CTE courses as conditions warranted. And this allowed for uh, hundreds, actually thousands of students to get to the finish line, achieve graduation and enter the workforce much sooner than they would have otherwise been able to. And you talk about mission fulfillment. We have these five categories of mission fulfillment. None of them say explicitly uh, that the two-year system needs to be able to turn on a dime, but that's what they all allude to. And that's exactly what the two-year system did uh, this spring. So. Major kudos to our two-year leaders, their faculty, their staff, and of course, the students who are flexible as well. And I, I think there's been some really uh, a, a positive change also in terms of our patterns of communication. And I know communication has come up a bit this morning um, and, and we'll always seek to do uh, better every single day. Uh, in terms of communication between this office and our two-year leadership, we have been uh, on a, a one hour or more call every single Wednesday and Friday morning since the beginning of this crisis. And we would ha have, I would say on average, 20 to 30 folks uh, on that call, including essentially our entire ARSA team uh, here at Ochi. And that's really been a way for us to understand more of the needs that our two-year system has. And uh, most importantly, it's been a chance for the two-year leaders to cross-pollinate, so to speak. They've been talking to each other about best practices, how to adapt, and they shared ideas in a way that I think is better than they've ever been able to share ideas. Uh, and, and that's something I'm really, really proud of. Okay, um, as usual, a lot more that I could get into, but I wanna confirm, Amy, is Dave Kruger on the line? He yes. is. Okay. Dave, uh, I know you have maybe seven to 10 minutes of, of comments on 
the two-year response to COVID-19. Why don't you take it away? And then Dean Kruger and I will both stand for questions after he's done. And, and I hope we have some good questions from the board and the two-year committee. Thanks, Dave. Well, thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, uh, Commissioner Christian, Chair, and Regents. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone virtually to MSU Northern and beautiful Northern Montana. It's a beautiful day in paradise up here. Uh, we wish you could uh, join us here, but uh, understand that under the circumstances, uh, we'll operate the best we can. Uh, I wanna speak on behalf of all the two-year uh, campus leaders from across the system when I say that I want to thank all of our faculty, our staff, and especially our students across the system who within a week's notice transitioned from a face-to-face -face format primarily to a platform of primarily remote instruction. Faculty and students embraced this change with decisive flexibility, not without pain, but with decisive flexibility. Across the system under extreme cleaning and distancing protocols, we've adopted various methods of completing hands-on instruction with our students. And I'd like to highlight just some of those specific endeavors. Some uh, programs like uh, welding, for example, operated with limited students in labs until course outcomes could be achieved. Uh, Gallatin College even checked out welders and the students communicated with the instructor virtually while filming themselves. Um, and then they also filmed their final projects. I thought that was quite amazing. Uh, aviation flight instruction at Gallatin was called off immediately when the most restrictive shelter in place orders were existing. But when the governor allowed uh, retail to open up again there, uh, the uh, flight school opened uh, instruction up again. At Missoula College, uh, we uh, had an example of a precision machining faculty and his students that met daily from 11 to 4 p.m. on Zoom for a month while working on their master cam platform. They ran simulations to ensure quality assurance on uh, all their projects. A CDL program at Miles City Community College recrafted instruction to a blended format using both online and in-person strategies through a very collaborative approach in which everyone's voice was valued and they all had input, but under tremendous precaution as they move forward. In the end, all their students were able to complete their CDL licensure. And at Great Falls, both virtual simulation and case studies were used in many of their programs. Students utilized the simulation as a substitute for clinical time in their EMT and paramedic programs, while um, uh, e-learning courses were used in their industrial technology program. And then um, some of the other programs I just wanted to highlight as, as we move through um, at Northern in particular, uh, we had a, within a week, our faculty moved uh, their hands-on curriculum to WebEx lectures with small socially distanced labs, and finally to fully remote uh, lecture and labs. This occurred with lots of painstaking experimentation uh, and lots of help from our Office of Teaching and Learning Excellence, who worked uh, with each faculty uh, to address a multitude of issues from uh, synchronous uh, lectures that were offered through a multitude of platforms to labs that were recorded and delivered on YouTube and other social media sources. Some of our labs, including um, our plumbing, pipe fitting, and welding delivered asynchronous lectures with lab objectives that were covered by placing students in work-based situations with the aid of our fantastic industry partners. Uh, our faculty scrambled uh, to find many industry-based uh, curriculum training resources. Uh, examples like Electude was used in our auto diesel electrical courses and lunchbox sessions was used in our hydraulics courses. And then I... Uh, it would behooved if I didn't talk about some of our companies like Modern Machinery, Caterpillar, and John Deere, who eagerly uh, and willingly shared training resources with our faculty. Many lessons regarding what worked and didn't work uh, came out in a very short period of time. Every department met with our chancellor and, and other leadership at least twice within a four-week period to address challenges and to allow changes to be made on the fly. Now, I don't want to make uh, it sound like we have it all figured out. None of us, as we talked in our two-year 
uh, meetings said we had it all figured out. We do have such a long way to go. Everyone at all institutions um, put an extreme amount of energy into a six to seven week period of time. Did we experience some success? Yes. Did we uncover a lot of problems? Uh, yes. Is learning from home the best option? Uh, we found no. Do students prefer to meet with us face to face? Yes. A quality learning environment we found needs to be free from distractions like family members in the same household that were competing for a computer time, uh, in many cases, lack of quality bandwidth, or in many cases, no internet service at all. Uh, students using smart form, smartphones had to uh, complete a class, and we know that's a challenge. Uh, many of them had to drive a, a distance to see if they could even get connectivity and then complete the, uh, the work on their smartphones. Uh, students, we found having appropriate hardware and software, software and uh, technical support when needed continued to be a challenge. So how will we handle these system-wide technological and connectivity issues in the future? And that's something I think that we really need to address. Uh, other things, can we provide faculty, for instance, with uh, resources uh, to broadcast instruction in a synchronous platform? Uh, will we need classes and labs set up uh, in more studio style environments in order to deliver quality instruction at a distance? Uh, one of our, our, uh, our deans with an auto program uh, down at Highlands was talking about doing exactly that, setting up their labs like a studio so they can deliver more of their instruction this, uh, this coming fall. So those are all things that we need to have to uh, look at in the future. Also, will our labs be sufficient enough for appropriate distancing? And then we're all worried about sanitation of shared equipment and tools and how are we gonna deal with that in the future? So these are just a few of the uh, issues that we need to work on over the next few months in order to prepare for the fall. Even then, I'm not sure we're gonna have everything uh, completely ready or have everything answered, but we'll have a good start. On the other hand, I do wanna share with you some things that we've discovered, some strategies that might assist us as we approach fall 2020. We have discovered many new online resources that might assist faculty to deliver information to students in advance so more time can be spent with smaller groups in lab settings. Um, referred to as a flipped class model, uh, if learned and implemented appropriately, this could be of benefit to all our students. Uh, this crisis has also caused us to focus more specifically on course outcomes rather than just seat time and has opened our eyes to other methods of delivery to meet these outcomes that we wouldn't have attempted because uh, we were never forced out of the box before. Some of these new methods we will incorporate into our specific programs this fall. Others we found just didn't work. And so we move forward in search of more strategies that will. Moving into a healthy, productive fall semester is going to take us a tremendous uh, amount of investment and time and new resources and an unwavering commitment by everyone in our institutions uh, to make this happen. But I do believe in conversations with all my colleagues as well that we're up for this challenge. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to share this with you. And uh, Brock, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Dean Kruger, uh, Dave, thanks very much uh, for your commentary there. Uh, and you covered a, a whole lot of ground. Uh, perhaps most notably, you did talk about um, your reality and the reality that the two-year system faces, which is that uh, the spring was filled with successes, but it was also filled with um, some challenges. Uh, I think uh, there is a lot of work to be done between now and the fall semester. I would point out Dean Kruger, uh, Dean Gray from Gallatin College, uh, now Dean Bauman from Helena College, uh, and uh, Leanne Frost, Director Frost from Great Falls College, are four of the 12 members on the Healthy Fall 2020 Task Force. And so we did that uh, explicitly to uh, insert a very strong two-year voice uh, as, as that task force works with the rest of the system and, and our other partners to develop fall guidelines. I think out of this spring will come a number of what I am deeming durable innovations 
So these are things that are not just one-off solutions that were meant to be a Band-Aid or a short-term fix, but these are things that could actually be quite beneficial to the entire two-year system for years ahead, coronavirus or not. And Dave, you mentioned uh, blended learning, uh, the use of technology. I'm very intrigued by virtual reality and augmented reality options uh, in the trades and CTE. Uh, you mentioned uh, the need to um, make sure that our two-year system is adequately resourced at a time when we're about to put it under even greater stress. Uh, there are a number of innovations that will come out of these efforts. I think the two-year mission has been something of a, a focal point for us over the last year or so. Along the way, I've heard from a number of regents, uh, Chair Lozar, uh, I've heard from you specifically, that we need to do a better job of telling the story of our two-year system and the two-year mission. We have these five mission areas uh, related to transfer education, career and college readiness, CTE, workforce and economic development, and community engagement. I think those can be boiled down into even simpler terms. Uh, the two-year system is uh, first and foremost a launch pad for Montanans, both of traditional age and adult learners. The two-year system is a strong partner to Montana business and industry as it retools and redesigns in order to meet needs uh, that the Montana's economy has. And I, I think importantly, our two-year system is a hub. It's a hub for its local communities, uh, not just in terms of workforce and economic development, but uh, continuing education, adult education, and community events. So if we think a little bit more simply in terms of launch pad, partner, and hub, uh, I think we can move forward and tell the story of the two-year mission uh, this fall and, and beyond. Dave, you'll stay on, I hope, for uh, the rest of this agenda item. I would stand along with Dean Kruger for Really, any questions that you have about the COVID response this spring, our plans headed into the fall, or anything else related to the two-year system in Montana? Thank you, Dean. Dave, Dave Kruger. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Um, as we know, oftentimes when there's a downturn in the economy, there actually gets to be a spike up in enrollment uh, at the two-year community college, at least community colleges. Uh, by virtue of people saying, hmm, I'm, maybe my job's not there, I've got to retool, I need to re-educate, and so forth. So I'm optimistic that the two-year campuses can really pave the way for uh, for rebuilding our economy here as we move forward. Perhaps in a different format, different venue, different delivery approach, and so forth. So there, therefore, again, I think we we as regents need to put as many, as much wind in your sails as we can. We want to salute you for having your regular conversations, working collaboratively together. You got a very good story to tell to uh, the state and to the legislature as we move forward here. So keep talking in your communities about what we can do. So with that, let's open it up for uh, any questions from the members of the regents or the campuses. Any comments, questions? Okay. Um, I don't see any at this. Chair Nice to tonight. Go ahead, Chair uh, Regent, Regent Tuss has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Regent Tuss. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Chair Nice to And uh, Dave, I love your energy, and I'm glad you're a fellow Highliner. <laughs> um, and so, uh, a, a simple question, and I really apologize if, if you covered this and I didn't catch it, but but going forward, knowing the lessons that we've learned collectively over the last couple of months, particularly with regard to not just two-year education, but very specifically the students that are in two-year education, um, what recommendations might you have for this board or the system in general um, to, to, to make what we do in the two-year arena a little bit easier, a little bit more attainable, um, knowing that, that things are not linear, knowing that, that there's going to be bumps along the road? Um, are there one or two recommendations that are just solid that you could put on our plate to say, if you do this, things will be better with your education in our state? That's a, uh, a great, uh, great question, uh, Regent Tess. Um, as we move forward, and I know my conversation was with students in, in particular, um, they're looking for um, they're looking for a system. They're looking for a schedule that they can follow and trust. And, and I know uh, we be, we're trying to be as flexible as we possibly can, but sometimes when we're flexible, 
uh, we move at a pace and we don't include our students in some of those uh, uh, decisions as we move forward. And students need to have that. They need to have, uh, as they move forward, to know that this is what it's going to look like. Um, I talked a little bit about connectivity. Um, yes, we're going to be doing and looking at more flipped opportunities. Uh, maybe as we look at our schedule for the fall, front ending more face to face and lab opportunities for these students. But they're going to, uh, in many cases, not planning on doing as much online. There's going to be some online opportunities that they're going to have to embrace as they move forward. And as I mentioned, there are some great great things online that we can use to help these students who typically like these hands-on. But uh, we're going to have to invest, um, and I know work with our folks in ITS and others, to invest in uh, equipment, uh, computers, and technology and connectivity that's going to make that transition as smooth as possible for these students as we move forward. No matter, no matter uh, how we package this, it's going to look different. It's not going to be the same face-to-face -face that we have had in the past. So that investment of time and in training, we're going to have to spend time. Our faculty uh, have been doing, in many cases, a lot of the same hands-on training for many years the same way. And now we're asking to take a, a different approach, looking at it a little bit differently, uh, investing our time in our on our faculty to provide appropriate training, that's gonna to have to happen and that's gonna have to happen pretty quick uh, over the summer. So bringing the faculty back in, providing that training, making sure that we have a consistent system for students to follow so they know what to expect and make sure that everything works appropriately and is laid out appropriately. That's gonna be some major, uh, a major commitment that we're all gonna to have to back up to. Uh, Regent Tuss, Chair and I student and, and Dean Kruger, I, I would um, echo the thoughts that Dave just shared. I think a couple of other um, approaches that I want you to know are, are underway. Uh, and then I guess one comment, the approaches. Uh, I, I do think there is great promise in, in blended learning and using uh, technology to supplement in-person instruction. And you could imagine, Dave, up your way, the, the diesel tech program. You know, what if we could find a way to map some of those engines and have students spend, you know, 60, 80, 100 hours in an augmented reality setting with a, a laptop or a, a tablet where they can work around the engine and then how much more familiar they'd be when they actually get that face-to-face time. It may also lessen the burden on faculty, um, allow them to work in smaller groups, but over a shorter, a shorter duration. A second initiative, and, and um, uh, Kirk Lacey, whom uh, you all know, has been, has been working with Joe Teal in our office and others on more concrete technology that supports shared academic programming. This, none of this will happen you know, without, without a, a, a collaboration and support from the two-year institutions themselves. But if we want to talk about access for our students, uh, one way we can improve access to a wide variety of programs is by allowing students in one corner of the state through their most local institution to access academic programs that may be based in another corner of the state but still made available through remote delivery, um, perhaps with some weekend intensives or more intensive face-to-face -face instruction um, uh, as a supplement. And that, oddly enough, requires a lot of blood and guts on the IT side and, and Joe and Kirk are, are working in that direction. The last item, the comment, it is about money and and we it's tricky right now there's no getting around the budget constraints that our institutions face um, but the bottom line is that we are asking our two-year system to ramp up and and serve montana perhaps even more extensively than it has in the past precisely at a time that we're facing these very significant uh budget restrictions and so uh, for our institutions of course that means that we'll pursue uh, state level, federal funding, however we can. For our students, you could imagine a recently unemployed um, a professional deciding to return to one of our two-year campuses for a, a, a credential or a certificate that will give them uh, skills, uh, proficiencies that are in very high demand. How are they gonna pay for that? And our two-year system is almost unbeatable in terms of the value that it offers, but we still need to be hyper-conscious of the extreme financial challenges that many of our students will, will face moving forward. And Regent Nystuen, you mentioned that two-year systems generally see an uptick in enrollment during times of economic downturn. 
Well, that was true last time around, and it was made possible by things like the Trade Adjustment Act and other subsidies that made college more affordable for those students looking to return to learn. Um, we don't know how things are gonna, gonna turn out this time around. And I certainly don't want to set the expectation that our two-year campuses will just magically see uh, a 30% increase in enrollment and be able to serve those students effectively and that those students will be able to afford the education they're getting. It is gonna take a lot of hard work and a lot of resources. And if you ask what the regions can do to put wind in our sails, that will certainly be part of the conversation is to help us as we look to secure resources so that these campuses can ramp up when we need them to. Any additional comments, questions? <clears throat> Chair uh, Nystuen. Chair Lozar, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Nystuen. Um, <clears throat> so just thinking about our earlier conversation about uh, legislative priorities, um, <clears throat> one of the kind of the three primary sort of newer areas was that workforce development that we talked about, you know, additional equipment, some infrastructure, machinery. Um, certainly knowing that we've heard for an, a, a couple of years, a number of years that, that there is additional needs in, in, the, in that area. So I'm happy that we're moving that forward in terms of the timeline though that we're under and, um, you know, if, if we are able to move something through and get some support from which, whomever the governor may be in the legislature and to get some resources, it will still be, have a, quite a leg to get resources onto campuses, particularly for CT programming and equipment. What, what can we be thinking about sort of in the short term based on maybe the lowest of hanging fruit as it relates to getting whatever technology that is needed the two years um, particularly for CTE programming this fall that will assist the colleges in recruiting those folks who have lost, uh, lost their jobs. We've, we know that there's an unprecedented number of, uh, of Montana citizens uh, that have filed for unemployment. And so they're really clamoring for what, you know, what their next step is. And as Re Regent Nystuen, Chair Nystuen mentioned, are looking to retool and re-educate. So I I'm really curious about are there pockets of resources? Is there areas that we can invest in a way that um, will help us find that balance between what our needs are now, what our needs are after the legislative session and attracting uh, Montana citizens to, into the two-year uh, community college structure? Uh, Chair Lozar, uh, uh, Chair Nystuen, uh, if, Dean Kruger is willing. I, I, I think it's always uh, good to get a first crack at things from uh, someone on the ground level. And I have my own thoughts. I, I have Joe Teal next to me. Perhaps we can tag team. But Dave, what do you, what would you want to share as, as someone who has perspective on this from a campus level? Well, one of the things uh, with limited resources that we always have, uh, marketing is a really tough, uh, uh, is a tough nut to crack. And and it takes resources to market and, and get the message out to uh, the folks that are out there. I'm not sure um, that all these uh, folks that need to be retooled and maybe have been laid off from jobs realize the opportunities that are out there uh, in all of our two-year schools. So uh, if, if we can get that message out, working closer with the industry, I, I work very closely up here at Northern with uh, advisory boards and industry from all over the state. And it tends to be a communication problem sometimes uh, for they for them to know what we have and how, how we can work better together in workforce development. Uh, they're very anxious to work with us, uh, but uh, we have to be able to, uh, to spend the time. We need the, the mar those marketing dollars uh, to let the folks in the in the state of Montana know that we're up and we're open for business, and that we have uh, various programs that uh, that are new and exciting, high tech, and that uh, that are moving forward here in Montana. So that marketing piece is going to be one thing that we really have to look at. We're going to have to be really nimble and quick too to work with industry. Industry is coming out with the, some of the newest technologies, the newest uh, opportunities um, to. Uh, uh, to uh, reach out to some of their folks, they're doing it online as well. They're doing it through simulations. So as I've been looking at information over just the last month, more and more 
uh, online blended type opportunities are popping up from companies across the United States. I think we need to work with them in, in some form. Uh, they, they charge a fee for us to use these things. And uh, we're going to need the dollars to look at the software and hardware that might be of assistance to all of our programs in, in order to uh, work with those industry partners to retrain. I see Chair <clears throat> Regent Sheehy has a question. Uh, Martha. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Dave, uh, with respect to the marketing piece, just wanted to bring you into the loop of this morning, which uh, Superintendent Elsie Cursive Safety Arnson uh, reached out to us about forming an even greater partnership than we already have. And I think that with respect to marketing the two years, we need to jump all over that. The way into that market is through the high school seniors. I think with this distance learning, we've lost that um, pipeline to some extent because the counselors are no longer in the in the high schools. And uh, the counselors that I know, one of them is my niece, uh, has told me that they're so busy just getting kids to graduation that, that the whole piece of getting them into college, that's just kind of off. So anyway, I plant that bug with the two year because I think we need the pipeline from the high schools, especially in the next year. And oh, Dave, I really miss being in Haver. I always love that trip. <laughs> Thank you. Well, in the spirit of uh, more agenda items and being a little bit behind schedule, uh, let's call this a success. More work to do, Brock and team. Um, and let's pivot over to COVID-19 response. Uh, remote delivery um, and career and technical education uh, courses. So with that, I'd like to throw it over to Deputy Commissioner Tessman and Jackie Treister. Uh, uh, Chair Nystuen, members of the board, I, I am not Jackie Treister, uh, but uh, as per our discussion during the two-year committee call um, last week, I think we did realize it was important for the full board to hear uh, these substantive presentations. I'm going to go ahead and run through uh, Jackie's presentation and then a presentation that Jackie and Joe put together jointly. What I'll do is actually be exceptionally brief on this. Um, we can run through the slides and then we can uh, invite questions afterwards if there are follow-up questions or perhaps Chair Nice and Chair Lozar, you'll want to, to move on at that point in time. Um, CTE remote delivery, we've been already uh, addressing this uh, indirectly throughout the day. This was something that was present throughout the Montana University system before the coronavirus. Certainly, we uh, saw an acceleration in remote delivery of career and technical education this spring. Uh, Heather, if you can click on that Z space link, I'm not sure if it's live or not, but I, I just want to give the regents an idea um, not of the Z space landing page, uh, but uh, of some specific tutorials. Heather, you can take that off. It's not a big deal. I can, I can, I guess, visualize this for our regions. The quality of training that is available now through uh, third party entities, uh, the quality of training that we could conceivably develop on our own it is quite high. This is no longer about reading a textbook uh, online and simply imagining what it might be like to circle around an engine or figure out um, how a complex system works. We can, in some ways, do more in a virtual setting than we can in person. You can take uh, massively complex pieces of machinery and actually have them blown apart so you can see all of the component elements. You can have it rotated around. You can select different entities and, and sort of see what function they perform. So I just want to alert the board and, and let them know that there are more and more opportunities uh, available here. There could be a, a need for the board, the, the system and the state to invest in um, launching some of these, uh, these instructional capabilities within the Montana University system, even if it's contracting out with a third party for the time being. I think we also uh, certainly want to encourage that seamless partnership between the K through 12 sector and uh, the Montana University system. We have so many great examples of the partnership. Uh, one, two, free, for example, dual enrollment, 7,500 students or so every year taking college credit courses, many of which take, are, are taking those courses 
and through their high schools. And many of those courses, in fact, are CTE uh, courses. It would be really wonderful if we chose a particular platform or technology to have that be a platform that starts at the K through 12 level and then a platform that students can pick up on the post-secondary level so they don't have to jump across uh, into a different way of, of learning in their, their, their trade or their, um, their field. Of course, marketing and awareness, as Dean Kruger mentioned, is, is exceptionally important. Um, you know, we have made good efforts, uh, I, I think. Uh, this spring, for example, uh, Angela McLean, who's here in the room with me, and her team uh, worked with the, the K through 12 uh, districts and schools in order to launch a virtual college signing day. Uh, many of those uh, in, uh, students are pursuing education through our two-year system. We always make the rounds uh, with counselors and teacher, teachers in terms of raising awareness about the two-year system. And the Career and College Readiness Portal, uh, Reach Higher Montana, certainly puts two-year education front and center. So we will receive your charge, Regent Xi, and we will double down on our uh, efforts at outreach during these challenging times, but it has certainly been something on our, on our radar. And uh, of course, you need faculty, okay? Uh, we are always challenged to bring in the best CTE and trades faculty. Oftentimes they have other professional opportunities. In many cases, those professional opportunities in the private sector may pay a bit more than a teaching position. Um, but we also just see some demographic shifts. A lot of our best teachers and instructors at the college level are at an age where they're contemplating uh, retirement and we're gonna to have to be hyper-conscious about our talent pipeline and our training pipeline and make sure that teachers are uh, up to speed on some of these new technologies as well. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide. This is just an example of the resources that are out there for uh, teachers and we can certainly come back to it if uh, the board likes uh, after I'm done with my comments. I also won't spend a lot of time on the next slide, Heather, but Jackie Treister uh, did a great job of soliciting uh, uh, specific stories from campuses about how they responded this spring. And, and it might be worth just sharing a couple more examples. And uh, none of these in themselves, I, I think, cover all the bases, but they just give you a sense of what's going on. We have faculty at Missoula College who, on their own time, are, are dismantling and rebuilding computers in order to promote technology access for students who wouldn't have access to computers otherwise. Obviously, really time intensive, but just a, a tremendous gesture. And if we talk about equity, and addressing the resource needs that students have. This shows how it's not just about dollars being poured into the system. We also have faculty doing great things without any additional dollars at their disposal. At, uh, at MSU Northern, up Dave's way, um, you know, a great example of the adaptability of the system and this switch between remote learning and in-person instruction. I do think that this blended approach is gonna be something we stick with moving forward. And I think we'll be better off, uh, better off for it. It actually allows us to have more of that kind of intimate uh, small group instruction that I think the Montana University system is known for, especially compared to our, our big partners in Texas and California and, and whatnot. And then uh, last, uh, again, returning to the, the, the advantages of technology, Great Falls College, Dean Wolf, uh, Leanne Frost, uh, uh, many others up there making really, really good use of uh, simulations and virtual uh, technologies for a substitute for clinical hours. Obviously, a lot of students were unable to complete their clinical rotations uh, in a timely way because of a lack of, of opportunity uh, this spring. Uh, throughout, again, you'll hear uh, my comments and those during the ARSA committee and, and really throughout the summer and fall uh, uh, relate to equity. And Heather, this is the last slide. The, the, move, the move this spring to remote delivery was, was needed. There was no way around it. Um, it, quite honestly, exacerbated some of the pre-existing equity gaps that existed uh, in Montana and that exist throughout the country. There is just no way around um, some, some tough facts. We have students who don't have uh, hardware at home. Uh, if they do have hardware, there may be other folks at home who need to use that as a part of their uh, ability to make an income for the family. We have students who don't have connectivity, even if they do have the hardware. In other words, they would bring their laptop into campus and use connectivity there, but they don't have it uh, at home. 
We have students, of course, that don't have great learning environments at home for one reason or another. And uh, it's not lost on any of you that this spring has been tremendously challenging in terms of mental health and, and the background foundational challenges that students have as they try to learn. So equity uh, is, is a challenge throughout. I, I think when it comes to CTE, uh, it's certainly a, a, a challenge for us. And if we decide to keep many elements of this remote delivery system moving forward, we're gonna have to address some of these equity gaps. I'll wrap up for that, thank you. Thank you, Chair Tessman, uh, or, or Chair Te <laughs> Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Um, how about questions or comments from the board? Anybody from the campuses? Oh, Regent Sheehy. With respect to equity, Brock, um, are there any scholarship funds available for some of those hardware and connectivity issues? Uh, Can our foundations help? Yeah, uh, Regent Sheehy, uh, Regent Eistun, um, you know, I think uh, we certainly have a, a lot of pre-existing uh, scholarships, some, some of which may address hardware needs in particular. I know in the CT area, uh, the Horatio Alger scholarships uh, can be quite useful uh, for, for students, private, privately funded, um, and certainly financial aid and other scholarships that some of our lower income students may, may receive can be used uh, for some of, of the hardware that they need as well. I think um, it's quite possible that some of the federal funds um, that we may receive can be directly uh, used in order to uh, equip students with the hardware that, that they need to succeed. Um, that is, I, I would stress, part of the equation. In, in my opinion, the other half, the connectivity piece, it is also a big challenge. And um, it gets real complicated. Think about faculty who want to do the best job designing this really high quality, really intricate online experience for their students. Think about some of those virtual reality experiences I shared earlier. Guess what? Those things require not only a, a top class, pretty new piece of hardware, they require really high caliber connectivity in order to work correctly. And so there are all these different pieces of the puzzle that have to fit together in the right way. And there are supports out there. Uh, we'll continue to pursue uh, additional resources for our students. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, let's move over to the third item on our agenda this afternoon, the COVID response workforce training and economic uh, recovery. Brock, I think uh, you okay. and Matthew will talk about that. Uh, oh. Chair Nystuen, nice, thanks very much. Uh, and again, uh, perhaps even more quickly, I'll, I'll move through this because we've talked about this quite a bit um, already. I, I do think we're moving from one phase of our workforce development efforts into a brand new phase. And I think uh, six months ago, perhaps during the start of the two-year commission meetings and some of our earlier board meetings, I would have told you that our job as a two-year system is to pump out more graduates in all areas, in all disciplines, faster. And I think that we still have a duty, of course, to train more graduates uh, across the system, but it really requires a more targeted approach moving forward. We are in a different economy now than we were three months ago, four months ago, six months ago. And, and you have some of the stats in front of you. Um, the numbers are staggering. In, in Montana. And although we've seen a slight slowdown in the number of unemployment filings recently, you know, we do know that uh, a cloud of economic uncertainty hangs over much of Montana's uh, workforce. And we also know this won't be a flash in the pan. These challenges will be persistent. Like everyone else, I hope for a V-shaped recovery and I hope we get a lot of bounce back um, quite quickly, but th there will be some longer term dislocation moving forward. Next slide, Heather. The question for the Montana University system in, in our two-year sector in particular, again, uh, <clears throat> what can we do in order to really change the trajectory for students? I mentioned the, the two-year system as a, uh, as a launch pad for students. It is a launch pad. There are really important studies coming out that show uh, some of the short-term losses or losses that appear short-term for students who can't get a great job coming out of uh, college, not a high-paying high job at least, they have long-term, um, uh, I guess, losses in terms of wage and income of potential. Some of that work was based on the 2008-2009 recession, and now we see that same generation suffering a, a second 
once in a lifetime economic hit. So our, our, our task is big and we need to make sure that we make the two year system as uh, affordable and accessible to students as possible. The second strategy here um, is, is really about making sure that that targeted approach highlights credentials that are worth something for students. All right, and, and, and Joe Teal, Kirk Lacey, others are thinking about actually a, a big shift philosophically almost in how we build new credentialing and certificate and degree programs, really around skills rather than a named degree program. And, and we've uh, been in pretty deep conversations with some uh, outside vendors that can do two types of skills analyses. One is an analysis of all the way down to the local level, skills that are needed by business and industry in different uh, localities throughout Montana. And then they can actually map out our existing curricula and show which skills are being built in our different programming areas. And we can figure out, first of all, what programming areas might lead into what professional areas. And that means that we don't have to just say, gosh, you need an accounting degree in order to become an accountant. We might realize that certain degree paths are actually quite suitable for professional trajectories that don't have the same name or not obvious connections. But most notably, it helps us revamp our curriculum to make sure we're training students in the right way and giving them the right skills that they need. And then I mentioned the, the, last, um, the last item here is developing a new platform for, for collaborative academic programming so that we can actually start to offer some of these high demand programs in multiple locations at multiple institutions using, in many cases, the same faculty uh, and, and sharing coursework so that there are more opportunities for more students around the state. Thank you. Questions or comments? <clears throat> Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes, go ahead. If, if I could, I'm a little late to the party here, but to, to the earlier question regarding uh, the equity gap and some of that, I, I just wanna make mention that part of the CARES Act did allocate the $13 million for students. And while there's guidelines around that, there is you know language in there that says those with the most need, the most impacted should receive priority in that funding. And there is a pretty wide variety of things that students can request funding for, from uh, renting or, or owning technology to a, a whole myriad of different things. And so, you know, I, I, we've asked campuses to disseminate that message uh, as best they can to students, but it's it's worth mentioning here that there are avenues to help close close some of those equity gaps. And there is language in the original CARES Act that suggests uh, those with the greatest need should come first in line. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Any other questions or comments before we go to the final item? Seeing no hands raised, uh, let's go to Bitterroot Valley Community College District Ballot Initiative update. Uh, one of the first things I want to do is remind the, the regions that I think there was formally addressed as Valley County, but it's actually the Bitterroot. And so uh, I think just for the uh, sake of making sure we're all on the same page here, it's the Bitterroot Valley Community College. And I believe this afternoon, um, soon to be Chief Legal Counsel, Helen Thickpen, will uh, give us an update. Is that correct, Helen? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Yep, thank you. Great, sorry about that. I just want to clarify that um, I'm just acting uh, Chief Legal once Viv retires, so uh, not quite yet, but... Soon to be. <laughs> the, uh, good afternoon again. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, over our lunch break, I received some helpful feedback that I may have looked a bit sad in my earlier presentation this morning. So I'm going to do everything I can to try to liven it up a bit this afternoon um, and uh, hopefully keep everyone awake and energized. I'm fully caffeinated now and I'm feeling good. So I will jump right into this. Um, as I'm sure uh, many of you already know, there was a recent vote um, in River Valley County um, to establish a new community college district. Uh, today, I'll run through the results of the election and then outline the next steps for the board in this process. At the end, I'll also uh, provide a few general thoughts 
around this topic generally to perhaps clarify a few points and give you some additional context as you consider this topic over the next couple of months. So to get right to it, um, in early May, uh, voters in Ravalli County did approve the establishment of the Bitterroot Valley uh, Community College District. Around 58% of the voters favored the new district. Um, the voters also elected seven individuals to serve as local trustees. Those individuals are known right now as trustees elect because they wouldn't be seated until after approval uh, by the legislature if that were to occur. However, um, while the voters approved the establishment of the new district, they did not approve the local mill levy to support it. Uh, the levy failed with 54% against and 46% in favor. That levy uh, would have raised about $650,000 towards um, the district. So as you all may recall from the discussion in March, there are really four phases in the process for establishing a new community college district uh, in Montana. The first two phases have now happened. That was the submission of a citizen-led petition and then an election on the question to establish the district and the selection of trustees. The third phase, which I'll get to a little bit more in a minute, involves you as members of the Board of Regents, and it really requires the board to do two things. One, notify the legislature of the results of the election, and then two, provide a recommendation to the legislature on whether the new district should be established. The fourth phase is consideration by the legislature. Um, ultimately, uh, as um, the statutes provide, and there's an attorney general's opinion on this, uh, the authority to approve any new community college uh, rests solely with the legislature. So since the vote passed to create the district, the process is now formally in your hands as members of the board. And then over the next couple of months, we will be collecting information so that you can make an informed decision as a board on whether you want to recommend the establishment of the new community college in the Bitterroot. So we will be reaching out to the group behind the initiative for uh, pretty specific and detailed information about the proposal and how the community college would operate and function if it's approved. And to give you an idea, uh, um, of what we will be looking for, our request will be really broken down into three broad areas. Uh, number one, budget and finances, two, academic programming, and three, infrastructure, both physical and IT related. And the first category, budget and finances, is really gonna be critical to your assessment as a board. Uh, we will be asking for a uh, proposed operating budget uh, for revenue and expenses. That includes the projected number of students, uh, tuition amounts, expenditures for personal services, and the projected number of faculty and staff. Currently, um, as the board, you do review and approve annual operating budgets for community colleges, as well as the biennial budgets that are submitted uh, to the governor and the legislature. The second category of information that we'll be looking for uh, relates to questions around the academic mission of the college, its academic programming strategy, as well as um, its students and academic support strategy. So in this vein, we will be asking for information on accreditation plans, the plan for academic and other student support services, and the overall academic programming strategy that we'll, uh, would be pursued. This also includes information about the plan for technology and any um, student learning management systems like Blackboard or Moodle, those sorts of things. And again, um, the board approves academic programming for community colleges currently. And then finally, we will be asking for information on the plans and funding sources for the college's facilities, its equipment, as well as its information technology. Um, Bitterroot College is currently located in a facility in Hamilton that UM leases from the Hamilton School District. If the proposal moves forward, um, there are certainly many questions regarding the location of the community college, as well as questions related to equipment and information technology that would be that would um, need to be addressed going forward. And really, everything from facilities to equipment to IT would need to be addressed and secured by the district. In terms of uh, for your assessment, our plan right now is to request and provide this information to you before. The September meeting. 
we would then bring it back to you with any additional information that's needed or that you request for a final review and vote at your meeting in November. Uh, statutorily, the board's recommendation must be made before the next legislative session that convenes in January. So just a few questions and thoughts around this. Um, I just wanna um, address a few topics and, and hopefully you can marinate on it over the next couple of months and then reach out to us if you have um, additional questions. I think first and foremost, I, I do wanna be really clear that the establishment of a new community college in the Bitterroot uh, really shouldn't be thought of as a conversion of one type of college to another. What we're talking about here is really the creation of an entirely new college that is, is governed, um, as you know, Chair Nystuen, um, by different um, laws and policies. A, a new community college in the Bitterroot does not necessarily result in the replacement or elimination of UM's existing programs or Bitterroot College. Um, the conversation around those programs is separate and would have to in, uh, obviously include and be led by President Bodner. Um, second, the creation of a community college um, in the Bitterroot is not going to result in full independence from the MUS. Um, the Constitution does require the Board of Regents to supervise and coordinate with community colleges. Um, and then while there is a more shared governance model between the regents and local trustees, the regents do approve budgets and academic offerings of community colleges. And I think that's an important point um, to keep in mind in this conversation. And then finally, um, I, I do think there are some significant questions about funding in light of the vote uh, against the local mill levy. Local levies, um, as the board knows, are a significant source of funding for community colleges and the lack of support on that front may be something the board will want to um, consider um, as, it, as it looks at this issue going forward. So those are just some of the many issues that we're looking at now as your staff. Um, you know, we're going to be bringing forward this information and um, looking at any questions that you may have and really help you make an informed decision to the legislature next fall. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any specific questions you may have about the process or um, um, take any feedback that you have regarding um, questions. Thank you. Thank you for a great, uh, great report. I thought that was well done, Helen. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the uh, Board of Regents? Questions or comments? Uh, Regent Tuss. Thank you, Regent Nystuen. Um, Helen, that was a good a good presentation. And in, in my mind, it seems like the, the finances of this would be imminently easier if the, if the second part of um, what was on the ballot had passed with um, the voters of Valley County. So, and I apologize if I'm making you reiterate this again, but so, so what is the obligation of this board or the MUS in general financially um, given where we are, that, that the authorization passed, but the funding did not pass. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Tuss, that's a good question. Um, you know, again, this really gets back to how you want to look at this question going forward and, and how you want to inform that conversation. Um, your obligation right now as a board, it, it sounds simple because it's really, you know, provide the results of the election to the legislature and provide a recommendation, but there are a lot of pieces that um, go along with that. And of course, funding is one of those, one of those pieces. Um, it's my understanding that um, the, the local group um, that is uh, working on this initiative is uh, perhaps planning to bring back another uh, vote on the election um, on the levy in November. So we may have some more additional, some additional information about that in the future, but it is just, uh, one piece of the funding pie, um, and I, I think it makes up about um, a quarter of the budget, essentially, for um, the uh, any community college in Montana. So I hope that helps clarify that a little bit. But, but to be clear, there's no financial obligation or uh, organizational obligation on behalf of this board or the MUS to recommend funding to the legislature or to find funding for this college, correct? 
Um, Mr. Chair, um, uh, Regent Tess, not at this moment, no. And if, if, if um, Deputy Commissioner Trevor is on the line, he may be able to provide a little more um, context to that. But no, not at not at this point. Um, it doesn't have that does not have to be included as part of your recommendation, but something you would certainly want to consider. I see Regent Dombrowski has her hands uh, raised. Joyce? I do. Uh, thank you, Chair Nystuen. Um, the, I, Helen, this may be for you specifically, although maybe for other regions. I just don't know what the process has been in the past, very similar to starting something like this. I would offer that living where I do, there is um, uh, a fairly strong sense in, in that particular area of the world that there is a huge need for this college that I can't, I can't really quite get my head around. So I was looking for what, what might be talking points or how, how does one sort of listen without uh, casting judgment and, and trying to um, sort of understand where that is. And it keeps coming back to me that perhaps when other community colleges were started, there was, there was some process that, and, and maybe it's just to educate me so that I'm, uh, I, that I'm in a more confident position as this really gets a very, very public face in Western Montana. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that, um, Regent Dombrowski. We will certainly get you as, as this information. Um, we're really going to be diving into this over the next um, month, uh, two months. And so we'll collect that history for you. Um, there is a long history to this the specific proposal, but I think it is worth looking into, um, you know, gathering that information about the other districts as well and sort of, you know, when they were created and, and, and how they performed. Um, but we will certainly get that to you so you can and, and be an informed consumer of this uh, information. Thank you. One of the requests I guess that I would have is that it, we get this in phases and as information becomes uh, credible and available to get it to the regents and not just wait until we have one big package that we all have to digest and not have ample time for our discussion. I think that the board um, has, has significant responsibilities here to have uh, an informed decision for the legislature uh, and uh, an outreach to the community, to the University of Montana, uh, and, and so on. We have so many constituents and so many stakeholders involved in this. This can't be, okay, here's a package. What are we gonna do with it? I think I think we need time uh, to uh, to digest it. So, with that, Mr. Commissioner um, and Team Helen, thank you for for considering this. By the way, uh, Mr. Commissioner, what did, what did I believe you said one time that the Board of Regent, excuse me, the Commissioner's Office funded the cost for this election? Any idea, approximately? Not that it's germane to this today, but I'm curious how how big of a price tag did that come? With? We, we, Mr. Chair, uh, we did fund it. Um, Helen, do you know the numbers of twelve thousand dollars? I do, Mr. Chair. Um, we did receive the bill for that. It was twelve. It's around twelve thousand um, dollars, and that is a, a statutory obligation um, that is required of the board. So we uh, we didn't have much discretion or um, decision making in that in that process. <laughs> but we did get the bill. <laughs> I understand, and uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, Regent uh, Rogers, three. Thank you, Chair. And if they have another election to try to pass the levy in the fall, would we be funding that one as well? That's a great question. Uh, we will look at that. I, I think the statutes anticipated potentially um, one uh, election. So that's certainly something that we'll need to look at and, and think about going forward. Mr. Chair, um, we have talked about it a little bit, and I, I agree with Helen completely, but um, in terms of ongoing, the, the statute really does talk about the establishment of the district. But for example, as, as uh, Chair Nystuen would know, when, when Flathead Valley Community College runs uh, a mill levy for either infrastructure or funding, that isn't something that we're required to fund. Uh, that happens at the local level. So once the establishment, it, it's probably our position that um, future mill levy initiatives would be the responsibility of the district. And that, I think there's precedence along those lines as well. But we'll, we'll look at that more thoroughly. Regent Sheehy. Uh, 
uh, Bob, process question. First of all, I agree with you that this is a big responsibility and on a short time leash. Um, would it be appropriate for your committee to determine what information is needed for the board and to do the original vetting and then come back to us? Uh, it seems like a, a you already have the expertise in this area and, and you might have a better idea of what information is needed and then processing it for dissemination. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I think that's a recommendation that uh, we could work jointly with you and uh, and uh, and Helen and uh, your staff with. It's a good idea. I'm sure that the other members of the two-year committee, would we be in consensus, we'd be willing to uh, have further conversations about this? And get a business plan put together in essence? There. I'm trying to look are we getting getting some head nods uh, uh absolutely yeah. chair nice we, we can do that thank you um very good well we'll stand by with that chair, 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 yes chair, chair nice and just uh maybe a comment and a question um a comment i do i i do like that idea if if this is something um the two-year committee is willing to dig a little bit deeper on uh, for the board um, and kind of be a point of context specifically on the, the sort of progress made. Uh, I think your point about, um, you know, being given a, a package that we have to decide on relatively quickly is, uh, gives me just a little bit of concern. So if your committee is willing to, to, to take that on, I think that would be really helpful in partnership with Deputy Commissioner Dr. Tessman and, uh, and Helen um, in terms of that package that you're talking about, uh, Chair Nystuen, I, I, I know there is a group in the Bitterroot Valley who has been working on this particular project. And specifically, if it's my, I think I understand correctly, there's two full-time staff currently at, at the college. So my question is around sort of the, what capacity they have to go through the three-part uh, sort of data gathering that Helen mentioned around sort of the academic programming budget and financing and infrastructure and IT and what level of sort of coordination um, either OCHI or University of Montana or what, what type of support we may be able to provide. So when we do get the package of information, it's of the highest quality. So I don't know if that's something that you can answer Helen or or Brock or or or, or Commissioner, but I, I do, you know, I think for us to make a this really important decision, we need to have the most uh, quality of information. Mr. Chair, if I if I could just I, I Helen mentioned this, but I think it's just an important distinction to kind of get our heads around that that is a new district. So it, you know, really I think those uh, people that work for the University of Montana in the Bitterroot College programs currently have a day job and, and you know, I think they've got to sort of grapple with what is in the best interest of the University uh, of Montana too as they try to make those decisions. So, um, you know, uh, they, they don't currently work for the new district and so we'll have to kind of figure out what the right balance is there. Um, what the conflicts are there, if there are any, and I'm not suggesting there are, but uh, there's some there's some pieces to work through. That's why I think it's also important to hear from that steering committee and uh, the members of the steering committee and ultimately the trustee elects as to what their proposal is going forward. Did I see uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman have your hand raised? Chair Nice June. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and really just wanted to address that point raised by Commissioner Christian. And, and I do think uh, our our team here, our staff, will be happy to work with the two-year committee. And, and really, I think the guidelines that um, Helen laid out uh, should serve, in my opinion, as a, as a decent framework or starting point, at least. And then and then um, there are folks in the better route, I think, the steering committee and, and some others that may be able to really put the meat on the bones of that framework. And of course, on our end, we can we can work with them and, and work with you um, and the two-year committee to make sure that as the package comes together, it comes together in, in the form that you would you would like. But uh, it, in my opinion, I think the the folks best positioned to put together that analysis 
um, would probably be the folks in the veteran who've been connected to that community for some time. And we may play a more of a supporting role and kind of a, a, a role of, of building out the framework. And, and I think Helen addressed that today. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Any final comments or questions from the board? If not, uh, this concludes the work of the two-year education and community college committee. We'll throw it back to Chair Lozart. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Nystu. And um, we'll, we'll transition right away. Uh, if, if Regent Sheehy is, is ready, um, we'll transition to the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee. Uh, Chair Sheehy. All right, we have a fairly full agenda, so we'll get right to it. But first I'd like to say that I reject the characterization of Helen as sad. I think she is <laughs> uh, calm and serene, which is just what you want in a board attorney. So moving to action item A, request for approval to revise BOR policy 504.4. And I think Dr. Tessman is going to talk about this. Brock? Chair uh, Sheehy, thank you very much. Um, uh, Fairly brief item here, but an important one. Um, many of you are familiar with the Western Undergraduate Exchange Program um, through uh, uh, WICHE, and this is a program that allows undergraduates in the Western region to study uh, in Montana uh, at about, well, at 150% of resident uh, tuition. And uh, it is an exchange, so Montana students can study in other uh, WUI states and also enjoy the same benefit. This item actually extends that undergraduate exchange program uh, to a Western regional graduate program. So in other words, this would allow selected graduate programs to employ the same strategy of offering 150% of the resident students tuition to non-resident students from the Western region who wanted to come and study uh, uh, in Montana. Um, there was considerable work done uh, on the information technology uh, side of things by John Bundstrom to make sure that students who participate in this program are coded correctly and resident, uh, sorry, and tuition is charged correctly to those students. I believe that's been ironed out uh, in close collaboration with campuses. We're all good on, on that front. And I believe that the WUI program has been a successful tool for campuses to use. They've used it differently, but it's been successful. And I would expect that this graduate equivalent of the WUI tool would also be something that's effectively used by campuses. Uh, Regents, fairly uh, straightforward language changes, but a big impact. Any questions for Brock? This is our final reading on this. Commissioner Christian, do you have any input on this, given your uh, experience in this field? Uh, Madam Chair, no, ma'am. I think this is uh, the, the right the right adjustments. We need to know. Thank you. Uh, no questions. We'll move on to item B, mission statement review. This is UM Western. Uh, Provost Deb Hadeen, I'll allow you to take some time to get your microphone running while I say that we are going to miss you, Deb. I had so much fun working with you over the past couple of years and, and they're going to miss you at Western, but good luck in your next job. Chair Sheehy, members of the board, during the summer of 2019, Montana Western Strategic Planning Steering Committee was established to assist with the Strategic Plan 2020 to 2027 process. The steering committee worked in collaboration with the campus and community stakeholders to gather feedback through town hall meetings and campus surveys. The University of Montana Western's proposed mission statement maintains its core purpose of experiential education. We have strengthened our mission by addressing the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities Accreditation Standard focused on promoting student success through student learning and achievement. Our proposed revised mission statement, as a leader and innovator in experiential education, the University of Montana Western educates undergraduate students through immersive practices in their field of study, strives for continuous improvement, and achieves evidence-supported student learning and achievement outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Any questions, comments? Can't see you all at once, so this is gonna take me a minute. 
I see no questions or comments. All right, we'll move on to the next item. Deb, thank you very much. Next action item, these are our level two proposals. Um, final stage of this process for the uh, things that are on this level two action items. We're going to start with Montana State University Bozeman, which is seeking to establish a Master of Science in Innovation and Management. Chair Sheehy, I believe that we have um, each of our provosts uh, on oh. the call today. We have uh, Provost Bob Makwa, uh, Provost John Harbour, and I think we'll have Provost Steve Gammon to present the Montana Tech uh, items. Provost Makwa, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me okay? We can. All right, fantastic. Thank you, thank you Chair Sheehy and Regents. My name is Bob Makwa, I'm the Provost of Montana State University. With this proposal in front of you today, Montana State requests authorization to establish a Master of Science of Innovation and Management. This will be a 30 credit non-thesis master's program designed as a fifth year program for our science, technology, engineering, and mathematics students. The goal of the program is to provide these early stage professionals with a set of skills that will enable them to be more effective leaders, innovators, communicators, and team members in their respective careers. The program uses a highly experiential learning approach and the entrepreneur process as vehicles to help students learn the critical business and leadership skills that are necessary to successfully launch a new company or lead a team within a larger enterprise. So these are the kind of, of skill sets that employers have been asking for. You've heard of the, the T-shaped individual well, we hear again and again from employers that our students have very strong uh, technical skills and um, in, in, in a dis strong discipline background, uh, but what, what they need to be successful as, as mid-level and, and senior managers is, is a greater emphasis on, on, on some of the other skills, communication, uh, multidisciplinary approaches, professionalism, and so on. And this was also further supported by an NSF study. And so this program is developed to, to address those, those specific skills that will help our students uh, go out into the workforce and, and be more successful. So that that's concludes my, my, my brief outline. I'm happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, and just a reminder for those of you who aren't on the ARSA committee, we have looked at these once before uh, on ARSA on May 11th. Any questions regarding the Master of Science in Innovation and Management, members of the board? Members of the public or the communities? Not the public, campus communities. All right, seeing none. Next is MSU, establish a standalone PhD in mechanical engineering. Bob, will you address this as well? I will, thank you, Chair Sheehy. With this, with this request, Montana State University is requesting uh, authorization to proceed with a PhD in mechanical engineering. And as you see in the title, it is being reestablished. So back in 1996, Montana State combined uh, separate standalone PhD programs in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, and computer science. In 2002, we broke free our option in computer science and developed a standalone PhD. And then in 2017, we did the same thing with our electrical PhD program. Last year in 2019, we separated our chemical, our PhD in chemical engineering. So with this request, we're asking to do the same thing with, with a PhD in mechanical engineering. This is being driven by requests from our students. As you can imagine, uh, for, for, for the remainder of their career, they would need to explain that yes, they have a PhD in engineering, uh, but their focus was in mechanical engineering. And this, this change establishes their, their degree as a standalone rather than an option, but a standalone PhD in mechanical engineering. This, this by chance is, is one of our strongest PhD programs. We will have close to 25 students in the program. Uh, the students go on to, to uh, 
very rewarding careers in both industry and in, a, in the academy. Um, we have uh, areas that we, we address and inc include um, many different disciplines in, in research and development, such as fuel cells, renewables, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, biomedical and biomechanics, uh, magnet, magnetic resonance, fluid systems, computational fluid dynamics, snow and ice mechanics, and so on. We, we examined our, where our graduates go from this program as, and recognizing that that was graduates with the option of mechanical engineering. And a, about 50% of them stay in Montana and they go to work in, in a variety of industries, uh, some in the Gallatin Valley, but, but also uh, there, there are, uh, we have students at Residine in Butte, um, Eccentric, well, that's in, that's in, in, in Bozeman, uh, ZAF Energy Systems, in, in Kalispell, and we have some that are teaching in, in our current program at Montana State University. So that concludes my, my overview. Happy to address any questions. Thank you, Provost. Uh, this, I was surprised that we didn't offer this as well. It was a surprise to me. Any questions from regents or comments regarding this program? Gonna go through my list a couple times, wave, no? All right, so seeing none, any campus comments or Ochi comments? Hearing none, thank you so much, Provost Makwa. We'll thank move you. on. We have the University of Montana, Missoula, um, establish options in software engineering, data science, algorithm design in the BS computer science and offer blended delivery. Okay, that was a mouthful. I see we have Dr. Harbour here with us today. It's good to see you, though I'm disappointed that you're leaving. I'm happy for you. Go ahead and tell us about this program. Uh, thank you, Cheshi. Um, based on discussions with employers and national trends in areas of student interest, our CS department is proposing restructuring the current curriculum to create three options in their existing computer science BS degree program as well as to increase the flexibility of the program by allowing for blended delivery. The options, software engineering, data science, and algorithm design are closely aligned to specific skill sets employers look for in computer science graduates. They provide students with a clear path to acquire these skills and to articulate them to prospective employers on their transcript. The algorithm design option will largely mimic the current degree with a few modernizations, and the other two options respond to changes in the marketplace for computer science majors. The new design is also more flexible and modular, was developed with input from the department's external advisory board, and will provide non-majors interested in computational skills with additional opportunities, including certificates and a well-articulated minor in CS. The computer science BS degree program will maintain its current articulation with two-year colleges lower division offerings, in order to facilitate transfer, but would require students to select from one of the three options for their upper division coursework. The proposed changes were presented to a network of Montana computer science programs, including two-year and four-year programs, and met with their approval. These new options in our degree program will provide a better trained workforce for Montana and create new opportunities for our students using our existing faculty and resources. We project that we will be able to recruit additional undergraduate students with these options. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Regents, any questions or comments regarding this program? Going up a level here? No. Campuses or Ochi? Provost, will you be talking about the next item? I will indeed. Okay, we're looking to establish a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at UM. A much shorter title because they are writers. Uh, the University of Montana has a long-standing national reputation for the outstanding quality of its creative writing programs since the 1960s and 70s when the poet Richard Hugo taught at UM. In recent years, our MFA in creative writing has been designated a program of national distinction by the university and graduates of the undergraduate creative writing option have won national awards and fellowships. At the undergraduate level, UM currently offers a BA in English with a creative writing option. This proposal leverages the courses and experiences in this option 
to create a new Bachelor of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. Now, compared to a BA degree, the BFA provides students with more focus on the study and practice of writing and writing workshops, along with a strong foundation in literature. It includes a strong emphasis on developing skills in poetry, fiction, and nonfiction writing, a capstone course that requires an extended manuscript or portfolio, and courses in revision and editorial work. These are skills and experiences that are of particular interest to employers, and we expect that we will be able to recruit additional undergraduate students interested in the BFA in creative writing. This will be the first program of its kind in Montana. It's a creative packaging of existing courses to provide new options for students with no resources required. I would add that early in the spring semester, we completed hiring two exceptional new faculty in creative writing as part of an established plan to ensure the continued strength of this program as retirements of senior faculty occur. Thank you, John. Uh, I agree, this builds on an existing program that has a great deal of recognition and value. Regents, any comments? Seeing none, campuses are Ochi. Brock, was that a hand wave or a no? Okay. <laughs> Next up, Provost Harbor, establish uh, a Bachelor of Arts in World Languages and Cultures and offer blended delivery. And, and I'll add on the last one, as I was doing my due diligence, I discovered that Richard Hugo's first job was as a technical writer for Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> so Bachelor of Arts in World Languages and Cultures. So UM, like many universities with strong language programs, has language specific majors that require a high number of sequential credits in the target language. While this works well for students who enter knowing that they want this particular major, if students don't begin their language study in the first year, it's often impossible for them to complete a language specific major in four years. In addition, we have students who are interested more generally in language and culture or in multiple languages. The proposed BA in World Languages and Cultures is intended to provide a degree pathway encompassing both language and cultural studies that would be more flexible than the traditional single language pathway. This degree will serve students who begin studying languages and cultures later in their academic careers and want to complete a major which emphasizes a combination of languages and cultures, including transfer students. It'll also work well for students interested in comparative approaches to language and culture studies. This major also emphasizes the importance of global and transnational cultural awareness and the ability to understand today's challenges from a variety of cultural perspectives. In today's globally connected world, it is nearly impossible to work in most areas of business, industry, and government without team members who have solid intercultural communication skills and knowledge as well as abilities in other languages. As recruiters know, Language majors are attractive on the job market, not just because of their second or third language, but because of the intercultural skills that go along with having learned multiple languages. This is a creative packaging of existing courses to provide new options for students and no new resources, new resources are required. This degree will supplement existing language and culture specific options and build on our newly established World Competences Certificate as part of our stackable credential strategy. We expect that we'll be able to recruit additional undergraduate students with this new BA. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Uh, Regents, any questions, comments? Chair, Chair Sheehy. Yes. Uh, it's Regent Lozar, just a, kind of a clarifying question for Provost Harbor. Um, this doesn't replace single language degree pro programs or single pathway programs, correct? No, it does not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Casey. Regents, any other questions or comments? OG or campuses? All right, uh, Provost Harbor, thank you for your service to the University of Montana and to the system generally. We really have appreciated your willingness to dig in and do hard jobs. Thank you for that. Thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure and honor working with you all and in particular with President Bodner and his team. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, next up on our agenda is the Montana Technological University. Technological University. <laughs> 
uh, established a statistics option in the Bachelor of Science in Mathematical Sciences. And today we have, it looks like, Steve Gammon. Yeah, that would be me. Um, I'd just like to add before we start, uh, thanks to John Harbour as well. Um, since I started as provost, he's been a really great resource um, and a big help to me, and I will miss him <laughs> over in Missoula. Um, yes, so establish the statistics option. This is really phase two of our program prioritization process. Um, during phase one, we had a department of three faculty with a department head, which were all statistics. And during that process, we looked at that and said, this is not an efficient use of resources. Uh, these faculty need to be in with the mathematics faculty, the synergies there, hiring, other things. And so this is simply the second part, which is, okay, uh, Montana Tech, uh, statistics is a very important part of our curriculum, but rather than have it as a standalone department, uh, it will be an option in the mathematics department. So. Thank you. Any questions regarding the statistics option? Sorry, I'm having trouble seeing all of you. Okay, seeing none. Campuses Orochi, any comments about this statistics program? Okay. Next up, Montana Tech would like to rename the Department of Business and Information Technology to the Department of Business. It looks like there are two renamings on your agenda. Steve, go ahead and tell us about the first one. Okay, yeah, historically, I guess going way back, it was called the business department. And at some point along the way, somebody thought that coming up with a unique name, business and information technology would somehow distinguish the department. But consultants that we've had on campus and other folks have indicated that that really is not a, a good idea. When you have a standard business curriculum, the department should be called business. Um, that's what students are looking for when they're looking to attend college. And so uh, following the guidance of the consultants and others, we are just would like to call it the business department rather than informa uh, business information technology. Very straightforward explanation. Regents, any comments, questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none from the Regents, Nobody jumping in from the campuses. We'll move on. The last item on this part of the agenda is rename the Liberal Studies Department to the Department of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. So this one, um, this degree, one of the ways you can build this degree as a student is it's an interdisciplinary degree. You can choose two minors. So for example, you can do a minor in business and a minor in biology and get this degree. Well, recognizing that fact, um, the degree was actually renamed the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences degree. Um, and now we're just doing phase two of that, which is let's align the name of the department with the name of the BA degree or BS degree. And so that's really what this is all about is just let's name the department to match the degree. And it matches the actual, it des better describes what students are doing as they um, attain this degree. Questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, that is the end of our action agenda for this committee. And we'll move on to information. We have, uh, did I? Oh, yes, go ahead. I don't. <laughs> My Go apologies. Ahead. Uh, just we do have one um, request to plan item that is an action item. Uh, okay. Item D. Oh yes. Okay, I see it now. Let's move on to <laughs> action item D: request a plan proposal. Bev Hartline. Sure, she. I believe we have Bev uh, joining us, and and I just wanted to take a moment to highlight that this is our first request a plan to come in front of the board um, as part of our new academic program planning approval and review process. The level two items that you just um, uh, heard about and will vote on later today, of course, represent the end of a very long planning process. Um, you all are, are very familiar with that. We will now see those level twos uh, taper off quite significantly and they'll be replaced by these uh, request a plan proposals. 
The request to plan allows the board to engage uh, meaningfully in the program planning process at an earlier point um, to offer feedback that can be used by campuses perhaps to adjust uh, proposals before faculty and administrators and, and communities put uh, months and in some cases years of effort into developing um, a full proposal. And the request to plans also incorporate a, a couple of new bits of information, one being from uh, our office, labor market information that indicates uh, our assessment of external demand for the program that's being proposed. Uh, we will also shift the burden of identifying possible overlap between the proposed program and other programs away from the campuses and now kind of towards our office. I think that that's a, a helpful uh, shift. We're very excited uh, to have our first request to plan uh, come from Montana Tech and uh, have it be uh, in the area of engineering geology. So uh, pardon me for making that intervention there, but I did want to frame um, this new item since it does represent a meaningful change in the way that we will approve or you will approve academic programming in the system. Thank you, Brock. It is a meaningful change and it explains my um, confusion because we used to do these in a different way. So let's move on to this uh, request to plan. You can note as you go through this, the difference in the format and the information provided and how much earlier that we're providing it now. Is Bev on? Yes. Oh, good. I, I You're you on my upper. Thank you. Go ahead and start. So Chair Xi, members of the committee and board, first, I want to join the many others who are congratulating John, Deb, and Viv on their next steps in their lives and careers. That's all very exciting. And I have valued working with them and will definitely miss them going forward. But to turn to the task at hand, we you have before you a request to plan a seventh option in Montana Tech's popular master of science degree in geoscience. This new option would be in engineering geology. This MS and the new option are very strongly grounded in Montana Tech's STEM special focus based on our heritage programs in natural resources that have been so important to employment and economic development in Montana for over a century. Plus the request lines well with the needs of the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology, which is housed on our campus. There are in the state of Montana currently no degree programs or options or concentrations in engineering geology at any level, yet this specialty is in demand by students and employers in transportation, construction, environmental consulting, remediation and restoration planning and implementation by government agencies and the natural resources industry. Both MSU and UM have expressed support and recognize how this option would fill an educational gap in a field important to Montana. Just looking overall at our geoscience MS, it supports employment and advancement in a very broad span of career paths and economic sectors. We admit students with a range of undergraduate and employment backgrounds, including those with a science bachelor's, such as geology, chemistry, or environmental science, or an engineering background, such as geological engineering, civil engineering, and others. Our successful geoscience MS currently has six options they are in geology, geochemistry, hydrogeology, geological engineering, geophysical engineering, and hydrogeological engineering. There is considerable overlap in the curriculum and coursework across these options. The proposed new option essentially marries the geology and geological engineering options with no new courses, no new faculty, no new library or laboratory resources needed, and therefore essentially no additional costs. A big difference between science and engineering bachelor's degrees is that the latter are accredited by ABET. Every undergraduate engineering curriculum requires its majors to obtain very strong foundations in physics and mathematics and in engineering basics, such as statics, mechanics, and circuits where they apply the science principles to solve real engineering problems. At Montana Tech, a graduate student interested in an engineering option or degree who does not already have an engineering bachelor's must complete the equivalent science, mathematics, and engineering foundation courses that are typically taken by our freshman and sophomore engineering majors if he or she wishes to complete that option or degree. 
Those undergraduate courses total somewhere between a semester and a year, depending on the exact background of the student. And um, with this engineering geology um, option, students with a science background could complete the engineering geology option without so much delay that they would otherwise incur. With respect to career paths, moreover, about three quarters of states, not including Montana, have professional registration and licensure for geolo geologists or engineering geologists, which would be accessible to students completing this proposed option. The table on labor market outlook provided by OCHI, and we do thank Joe for putting that together, uh, shows the outlook for geoscientists rising quickly in Montana. The graduates in this proposed option would also could also protect progress into other environmental occupations that are projected to be growing by about a 10% rate over the next decade. The proposed new option in engineering geology would fill a gap in the extensive graduate level degree offerings across the MUS in earth science and engineering fields. And it would provide a pathway to a valuable graduate credential for science graduates of all the MUS four-year schools, as well as those from outside the state. It responds both to student interest and demand and to employer and occupational needs in, be, in Montana and beyond. Um, I welcome your questions along with any planning guidance you would offer for the requested new geoscience option in engineering geology. Thank you. Uh, could we page down um, so that viewers can see the various parts of the new plan proposal. Maybe just stay on this for a little bit and then page a little bit more while we're talking. Um, this is a new process. So I, I do want to uh, open it up for any discussion of the proposal itself or the, or the process. Regent City questions about this uh, request to plan. Regent Miller. Um, this is a process question, but I just wanted to double check that after we vote on um, this intent to plan that we won't see it as regents again, um, that this is kind of our, our first and last say on, on this program. Brock, go ahead. Uh, uh, Chair Sheehy, Regent Miller. Um, well, uh, partly true. Uh, this will be the board's opportunity to take action on the item. Uh, if you choose to uh, approve this request to plan, Montana Tech would work in concert with uh, our office here to develop the full, um, what we call now a level two proposal. Uh, that would include all of the budgetary, the fiscal form, the curricular form, the detailed information you're used to seeing along with our level two proposals. That would come back in front of the board as an information item at that, at that point in time. So you will see it again. Of course, um, uh, Joe and myself, We'll stay in touch with the board if things come up that seem to be um, a bit of a redirection or if there's any sort of meaningful evolution of the proposal from what you vote on uh, with the request to plan. And again, the, the goal behind this is really just to give the board an opportunity to, to weigh in um, earlier in the process and to focus more on um, I guess the vision that accompanies these proposals rather than getting as bogged down in say whether a program has 11.5 FTE or 12.5 FTE attached to it, uh, that level of, of detail. Uh, Chair Shee, I'll, I'll, I'll note that this, this proposal is a little bit of, um, uh, is, is unique in the sense that it'll be the, the, the request to plan that comes in without uh, being preceded by what we're calling an academic priorities and planning statement. This summer, we'll ask every campus to put down on paper for you all a statement about their academic strategy moving forward. And what that'll do is it'll mention some specific requests to plan that you might see over the coming year. It'll lay out the academic strategy um, that the campus hopes to pursue. And so as future request to plans come in front of you, you'll be able to place each one of them within some context. They won't sort of appear in a vacuum. And we feel like that'll be a meaningful and positive shift in the way that you assess uh, and, and vote on these items. I agree, Brock. And I think over time, it'll give each of us a better overall view of what programs are available and how they fit into each campus and the MUS generally. Regents, any other questions? Casey? Sure, sure. Yeah, Chair Shee, you just uh, continue along the, the process path here. Uh, Brock, you mentioned um, 
we, we take a vote on this request to plan. You guys work through that with the campus. It comes in front of the board as an information item. Do we take action? Do we follow that similar path to move it from information to taking action? And if so, I guess maybe there's, I just have a little bit of concern just in terms of uh, mm -hmm. you know, one, one of the primary reasons we, we started looking at sort of updating and adapting our process to, was, was to make it a little speedier. So I just wasn't sure sort of what the next step is after we get, the, get it as an information item. Do we wait then for another meeting to, to take formal action or once we have it as information and there's no... I think I created this confusion, Casey. This is an action item today. Yeah, uh, Chair Lozar, uh, Chair Sheehy, um, yeah, th this will be the last time it comes in front of the board as an action item. So, in fact, we will not have to slow down again and have okay. it presented as an information item and then another action item. We will present a summary of programs that have conclu concluded the planning process and that will be ready to launch. Um, that's the next time you'll see items like this. So it will substantially accelerate the pace of approval and launch. Okay, excellent. And then just uh, one um, comment and question. Uh, the comment being, I, I think Joe, it sounds like, put together the labor market outlook with occupational demand projections. Um, just a comment that, that this is awesome. I think this is exactly you know what we we've, we've been asking over the years. So this is a this is a great add on, formal add on to the process. So thumbs up on that. Uh, as it relates to maybe a question for Dr. Hartline, um, you you mentioned the demand and the interest. Have you had have you had a chance to maybe survey current students of maybe around the number that might be interested in pursuing this particular option? Um, so I, informally, yes, uh, that would typically be more a part of the level two um, okay. request in detail. But uh, we, I think we, we have a student right now enrolled who is really enthusiastic about that option and um, is, a, is close to finished. And we have, uh, I think, two students coming in and the new class of uh, students who are entering who could well be interested in this option. They don't really choose the option so much um, and you know, or they, they choose the new option sometimes when they're entering, but sometimes they get into it after they have more coursework experience and meet with faculty and see what research projects they're interested in. So I think I'm, I'm guessing that at any particular time, we, we might have five or, or so students in this option. And that program has had an enrollment of between 20 and 40 students, um, depending on a lot of variables. Thank, Thank you, you, doctor. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Uh, Dr. Harlan, I just want to ask you, did you find this process meaningful, helpful, easy, hard? What's your, you're our first, you're a guinea pig. What do you think? So, so first, I, um, I very much value getting input from the regions in terms of directions you might have as we go forward to do the planning. I haven't gotten much direction from you. So, um, I think from the standpoint of the campus, um, that is the most val valuable element to get your input early on. Um, the, with respect to filling out this, um, this request to plan form, it wasn't hard at all. It was pretty straightforward. Um, I've also done a little bit of the, um, the OSTAR net um, checking out of the job opportunities and in fact for a degree like this you know you could list a lot more than a couple um, but uh, the the students will definitely not be engineers when they graduate and so they won't be taking jobs that you have to be an engineer to do but they'll be taking many jobs that they at the edge of engineering um, that involve geoscience geology um, uh, earth science in the you know transportation um, uh, you know, remote sensing. There are a whole lot of areas that um, that that this has really favorable job 
opportunities, but this part wasn't at all burdensome. And okay. I think the potential for speeding up the level two um, final approvals will be really an advantage because in the past, that process has been, I will say, dominated by the process of getting into a, a regent meeting agenda, which might be two or three months from the time that the campus is really ready to move forward. And then when you add to that the sort of the month before that, that you need to have everything in for consideration, I, I think it will really speed things stuff. up. And, and looking at what's happening to the economy, not only with the COVID-19, but that's part of it, you're gonna wanna have very nimble um, educational, whether it's certificates or whether it's um, stackable credentials or whether it's degree programs or new options, the more nimble the system can be in that regard, the more competitive they're going to be in terms of landing students the, from Montana and from other places and responding to employer need for different kinds of credentials. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned at our meeting that graduates with this degree would be um, useful on all ends of extraction and on um, cleanup. You've mentioned some cleanup projects that are coming up that are also potential employers. Yep, yep, uh, yeah, so um, I think it was, it's, I think it's tonight that the um, the city council, the county, whatever it is, Silver Bow Council is meeting and it has on its agenda whether it's gonna approve the, um, the chief executive to sign the consent decree between the state of Montana, Butte Silver Bow, um, uh, ARCO and EPA, uh, which will, once it's signed and gets approved by the courts will be a certainly multi tens of millions, multi even hundreds of millions of dollars, multi decade pro project that's laid out um, in terms of the work that needs to get done to make uh, Butte environmentally and health uh, safe and healthful and clean up the water and clean up the soil. And um, that kind of project just in food alone will be able to employ a lot of um, people with degrees of this type. I think the number of master's credentialed um, people that they need in that industry is already pretty high, but um, just locally in Anaconda, I think their consent degree is just a little bit ahead of ours and it's not quite as big, but um, there, and then if you look at other places in the state with the with the new mines that are being proposed and and other other issues like that, I think, um, and this isn't the only, I mean, there are a lot of uh, credentials that UM, MSU, Western um, uh, produce uh, students with those credentials that are also employable there. But this this particular one will be, I think, at the interface of the science and engineering will be very popular. Great. Regent Dombrowski, do you have a question? I do, and I've, I've been here for some, can you hear me? I've been here yes. for so long, I, I, um, I anyway, sorry. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, Dr. Hartline. I had a great conversation with you and Dylan actually in, in March about this. I, I think mine is more of a process and I find myself saying, what is it as a regent what possible direction as a regent could I give to Dr. Hartline about this? And I wonder if it's part of, um, Brock, your prioritization that will help us set a contents to put us in the best position. I, I am all for this new process, but I find myself wondering um, how to be, how to provide effective direction or leadership. So I don't, maybe it's more of a rhetorical question or something to be continued, but I, I really am, feeling very compelled to want to be accountable and yet not quite feeling I have perhaps what I need in order to do that. Brock, do you have an answer to that question or do you want me to take a stab at it? Well, uh, Chershi, with your permission, maybe I would just offer a couple of words and then you can, of course, um, uh, deliver the authoritative uh, conclusion to whatever I lead in with. And that is that I feel like um, one thing we've looked to the regions for is, is really uh, guidance in terms of how we can build out the academic programming map in Montana. So where do we have uh, areas of strength throughout the system 
where perhaps are we seeing um, growing duplication and when is that duplication needless? When is that duplication needed? The academic programming and planning statement that you'll see every year will sort of be each campus's statement about how they want to add on to our existing map. And I think the regions can look at those statements and say, okay, based on that, here is where we might offer some redirection to campus X or campus Y or campus Z. And that I've heard from you all might be a more powerful way for the regions to exercise guidance rather than getting down into uh, the kind of granular weeds on a proposal that is really fully baked already and has years of planning behind it. If, if I can, can I add something there? If I t think about Please do. The, kind of, the kinds of advice that I think I would really value from the region. So, so you represent the entire geographic area of Montana. We're lo we happen to be located in Butte. So we see employment and other issues and needs more strongly in Butte than from the rest of the state. So if there are, you know, area uh, perspectives that you have that you can bring from the parts of Montana that you're in, um, that would be valuable. The other thing that would be valuable is you represent many different, I'll say, industry expertise sectors yourselves. Um, and you have networks of people in even more expertise sectors, and you have this oversight responsibility, this management responsibility for the system. And, and, and so you, 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 you'll, you'll bring, you can bring something now that we won't get if when our faculty, and it's not me who's going to be working on this, of course, it's the faculty who work on it. They're the ones with the expertise. Um, they have expertise in this discipline, but how we connect this degree proposal to the bigger picture, that's significantly where the regions can provide, you know, excellent advice or say, wait a second, this would be a terrible idea. Um, Thank you, Dr. Hartline. Uh, Joy, did that answer your question? I think it's just the right question. Yes, yes, it did. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to um, give a few extra minutes. I appreciate it. I mentioned earlier in this discussion that we struggle, and, and Casey really, uh, when he served on this committee, pushed us to change this system in, in a better way. Um, but we struggle, as you're struggling now, to figure out when we come into this process, how we come into it, what we should be considering. But it all really arises out of the charge, the statutory charge that we avoid duplication and that we allocate the resources of the university. And all of the things that have been mentioned here, whether it's geography, economy, duplication, and resource allocation, those are the things we're thinking of. We created the forum with that in mind so that it gives you the information to answer those questions or to raise questions if you have them. I don't happen to have any questions about this plan. So I, we're probably not providing much feedback as far as those things because it doesn't duplicate with anything else. There isn't a resource problem. So I think it's, we're not providing much guidance because it came to us in a way that we feel like it fits well within our system is what I'm ascertaining. Well, thank you. We were thinking that too, but of course we have our more narrow view. That's what we think. I think when we won't, you'll know that. Uh, Buck, did you have something to add? No. Okay. Any other questions, Regents? This has been a great discussion. Oh, Regent Miller. Thanks, Chair Sheehy. I do have a question for Dr. Hartline. Um, so when we're looking at the numbers on the page that currently is pulled up about MUS Geosciences uh, graduates from 2017 to 2019, we're, we're on general within the total seeing a decline. Um, Montana Tech is seeing a 25% decline. Montana State University is seeing over a 50% decline. Um, I'm not sure exactly what my question is surrounding this, but that, that does concern me as we're adding a new program and we're seeing a, you know, a sharp decline in students right in the middle of that page. Okay, so, so Regent Miller um, and uh, Regents. So it may look like a decline. You're not adding a new program. You're adding a new option in the program. And that new option will serve a particular set of students um, who, who might not have been served by some of the op other options and we, you know, without creating any more courses or anything extra needed. In Montana Tech's case, I was looking that too. And what I discovered is that some key faculty were on sabbatical. 
And when they're, when they're about to go on sabbatical, they don't take new graduate students. So one of these faculty who's on sabbatical in 2019 or 2020, th this current academic year, um, and I think half of last academic year, he stopped taking new students. He normally had something like eight master's students working for him and he finished them. Um, he got them, he got them finished, but he was not taking new students. And then we had another faculty member who was planning on going on sabbatical. I don't know if that's happening because of the COVID-19, but um, you know, she also has been very slow to take new students because as a faculty member, you don't want to be gone when your students are in the critical stage of needing your mentoring. Um, and so Thank you, Doctor. That's that that was that's a factor in our decline. I would have to, you know, I, I don't know anything about University of Montana has grown. They've almost doubled mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, there's a great collaboration among all these three programs and departments. Thank you. Uh, Regents, any other questions? Seeing none, that does actually bring us to the end of our action items. We're going to move on to information. Uh, I'm going to do this a little differently. I'm going to start with item E because items A, B, C, and D are discussion items. Um, item E, the level one memorandum, these are items that have been delegated for approval by OCHI. They've done that work. These items are provided by your for your notice. I presume you've all had a chance to read them. If you have any questions, we can entertain those now. Any questions regarding the level one approval memorandum on the delegated duties? I see none. Let's move up to item A. This is the 2020-2021 academic calendar. Um, uh, Brock, will you be handling these four items, A, B, C, and D? So she, I'll handle the first item here. Uh, okay. And, and my, my my side of this is fairly brief. Uh, Heather, if you could click on the link um, on item A. This this is simply a, a table that um, Rebecca Power in our office put together. Um, and if we can click on that item, um, Heather, that would be great. Uh, at any rate, uh, it's a table of our academic calendar for 2020, uh, 2021. And it, it's just to give the regents a sense of the um, extent to which we have some variation in start dates, uh, some variation in end dates, uh, depending on all sorts of factors. We have a couple of campuses that run uh, variations of a block schedule. Um, we have some campuses that have class periods of a certain length and others of, of another length. And uh, certainly be happy to have uh, our team put together this kind of spreadsheet for you periodically should you want to take a, a look at the start and end dates. This doesn't um, reflect some of the changes that we'll uh, perhaps see from campuses as they adjust for the coming fall, although it does reflect MSU Bozeman's um, uh, uh, shift to uh, an earlier start date and an earlier end date. I see it's not coming up uh, right now. I will be happy to follow up with this item and, uh, and send it to the Regents. Rebecca Power did a great job of summarizing all of the campus's different calendars. Okay, and Regents, do you are you able to access that on your own computers? I don't. I can't tell if you're seeing it. Yes. Oh, yeah, um, okay. Great. I'm happy to share my screen if that would be helpful. I, 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 you know, as long as everyone else can see it, I can see it as well, okay. Regent Miller, and so I have a hard copy here. <laughs> Any uh, uh, questions or comments about the calendar? Not seeing any. I, I, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, Regent Rogers. Thank you. Um, Deputy Commissioner Tussman, what challenges, is, if any, are we, you know, anticipating with these sort of altered start and stop dates where in the past it's been more of a system-wide calendar? Uh, Regent Rogers uh, and, and Chair Sheehy, I think, uh, I guess my opinion is that we haven't really had a singular calendar across the system at any point. We, we do have um, start dates ranging all the way from sort of late August to mid um, September uh, in previous years. And we've had finish dates that vary as well. We have 
some campuses that have a sizable fall break in between uh, two eight week blocks. We have other campuses that have mini breaks in between a series of four blocks each semester. So um, I understand that the, I think the point of your question, uh, and in fact, I think campuses are coming up with all sorts of different ways of uh, ending this fall term by Thanksgiving, uh, but it's not a departure from some singular system-wide calendar that we enjoyed in the past. I think we've always had a variety of start and end dates. Bob, did you have a question? Oh, Bob, you're on mute. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, th this is just amazing that we've got, we're all over the boards here. And I, I, I would think that this creates a lot of complications for Commissioner Christian and his staff, um, especially as we start, start looking at enrollment dates. And uh, uh, there's just, this has got to complicate your life by having everybody have a different calendar. And I know this has not been something that's been within the discussion of uh, prior Board of Regents, but is there some merit in, in really taking a look at this? I'm not so sure that it's not too late to fix this year's calendar, but at some point in time, should we just get to a good common calendar and look forward to, 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 to simplifying our lives and having everybody on the same page? Now, I understand that with due respect to uh, UM Western that goes the block schedule and maybe Great Falls that's doing a modified block schedule and some of those related things here. But uh, I'm wondering if there's some merit in doing that. And then secondly, and this is akin to taking away your birthday, which is sacrilege. But as we look forward here this next spring semester, we're looking forward optimistically that we will have uh, classes on campus here. But does there some merit in not having a spring break from the standpoint of sending 40,000 college students uh, around, potentially around the world, if you will, to come back to campus for uh, four or five weeks with the potential for maybe reinfecting and so on? Is, it, is there some point in time we just say, can we can we do this logistically anymore? Is it a good use of resources to prolong the campus calendars an extra week to give everybody a spring break? And again, I know that that would probably meet with a lot of resistance from the campus community, but uh, but I I think that there's it should should be something we ought to have a discussion about someday. Thank you, thank you, Chair Sheehy. Yes. Any other comments? Bridget Miller. Thank you, Chair Sheehy. Um, I'd also like to reiterate uh, Regent Nystuen's comments that it would be, I think, in the best interests of our system to have a unified calendar, maybe with certain exceptions for certain, certain universities, as Bob was saying, but I think that would be very beneficial. And then my second question is to uh, Deputy Commissioner Brock Tessman, sorry. It's been one of those days. It's been a long one so far. Um, so you said, I just want to make sure I heard this right, that not all of the universities um, have decided a false start date um, and that this still might be changing, that this is not the finalized schedule as of now. I don't want there to be any confusion about that. Yeah. Um, Regent Miller, Chair Sheehy, um, here, here's what we've uh, asked the campuses to do. We've asked the campuses to finish their fall term by uh, Wednesday, November 25th, which is the day before Thanksgiving. Um, we do have one campus, um, MSU Bozeman, that has identified a new start date. That's reflected on this calendar, and that is uh, August 17th. And they will, in fact, end by uh, November 25th. We have other campuses that are looking at um, uh, alternatives uh, that don't necessarily involve an earlier start date could be lengthening class meeting periods. It could be um, having a, a, a wider set of meeting times throughout the day, other scheduling changes. That's really something that we're um, asking the campuses to, to, to engage in with shared governance channels, making sure that they're including as many voices as possible and really identifying a, a, a calendar that suits their needs given that we've asked them to finish by uh, Wednesday the 25th. 
So no, this is not a final calendar for the fall. And the reason it's not final is because we do want the campuses to think hard and, and to engage uh, key stakeholders as they establish the dates that they'll use. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the regents? Chair Sheehy, this is, uh, this is Regent Lozer. Um, so just to continue the conversation about calendars and uh, Regent Nystuen's sort of request to have a, a conversation about whether or not now is the time to figure out how we can bring these calendars sort of together across the, you know, the 14 units that we have in the system. Um, as it relates to our policy, our policy, our board policy, our board policy is pretty wide open as uh, delineated, delineated across three areas. So it's um, just make, making sure that uh, this, the fall semester ends before Christmas holiday, that we're following accreditation standards as it relates to hours, instructional hours and days, and then um, providing the campuses with their um, uh, with some authority over the the final end dates for each of the semesters. So that's that's sort of where our board policy sits right now. Uh, just kind of looking at it, we we haven't had a conversation uh, on this topic for 21 years. So it was last updated in uh, December 1999. So I think, like we have done. Uh, as a board over the past two or three years, we've done a lot of policy cleanup and that's, that's uh, created a lot of conversation. So, um, you know, perhaps uh, over, over the next few months, we do sort of dive into uh, th this conversation. I think there's, there are probably a lot of uh, nuances to calendar calendaring. A um, couple that I think of is um, kind of the connection to the old agrarian uh, economy uh, that we had, agrarian society of when certain uh, campuses started. Um, I sort of go back to some of the game changers uh, of, of CCA around, uh, around scheduling that works for students. Um, so I think that should be sort of a part of the conversation as we dive a little bit deeper into, is, is now the time to change it and make it similar across the campuses, or is there real utility in having uh, th those decisions uh, among campus leaders? Any other regions? Adam Chair. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm going to no. weigh in too, Clay, Clay, do you want me to go first? Sure. Before we go to the commissioner. Um, I've been talking about this ever since we uh, thought about the one application. I think if we're ever going to get to one MUS, we have to be on the same schedule. I think there are lots of other good reasons to be on the same schedule, but my main reason that I think we should have a policy that says, to the extent possible, with limited exceptions, we're all on the same schedule, is that we want to be one MUS. And I don't think anything has pointed out the need for that the way that this crisis has pointed out the need for it. We should, when we go to online, as we had to this spring, we should be able to offer our students one MUS so that wherever they were sheltering in place, they had access to the benefits of that university community. Um, I'm just a huge believer in making it possible for us to move towards one MUS. And I, the first step in that is one calendar. When we made these inquiries uh, two years ago or one year ago, um, one of the big hangups was, it's just almost impossible to get everybody to change. We have that opportunity now. We have the opportunity to talk with our labor agreements. We have the ability to do this. So I think sooner rather than later, I think this is really important. And I think it's a matter of policy, just as it was our policy at one time, as is, or as it is now, I guess, that we tell everybody you gotta be done by a certain date. I don't care what date that is. I think they should all be done on the same date and they should start around the same time. Go ahead, Commissioner. Madam Chair, um, I, this is a fine conversation to have and an appropriate one to have. I think um, just trying to set the stage a little bit, it, it is incredibly complicated to Regent Nystuen's point, and it is sort of a headache. Changing it will also be, and that's not an excuse or a reason not to, um, but I want to make sure that we work through, you know, there are 
uh, as aspects of accreditation that need to be considered. There's aspects of financial aid. There's veteran stipends. Um, and then, you know, I think we want to be careful that we create enough flexibility that we don't stifle creativity within our own system around uh, experience one is a great example, but uh, the eight week blocks in Gray Falls. I know uh, that we've had other conversations with other campuses that we maybe should take better advantage of the great state of Montana and consider even a trimester system where we are, are considering three equal semesters, employ faculty on 12 year contracts instead of 10 year. I mean, and you know, there's so many uh, aspects of that working with our union partners with conversations that um, if we're going to do it, I just want to make sure that we we allow ourselves enough time. I, I don't, even though we've sort of rushed to some changes around a COVID response, in, including Regent Nystuen, we are modeling some thoughts around spring break 2021, given uh, pandemic status, but uh, that we don't we don't limit ourselves or rush ourselves uh, in a response that uh, doesn't allow for good conversations at the campus levels to give you all input as to where the nuances really do matter. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Chair Sheehy, uh, Regent Nystuen has his hand raised. Go ahead. I couldn't see you, Bob. Go ahead. I thought we were two years still. You're on mute. Sorry. As a follow-up to that, you know, as we look at the spreadsheet here, uh, as it stands now, and I know this is a work in process, you know, you look at uh, MSU Bozeman starting on uh, Monday, August 17th, and MSU uh, Billings, just 140 miles up the road, is September 9th. And I'm sure there's that'll probably, that could change. But I think about uh, Deputy Commissioner, Trevor, that gives us a 15-day enrollment report. And, you know, we're trying to compare apples to apples as to uh, increases, decreases in enrollments and things like that. And there's almost a month difference as it's listed in this spreadsheet right now. That makes no sense that we have to wait for um, three to three weeks or more to get the same data from uh, a campus uh, that is all part of the same MSU system, M M MSU system to, to do this. So I'm not saying that we have to solve this this fall, but I think in my perfect world, I'd be a big advocate that a year from now, we are voting on one calendar for the entire, uh, the entire MUS, giving us almost a full year to work through the union, the faculties, the communities, the students, and so forth. It's a big lift, but I think in the long run, we're going to be better off if we get to one calendar. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Any other comments? Can't see the other half of you just a moment. No? Okay. Uh, before we leave this topic, I just want to say we must have done this once before because when I was enrolled, we were on quarters. So we must have done this at some other time. Um, next item on our information agenda is COVID-19 response, student engagement, mental health, and retention. Chair Sheehy, um, uh, we have uh, three short presentations here um, uh, for the board. And I would lead into these presentations by uh, re revisiting the request that you made uh, a week or so ago at our ARSA committee call, which is to have as much kind of meat on the bones as possible as we talk about our COVID-19 response this spring and also data on outcomes. Um, and I, I, I want to kind of shield Christine and Angela and Joe here by saying that, you know, we're extremely interested in outcomes data we're digging hard to get those data and working with campuses right now. That spring semester um, did just end. And so uh, for this board meeting, we really can't offer you anything authoritative or too informative because we just haven't had a chance to, to get those data and to digest them. I'm gonna commit our team here and also our two-year team to providing you all in June with a, a sort of COVID-19 response report um, that does capture some of those data as they're made available by our campuses. So I just wanna make sure uh, to let everyone on the board know that these presentations do have meat on the bone, but there'll be even more data and hard evidence as, as May turns into June. 
Uh, I'll have Christine lead off and pass the baton to Angela and then to Joe. I'm going to ask all three to go before we answer any questions, if that's uh, all right with you, Chair Sheehy. It is all right with me, and I do want to check with Chair Lozar. My agenda was not provided with any dates. I don't know how long you want this. I, I, do you have a time set in your mind that you'd like us to con conform to? Uh, for the the committee meeting, yeah. um, no, I would I would say you know kind of leave it up to to Brock uh, in yes, terms okay. of what, yeah, the depth of coverage that he wants. Thank you. Go ahead, Christine. Thanks, Regent Sheehy. Uh, members of the committee, I am going to talk a little bit today about uh, how our students have fared this semester in as much depth as we can, knowing what Brock just said about the semester just ending and not necessarily having the kind of hard data that we will have a little bit later this summer. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about um, what we might expect as we go into the fall. So this will be a little bit more about student experience and less about academic performance. But um, as you might imagine, as students transitioned this spring from these incredibly rich and dynamic and in-person on-campus experiences to remote learning um, very quickly, and then we're also at the same time experiencing the hardships of um, COVID-19 that many others across our state and communities and nation experience, like job loss, social isolation, financial strain, uncertainty, illness, and many, many other things. Um, that really impacted them as students. And I think that we see that in these three areas of mental health, basic needs, and access. Certainly, those aren't the only things that impact students and influence their um, ability to continue pursuing their education and their academic performance. But those are big things that I want to highlight for you. And I think you've heard a little bit about all of these today. Um, Heather, can you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So um, just a quick note on mental health. Um, you'll see here that um, mental health, this is a survey from the American Council on Education, and mental health of students is uh, one of the top most pressing issues facing college presidents. And so I think this concern is very real, and it's something that we need to pay attention to. As you heard from Dr. Betsy Asserson earlier today, and as I've heard from our student affairs officers and our suicide prevention and mental health task force over the past uh, weeks and months, students, this is a big concern for our campuses. Students are experiencing increased stress, um, loss, anxiety, social isolation, and these things have really significant impacts for students' well-being, but they also have significant impacts for uh, student academic performance and also institutionally on retention. Um, there's some good information out there, and I, I imagine we will include some of this in our report about the relationship between uh, mental health and academic performance and mental health and retention. Um, the good news here, though, is that um, we know that services work, mental health supports and services are very positive for students. And I, I just cite this because um, it's something I know off the top of my head, but I think all campuses would say this. Uh, MSU has reported uh, before that of students who seek counseling services, 94% of them re-enroll. And so this isn't just a, an issue that um, is out there and we have to somehow magically problem solve for. We have good solutions that exist already. Um, next slide, please, Heather. Some of the other student uh, challenges that students are facing have to do with access. Uh, Brock and Dean Kruger talked about this a little bit earlier today, but that could be access to technology, access to internet, access to the kinds of student support services that students typically get in an on-campus experience, or it could be um, disability access, access issues, like students have um, an accommodation in an in-person classroom and then had to switch to a remote learning environment where that access need changed or where um, something that wasn't an issue in an in-person setting became a challenge in a, in a remote setting. Students are also experiencing basic needs insecurities more than before. Um, I will say that all of these issues existed before but are exacerbated by uh, the impacts of coronavirus. Uh, what, you know, so students ex experience basic needs insecurities, whether that's housing, financial insecurity, food insecurity, safety insecurity, and I think that we will see um, 
see just how students um, are dealing with that and facing that as, as we move through the next, next months and into the fall. Um, next slide, please. So I think the important thing to note is that these are ongoing challenges and our um, campuses are, are addressing them now. These are some of the ways that campuses have kind of systematically addressed these challenges. They've done student surveys to see how students are doing. They've um, assigned groups of students to staff and faculty to do one-on-one, -on -one, in some cases, weekly calls. They've provided wellness programming. The University of Montana had a stress less online course that in just two weeks, a thousand students took advantage of. Um, all of our campuses have provided some kind of telehealth counseling. Many campuses have uh, connected students in their um, home communities wherever they were um, sheltering in place to whatever resources existed in that community, such as SNAP benefits or food banks. And um, campuses have really done a lot of work in emergency aid. Ron Muffick in our office um, coordinated with financial aid officers to provide um, some guidance on how CARES Act emergency aid would go to students. Uh, even before that aid was dispersed to students, campuses on their own also set up funds to help students with technology needs or housing needs or other emergency needs that uh, students were experiencing due to the impacts of COVID-19. So these are some of the systematic ways that campuses have been addressing the needs I've been talking about. But I think the most important thing that I'll say is that um, our students' needs are varied. We know that um, there isn't just one issue that students experience and that there can't just be one response. And so our mental health providers, our student affairs officers, our student support services staff have been doing the thing that they do best, even if it's been in a remote environment, they've been understanding the particular needs that students have and being able to respond to those on a unique one-by-one, case-by-case basis. Um, next slide, please, Heather. So as we look into the future, um, I think that you know, these are the three things that I would like us all to keep in mind. We need continued leadership and you all and our campuses and um, staff at OCHI and our commissioner and our deputy commissioners have done so much work in um, really bringing our system along and, and um, making this possible for our students and um, making us, us be able to be proud of, of the work that our faculty and staff have done and the success that our students have had. Students need communication. They need to know um, when their calendar changes. They need to know um, how to access their courses. They need to know how to access the student support services that may be offered in uh, remote or hybrid or in-person environments. And then the last thing that I'll note and something that you have heard and I hope we'll continue to hear is that we really need to be thinking about equity and we need to think about how uh, COVID-19 is disparately impacting different groups of students. And so when we find solutions or we address problems and challenges, we need to ask who that solution is working for and if it's working for everybody. Um, we can't have a one size fits all because that's not who our students are and that's not what will work as far as our mission to serve all of Montana's students. With that, I'll pass it along to Angela. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, today I'll be speaking about American Indian student engagement as well as college access efforts during this time. First, as Christine mentioned, addressing equity has been a key part of our ARSA work well ahead of the pandemic and certainly a primary focus during this time. As such, in addition to the comprehensive student supports across all of our campuses for all of our students, I wanted to update you on the communication and outreach to our AMA Council members, our campus-based American Indian Student Success Teams, as well as outreach to American Indian students across our campuses by council members and by those American Indian Student Success Team members across the Montana University system. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is the right slide. Thanks, Heather. So the first bullet here that you see speaks to meetings. And beginning with the first Monday that most campuses were beginning the remote learning, I conducted a meeting to a meeting with the AMA Council, and we discussed 
four questions that I had asked. One was, how has outreach taken place to American Indian students? Who was leading the effort? Who's following up with students? And then what method of outreach has been most successful? And what you see on the next item here is phone calls, social media surveys, text, emails were all used. And really just preliminary conversations told us that uh, some of the most effective outreach to our American Indian students was happening through social media and in particular through Facebook. And so that March 23rd meeting was the first, and we had our most recent meeting yesterday. And leading up to yesterday's meeting, we discussed specifically uh, the numbers. How, how many American Indian students did your department or your team contact? How successful were those efforts at outreach? How many American Indian students did you contact more than once? Uh, and then a, and a whole group of other questions in addition to does your campus have a plan to support these American students back onto your campus this summer and next fall? And what does it look like? And who can we expect to be leading those efforts? In our earliest conversations right up through yesterday, we did recognize as a group that uh, a lot of our American Indian students, as you've already heard, had a lack of access to computers, uh, technology, and internet uh, was also an issue for a lot of our American Indian students. One of the things I will tell you is that there were some things about this new normal where we gained insight into practices that we can institutionalize in an effort to close the equity gap. And that's what you have here. And I think that this would be a really easy step for us to take is uh, something that became very clear to me and to members of the AMA Council was that because of our initial action plans and the fact that they called for a single point of contact, that allowed for easier follow-up from our office and consistency and outreach to see who was leading the strategic communication with our American Indian students. And that's what you see here is a strategy for you to consider as a next step for us to employ. However, I think it's important to recognize that other parts of our action plan that you folks adopted a couple of years ago, uh, they were as critical as ever as we sought to reach out to our American Indian students and support them. And they're right here on the next slide. And so we hope to uh, continue these ongoing strategies right here, which are already built into our AMA action plans. Uh, just in our AMA council meeting yesterday, I was talking to the folks at MSU and they said that faculty and staff across their campus used this time during COVID-19 to take the Indian Education for All for One Montana University System course. Additionally, implementing recommendation number three of our AIM action plan that you passed a couple of years ago as it pertains to more specific data collection will be key for us as we go forward to understand more about our American Indian students and their needs so that we can address them ahead of time rather than in the times of a crisis like this. Finally, I would stress the importance of the need for continued work at the AMA Council and that being a top priority and considering it's the top of the list for the Council is considering how we can support our American Indian students onto our campuses in the fall, knowing that we need to be considerate of everything from coursework to technology and child care needs. So this concludes my part of the presentation around American Indian student success and the outreach uh, that happened on our campuses. And now I'll move into a conversation about college access in general. So during this time, our team focused solidly on the challenges we face and will continue to face during the pandemic. Our college access team did this while working remotely with teams not only in Helena, but our Montana Educational Talent Search, pre-college advisors, and our Montana Gear Up liaisons across the state, even in some of our most remote communities. This team conducted the important day-to-day -day program management while at the same time also keeping an eye on the pandemic and knowing we needed to do all we could to support students onto our campuses in the fall. What you will hear now is a report of our work, all of it with a COVID-19 lens on college access and K-12 partnership. And so what you see right here is we were pleased to award the I Graduate Montana grants during this time. And again, taking that COVID-19 lens and looking at how those grants would provide things like pre-apprenticeship and workforce development and even financial literacy education, that was really critical. The team was pleased to roll out to 125 students across the state, the fact that they were awarded TRIO scholarships, and we hope that uh, they will connect with our campuses in the fall so that we can get those dollars in their account. We just sent, and I hope you saw it in the musing yesterday, our second college access newsletter. We're going to have another one ahead of a start to the new year. Next slide, please. Thank you for your support in making 
taking the Board of, of Regents action around the statewide ACT and what needed to happen as far as policy and students applying for admission to our campuses. So what we did is this year's juniors will take the ACT on October 6th of next fall and next year's juniors will take the ACT in the spring of 2021. We have worked very well with our partners in K-12 on this conversation. And additionally, our office took it upon ourselves to create an FAQ around what the action that you took meant for students and the admissions policies. And it's really exciting to be able to tell students that the Board of Regents was so proactive that they grew opportunities and options for students at access to our campuses all across the state. Now, this next slide speaks to the specific work first of our Montana Educational Talent Search and Gear Up programs. A couple of things. The educational talent search application went online for the first time in the program's 40 plus year history. And we could not be more pleased about that because we think that will make it easier access and onboarding for students into that program. So kudos to Director Rebo there. Additionally, Director Anderson of the Montana Gear Up program, he issued a request for proposal for remote mentorship, which really would have come in handy for us during this time of COVID-19. And so we're looking ahead to next year saying, hey, we'll have something in our back pocket to support us. We talked earlier and throughout the day about working with counselors on everything from CTE and getting students into our two-year campuses and dual enrollment. And we conducted a counselor focus group to find out how to message better to students. We sent out a financial aid survey to 160 plus surveys, uh, counselors all across the state. We are also working with all of our counselors and our site facilitators on college application week, FAFSA completion and college signing week for next year. Additionally, you saw the guest opinion in the musings that was really a focus again on next fall. And we're working with our director of communications on an outreach uh, to middle school and high school students about post-secondary opportunities all across the state. And then I would speak to our college signing week, week effort that you've heard a little bit about throughout the day. I would encourage you if you have a few minutes to go take a look. We, we were going to have this face-to-face -face event uh, during the first week of May. We worked with our partners at Reach Higher Montana to put it online and we could not be more pleased. We had videos from the governor and the superintendent of public instruction. We had over 200 video and photo submissions for this. And we think that we're in a good place to grow it. In fact, we've already had our, our first meeting for next year. Additionally, we've been in constant contact with our partners at the Office of Public Instruction, two meetings around COVID-19 uh, per week, constant contact with our partners all across the K-12 community. We did a presentation with our partners at Reach Higher Montana around the portal so that folks know, first of all, that our campuses are opening in the fall. And then secondly, so that folks know to go to that portal come September 1 when Apply Montana goes live. And then finally, uh, Joe Teal and I met with uh, Board of Public Ed Chair Darlene Schottel just last week to talk about how we could work with their board and the K-12 partners to get more students to complete the FAFSA because I'm sure as you've heard and I'm sure as uh, folks across our campuses will tell you that so much of this CARES Act aid was dependent uh, on getting in, into the students' hands was, hands was dependent on their, their completion of a FAFSA document. And so we are laser focused on that. And so, uh, Madam Chair, uh, we do hope to continue these ongoing strategies that we have here on this slide. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation and turn it over to Joe Teal. Thank you, Angela. Uh, thank you, Chair Sheehy, members of the board. Uh, if we can pull up my slides, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the swift transition to remote delivery. And just to take you back a couple of months, uh, on March 12th, campuses received the instruction to transition all courses possible to remote delivery. And within 10 days, if you can go to the next slide, Heather, our, our faculty had accomplished something pretty incredible. 9,700 courses uh, moved from face-to-face -to, -face to remote delivery. And that was, as you can imagine, not a painless process. It was an enormous lift for our faculty, as you've heard from Christine and Angela, it was a big lift for a lot of our students. Uh, and what I wanna to emphasize today is that, that our success in that endeavor is in large part due to some very small teams of instructional designers, e-learning leaders, uh, uh, faculty development experts on your different campuses. And yes, please move to the next slide. Uh, 
I have the privilege of, of convening one such group. It's uh, the e-learning advisory committee for the system. I won't go through all of the efforts that that group has undertaken this spring, but I do want to highlight a few. Within that first week, uh, Maricel Lawrence from the University of Montana and Kim Obink from Montana State University had developed and delivered a seminar for our chief academic officers and our instructional design leads across the system, uh, a strategy seminar on moving online, on how to undertake this massive effort on our campuses. Within the next couple of weeks uh, at the system office, as well as at our campuses, we developed a whole host of resource guides for our various websites on alternative assessment, on moving your course online quickly, resource guides for students when it comes to accessing online courses, resource guides for instructional designers on how to make their courses accessible to students with disabilities. Um, and then what we have done since then is weekly meetings with e-learning leads around the state, talking through all sorts of topics, really a network of problem solvers, uh, sharing what they're running up against, sharing what solutions they're discovering. In, in some of the areas, uh, this is only a limited list that you see on the screen in front of you. Next slide, please, Heather. And so uh, really the question that I wanna share with you now is, is where we see ourselves going forward in this area of, of how we help our faculty to develop and deliver some of the best, highest quality, most effective online curriculum. So what happened this spring is not uh, the ideal situation for developing and delivering an online course. Typically online coursework requires weeks or months of effort to uh, develop the content, to think through the assessment, to think through the pedagogy so that it's best suited to that format. And, and we're trying to institute a few strategies, both as a contingency mechanism for this fall, as well as in the hope that, uh, that this experience has brought new faculty members into kind of the online learning community, thinking through how we can collaboratively as a system uh, produce more new, effective, high quality online teaching. Just wanna share three strategies. Strategy number one, you, you heard in the two-year committee some of this particular challenges around CTE coursework, uh, programs that have a lot of experiential learning. We're convening faculty roundtables in disciplines that, that really rely on that type of learning to understand their experience from the spring, to understand some of the impacts, and most importantly, I think, to gather some ideas that we can share amongst those program directors for resources, approaches, uh, to bring those type of experiential hands-on learning opportunities into the online or the blended learning realm. Strategy two, and there's been a lot of progress on this just in the last week, is convening some system efforts on faculty development and training. So we're standing up trainings for instructional designers. We're looking at standing up a training on what's called the high flex model, uh, a, a model of both in-person and online learning simultaneously to give students as many options as possible. And then we're looking to stand up a, a second cohort of the MUS Teaching Scholars. This is a program that recognizes excellent online educators and, uh, and then charges them over the course of the fall or the next spring semester to lead faculty learning communities about online instruction, good assessment in the online space. And then finally, an area that we're discussing in these weekly meetings is ways that we can leverage system procurement uh, to perhaps identify some of the tools, uh, software, subscriptions that can facilitate online learning. Things that campuses individually might not be able to procure, but if we can coordinate, uh, we can more efficiently get access to be it proctoring softwares to administer assessment online or uh, tools to ensure that online materials are accessible to all students. Uh, we're exploring and I think have some, some good early ideas that we're, we're trying to bring as they come up uh, to our financial folks and to our procurement folks to see if we, if we can move some of those concepts forward. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Brock and to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Brock, anything to add for our update? Uh, 
Chair Sheehy, no, uh, I think we'll just stand for questions. I'm very mindful of our time. And so uh, we're happy to swing right into any questions from the board. Thanks to Joe and Christine and Angela. It took me a long time, but I have now figured out how to have all your screen, your faces on my screen at the same time. So this is going to go smoother. Anybody have any questions? Well, now you don't have any. <laughs> no questions. Anything from the commissioner? No. Okay. Thank you so much for that update. That is the last item on the RSEC committee agenda. So I turn this back over to Chair Lozar. <clears throat> Thank you, Re Regent Sheehy, um, for a very complete uh, RSA committee uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're at the point in the agenda where we're actually going to take a break. And I I noticed that we did have a couple hands raised um, from some phone numbers likely. Uh, it was for public comment. So uh, for all those that are online, including the regents, um, we're gonna take a break, but please do not disconnect from the meeting. Uh, we're gonna mute all the lines and we will uh, reconvene in, in 10 minutes at 3.55. You need to explain again how to make public comment. We will do that when we come back. All right, we're going to get uh, back underway. I hope everyone enjoyed the, a brief 10-minute uh, break. Uh, we're going to, at this point in the meeting, we're going to turn to, uh, to public comment. And uh, Amy is going to walk us through how we're going to do this over the virtual platform. So, Amy. Thank you, Chair Lozar. Um, as Chair Lozar noted, this meeting is open to the public electronically and through the virtual platform here. Anyone who is wishing to provide public comment is encouraged to do so by dialing 1-346-248-7799 and entering the meeting ID. This information is also being live streamed. Upon dialing in, please press star nine to raise your hand. For those who have joined via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature to indicate that you wish to give public comment. The host will lower hands in order and unmute the phone line to ask the individual their full name and allow them to give public comment. Please keep your comments to two or three minutes um, out of consideration for others. Comments may also be submitted in writing via email and sent to me, Amy Unsworth at aunsworth at montana.edu. Comments submitted in writing will be shared with the board members and included as part of the official record. I see we have a number of people in the queue here, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Again, we'll ask that you say your full first and last name. Hello, can you please give us your first and last name? And if for any reason you aren't able to speak, I'll just um, mute you again and we'll go through the line. They may have to unmute on their end too. And you may have to watch for that prompt or listen for it on Zoom. So we'll just try one more time here. I've unmuted the line ending in 621. If you'd please state your full name for the record. My name is Verena Lawrence. Um, and I am a student at Montana State University. I have been the president of the Health Professions Club as well as a member of the Student Health Advisory Committee and a senator for the College of Letters and Science on campus. Um, I would like to urge you to approve the Student Wellness Center fee that the MSU student body passed. Students felt strongly enough about this fee that despite normal life being so greatly interrupted and without normal campaigning resources, they voted to pass it. Health services dedicated spaces um, to improve physical and mental health are incredibly important. And while MSU has grown, the student health services have not been able to keep up with that growth. The halls, waiting rooms, and resources at the Swingle Health Center are at an exceeding capacity. And the Office of Health Advancement had to relocate to a house across the street from the MSU campus due to a shortage of space. And the demand for counseling and psychological services has also increased greatly in recent years and will likely only continue to rise. 
One thing that has become glaringly obvious during this pandemic is that mental health awareness and support is incredibly important. These last several months and the coming many months have had and will undoubtedly continue to have a profound impact on the mental health and well-being of students as they face greater social isolation, heightened levels of anxiety and fear, dashed hopes and plans, and an increasingly uncertain future. It is critical that the Board of Regents convey that you prioritize the well-being of students and approving the Student Wellness Center fee shows that you value our physical and mental health. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to the next caller. Again, you'll hear the prompt um, that your line is unmuted and we will ask that you please state your first and last name for the record. This is Jason Yeager. I'm currently serving as the vice president of MPIA here in the Gallatin Valley and been a part of the photonics community in the Gallatin Valley for the last 23 years. I'm calling on behalf of the community college and specifically the photonics program at the Gallatin Community College. So over the last three years, we've seen dramatic growth in the photonics community here in the Gallatin Valley. And one of the challenges we have had is the pipeline. So over the last three years, we have hired here at Quantel USA, um, more than 13 employees from the community college and currently 40% of our workforce in production is from the community college. We're going through a growth cycle right now and we need to add four more technicians to the product line to production. Unfortunately, all the graduates from the photonics program are already placed. So right now the photonics program here in Bozeman is limited by the facilities. Currently we're limited to 12 graduates per, 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 per year. Because of this, there's a limit in the Valley and it's exceptionally competitive. So much so that there's only two programs at MSU that are four year degrees that pay more than the photonics technicians coming out of the community college. So I'd like to encourage the Board of Regents to consider the growth potential in the photonics program here at the community college in Bozeman, along with the ability to increase the facilities available to, to increase that program. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go ahead and move to the next caller. Again, if you would please remember to say your first and last name for the record, we appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mike Vasquez. I'm the Hi, incoming ASMSU. Hi, hello. I'm the incoming ASMSU president, and I'm here to voice my support for the proposed student, student wellness center. Um, I'm in full support of the Student Wellness Center. With a 66% student vote in support of the Student Wellness Center, there is a want and a need for this facility on the Montana State University campus. When the roof on the gyms collapsed last year, students expressed that they didn't want the gym to just be patched, but they wanted it to be improved to meet the current and future needs of MSU students. The Wellness Center focus on stu focuses on student wellness as a whole, including physical, emotional, and mental and mental health. Focusing on all of these areas will benefit the MSU students of the future and lead to an overall academic and personal lead to overall academic and personal success. As we move into the future, this wellness center is a resource that students will use to improve their overall well-being and set them up for long-term success. Students overwhelmingly want this new facility and I hope you support it too. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to the next caller. Please state your first and last name for the record. Chris Mel. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, as noted, my name is Chris Mel, and I'm the mayor of Bozeman. And first, I'd like to thank the regents and all of those in the university system for your hard work and passion to educate the future of Montana. Thank you so much for the work that you do every day. Uh, I'm calling today to express my support for Dalton College um, and what it does for Montanans, and also the tremendous opportunity that we have as a state to uh, for expansion of that college and what it would mean for our workers and businesses. As President Cruzado, uh, Dean Gray and others uh, have discussed with you, uh, the college is growing rapidly and adding new programs. And as you know, there's a 95% enrollment rate in existing programs. Uh, we find uh, locally that the college is incredibly responsive to local businesses. Uh, you heard from a, a member of our photonics industry just a moment ago, and, and the students are well prepared and are finding employment uh, in Montana, uh, staying here in the state. 
Uh, and as such, the Gallatin College is addressing a growing need. Uh, but as you know, unfortunately, they're not able to expand even while there's that strong demand for their programs and also additional programs such as auto mechanics, HVAC, construction, uh, the uh, photonics that you heard about, uh, specialized welding and manufacturing programs, as well as additional healthcare programs possibly. Uh, and locally, we're supporting the college uh, through a county mill levy. And I think it's time that we as a state and a community seize the opportunity to expand support uh, for this workforce education in the fastest growing region and economy of the state. And hopefully the a Gallatin College uh, facility building, perhaps similar in size and scope to what's at the Missoula College building, uh, could triple the number of students and add to the needed diversity of workforce offerings. Uh, such a step would be great for citizens here in Bozeman and Gallatin College, but I believe across Montana as we attract uh, students from across the state. Thank you very much for your time. And again, thank you for your work as regents and for the university system. Uh, it is much appreciated what you do for our state and our community. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to the next caller, if you'd please state your first and last name for the record. Good, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Regents. My name is Carol Bellin, and I've been hanging in here all day with you. Thank you for your service. I'm a student at UM Missoula. I'm a senior completing my bachelor's degree in political science with a history minor. After graduation, I'm considering applying to UM for grad school. I have two brief concerns and a closing remark to share with you. First, I'd like to express my support for our adjunct professors system-wide. Though I know you are not responsible for faculty hiring and firing, you are entrusted with our system's educational leadership, and you can provide guidance through your oversight responsibilities. So I'm asking you to please speak up and stop the bleeding of our academic teaching positions. There's been a lot of talk today about how the university system must be nimble in the face of the challenges the current pandemic has brought to us. I don't think that there is any nimbler member of the academic community than the adjunct professor. They tend to be more versatile with new technologies and more willing to develop and teach new curricula to meet fast changing needs. Also adjuncts contribute in a major way to student retention. They've been among the most exciting and motivating professors I've had. They bring fresh energy, creative content delivery, and unsurpassed outreach and support to their students. I am distressed and demoralized as a student to learn that adjuncts are being treated as low-hanging fruit to be cut and terminated without departmental or student input as to the impact this will have on their programs. The scale of these cuts merits more than a decision by a departing administrator and a dean. It is so painful to watch our university system lose these rising star teachers, discarding them to the already enormous unemployment pile instead of utilizing their abilities to help our students get a leg up in the uncertain future we face. With all due respect for the extraordinarily difficult, the difficulty administrators face right now, the elimination of adjuncts erodes my trust that administrators are doing due diligence in searching out cuts in non-academic areas. Second, I ask you to please be sure that financial support for the libraries in our university system is not only maintained, but increased. The library is the very beating heart of a university. It's been the greatest factor in my ability to be successful in my studies. The librarians have been an invaluable resource in advancing my research skills. The library provides critical physical study spaces. When the Mansfield Library was forced to close because of the virus, it completely wrecked my spring semester. Also, do not undervalue libraries when it comes to recruiting new students. The condition of the campus library weighs heavily in the decision of which school to choose. My closing remark is this. I ask you to take action in light of the financial impact of the pandemic crisis by setting a much, much more reasonable cap on administrator salaries as positions are vacated and rehired. For example, consider the fact that the one single position of provost at UM Missoula has cost us over $820,000 over three years. It does not sit well at all with me that we honored our provost provost with a contract for $270,000 a year and a $10,000 signing bonus 
and he is abandoning ship after serving only two full years when our university is at its greatest need for academic leadership. After a slash and burn treatment of adjunct faculty, the mess he leaves behind will fall once again at Missoula to an interim provost to sort out. I'm tired of hearing that we must raise administrator salaries to attract superstar candidates from a national pool. Can you feel the burn? Stop this now. Even if it's only a temporary emergency policy, cap these outrageous administrator salaries and promote from within the university. Thank you for hearing my concerns. Thank you. We'll move to the next caller. If you would please state your name for the record. Oh. I apologize, I, uh, I had a technical glitch there. One moment here, we'll move to the next caller. You would please state your name for the record. And this is the number ending in 392. You are now unmuted to give public comment. I am so sorry about that. My name is Cassidy Lewandowski. Um, I would first just like to say good afternoon, Regents. I have been here all day as well. and. I can see that this has been a day just full of um, just information and just a lot to go through. Um, I am here, I'm an incoming sophomore and senator with the uh, Associated Students of Montana State. I'm calling in today to support the Student Wellness Center fee. As you guys know, um, the Student Wellness Center fee was uh, voted for by 66% margin um, by our students. Um, and I would just like to start by saying that my position as a senator is important, but as a student, this student wellness center is beyond my expectations, especially as an incoming sophomore. This senator will provide everything to do with my well-being and happiness when times can be stressful, which are not hard to find on a university campus. As a senator, I can easily say that the students I've been in contact with are also excited to see a center that puts them first, physically and mentally. Speaking to the matter of telehealth that I heard earlier, um, I would just like to say that as a nursing student, I see that telehealth is making headway, especially now in a pandemic. However, I don't think that telehealth is always a substitute for face-to-face -face interaction, especially, especially with counseling. This center was made to accommodate students in all areas of health and well-being, and it is my belief that we should deliver on the expectations to do just that. As for the fee itself, I understand I'm a first-generation college student who is paying their own way. And to see fees added to my tuition can sometimes be disheartening. However, with this $58 per semester fee, I know that ultimately I'm investing in a better holistic well-being for not only myself, but thousands of students to come. It is my hope that this urges everyone to think about how students will be affected in a positive way by the Wellness Center. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. We'll move to the next caller. And if you would please state your name for the record. Good afternoon, I'm Tammy Harris with MFPE. Chair Lozar, Commissioner Christian and Regents. First, I'd like to say thanks to the Commissioner's Office for the constant communication as we have navigated these times together. Deputy Commissioner Kevin McRae has set up weekly calls with HR, labor leaders and OCHI to give updates, answer questions and to hear about any issues that campuses might be facing from all of our amazing employees that are doing so much for students and each other. The members I represent have stepped up and are a bright spot during times that have felt a little bit dark. I would like to encourage campuses to continue to partner with us and work together to continue with clear, consistent communication as this helps alleviate fears and stops rumors. By having labor leaders at the appropriate tables is very beneficial. It helps us all look around corners and continue to work together to do what is best for students, staff, faculty, administration, campus communities and our campuses as a whole that we live in. Thank you for everyone and all your hard work that is being done by so many. Thank you, Tammy. We'll move to the next caller. Please state your, I'm sorry, I'm just getting a technical thing here. Let's see. My apologies. We'll move to the next caller. If you would please state your name for the record. This is the line ending in 517. You are unmuted. 
Hi, this is Representative Jim Hamilton. I'm representing the east side of Bozeman out to the Park County line and served this past session on the Appropriations Committee. I want to say a few words in strong support of one item in the priority list for the long range building program. That's item number six, building for Gallatin College. It definitely should be on the list and I would like to see it be even higher on the list. The efforts of Gallatin College are proven successful. It's rapidly growing while operating in a makeshift, makeshift setting. And that space undermines communicating to the students that their program is valued and important. College should be elevated from that poor cousin perception. The college's nimble and efficient delivery of programs should be treated like the significant asset it is. We all know investing in a successful branch in a business is the best way to take advantage of the multiplying effect. Success begets more success. There's a pressing need for increased one to two year education programs, particularly now. You've talked about that a little bit today yourselves. The legislature, as you know, entertained a number of bills last session on CTE and community colleges, demonstrating growing support at that level. The experience in this recession may not repeat what happened in the great financial crisis, but it is a long-term pattern that demand increases at many educational institutions when jobs are tight. Education is one of the economic engines of the Bozeman community. A large percentage of new jobs in the last 10 years in the state have come from Gallatin County. The investment in Gallatin College would help one of the state's economic engines run even better, which helps the entire state. I urge support for the investment in Gallatin College. Thank you for that comment. We will move to the next caller. And if you would please state your name for the record. And this is to the phone line ending in 798. You are Thank you for the recognition. Thank you, could you state your first and last name please? Yes, thank you for the recognition. My name is Taylor Gregory, um, and I'm the new president of ASUM at the University of Montana. Uh, first, I want to introduce myself and say that I'm really excited to work with all of you during this next, uh, next year. I won't take up too much of your time, but I wanted to show my support for the ASUM fee initiatives that you are all seeing today. I'm in support of these initiatives because of the multitude of benefits that they give to our students. Uh, and the many services that ASUM provides, such as childcare, transportation, and legal services, to name a few. Additionally, these funds help support our 100 plus student groups at UM, which create and foster a community um, among students at the University of Montana. As a student who has been in several of these student groups my past three years here, I can personally attest to the value that they bring to our campus community and how an additional increase in funding uh, will further support the benefits that ASUM provides uh, to our students. But furthermore, I also wanted to advocate briefly on behalf of the UM School of Music uh, with the long range building priority list, especially as it relates to their accreditation by the National Association of Schools of Music. I was approached by the author of a student led initiative back in January, and I have witnessed firsthand the dedication, uh, spirit, and passion that is driving this initiative from students of the arts at the University of Montana and the need for the renovations to the infrastructure in the music building here on campus. I personally enjoy going to concerts and performances there with family and friends, uh, as well as waited for the bus services outside of the music building, as that is where the major hub for our transportation services are at the University of Montana. So I encourage all of you to consider that request going forward, as well as the ASUM fee initiative that Abigail discussed with you all this morning. So it's nice to meet all of you, and I look forward to working with you all uh, going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you for that comment. We'll move to the next caller. And it looks like this person is joined uh, via Zoom, so I'll just promote them, and that will give them speaking rights. Please state your name for the record. Hello, uh, this is Taylor Blossom, outgoing uh, Mass and ASMSU president. Um, first of all, I'd like to just second everything the previous MSU students said with regards to the Wellness Center. I know I touched on that earlier, though. Um, I wanted to give the board a brief update on the Mass meeting from last night. 
Um, we elected a new leadership team with James Flanagan, the incoming ASUM vice president, taking over the role of mass president. Um, so congratulations to him. And I hope he can continue the great working relationship with the board and commissioner's office that um, mass has enjoyed this year. Um, in addition to that, we selected our administrator of the year, uh, Marianne Bruff, who is the director of the Office of Student Engagement at Montana State University, um, was selected for that position. She's done a lot of great work helping out ASMSU through the transition um, and dealing with COVID-19. Um, in addition to that, she took some time out of her schedule to assist Mass as well. And so we wanted to recognize her for that. So thank you, Marianne. Um, on a non-Mass related note, just a personal comment I wanted to make on the long range building priorities. I know I've talked with a few members of the board about this, um, but with putting the rekey of the system as our number one priority, I really support that decision. And I think that's important and it's gonna improve safety for students. Um, but over the last semester in talking to student leaders, I've seen a lot of inconsistency throughout the system with how campuses um, allow access to buildings and allow civic organizations or political campaigns to access our campus facilities. And I think especially where COVID-19 is going to drastically change what social interaction looks like for the foreseeable future. And we're prioritizing the rekey of the system as a, our number one priority going into next legislative session. Um, I think it would be an appropriate time and a, a good time for the board to have a conversation about um, how we can standardize those policies throughout the system and make sure that some of the intangibles that students get out of a college experience and being good citizens and learning how to engage in the political process, um, we make sure that those are consistent across all our campuses. Um, so I would just encourage the board moving forward to look at that issue and potentially see if there's any policies we can implement to standardize that across the system. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, it looks like we might be down to the last person. So I will ask you to state your name for the record. Hi, my name is James Flanagan. Hi, James. Um, and I suppose this is good timing going after uh, both Taylor Gregory and Taylor Blossom. Um, good afternoon, Regents. This has been a very uh, interesting meeting to watch. Um, I've been here since about 8 a.m. and I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's been a very uh, lively meeting for sure. Um, I just came to introduce myself. As you all know, I am the incoming ASUM vice president as well as the incoming mass president. Um, both positions I am very thankful to be in. I came today to speak on behalf of two uh, major items for the University of Montana. First, uh, the fee increases that you all um, saw and talked about with Abigail. Um, as a student and as a uh, senator for ASUM, I've seen just how much this fee does for our campus. First, with our agencies, a campus cannot exist without essential uh, services such as childcare, such as legal support, or such as uh, rental support. And we have all three of those uh, uh, vital agencies funded and supported through the ASUM fee. So it's really important that they get adequate support from ASUM and that the increase of a fee is very vital to ensure that support. Um, moreover, the ASUM fee also uh, funds all student groups on campus. And we have about, last I saw, um, 150 recognized student groups. And each of these groups are very important to all students within their own right. Um, I've often said that student groups are the backbone of campus community. They are what makes the community for students. And community is very important for students when it comes to both their mental health as well as their retention on campus and feeling like they belong to their campus. As such, I want to do everything within my power to make sure that these student groups are given the funding that they need in order to be empowered and to uh, give back to the community that they represent. Taking both of these items into consideration, I think that it is self-evident that an increase in the ASUMP can only better address student needs. And as such, I can see none other, excuse me, I can see no other route but to advocate for it. I'd also like to speak on behalf of the music building. Um, this is something that not only am I personally passionate about, but I've also seen 
our student body really get up and uh, rally behind this matter. Um, the music building is something that a conversation really needs to be started about. I'm really hoping that conversation gets started today. Um, you'll see it in a lot of the written public comments, but the music building is not in a great condition right now. It's gone a very long time without getting any sort of reno renovation, and it's frankly in desperate need of a renovation. It's at a state in which it's not necessarily state safe for students, and it isn't um, the best it can be for a student's learning situation. Um, as such, it's really a vital building for the University of Montana. I say this as a communication studies music, uh, excuse me, a commu communication studies major that really doesn't have anything to do with music majors. Yet I find myself in that building for a variety of reasons. I'm in that building for um, events to, that uh, involve uh, the music building. I'm in that building for um, different classes that are opened up cap campus wide. And I'm in that building for the uh, times that it's acted upon as a transportation center. And all of those reasons um, alone make this building vital for the University of Montana. It makes it a very important building for our campus. And as such, it really needs the renovations that are being presented to you today. And I would very much urge you to take that into consideration. Thank you for your time and thank you for your service in this uh, meeting. I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Just give it a few seconds here, just in case any other hands are raised, but I'm not seeing any at this time, Chair Lozar. We'll just go with a couple rounds of, is there any other public comment? Any further public comment? You did receive written comments, but yeah. And just a friendly reminder, we have received written comment um, yesterday, today, throughout the meeting, and that is still open to be submitted. Any written comments received have been, uh, excuse me, shared with the board members and will be integrated into the official record. Perfect. Seeing or hearing no further comment or hands raised or star nines or the entire process you have to go through to submit <laughs> public comment. Um, Thank you for those that stuck with us all day. Uh, there were several of you who provided public comment that got to enjoy uh, the full day with the Board of Regents. Um, and again, uh, appreciate all of those uh, individuals who provided written public comment pro before this meeting. And as a reminder, they can provide public comment after this meeting to, to Amy at, at her email address. So we're gonna move on, uh, uh, members of the board to, uh, to taking action today. And we'll go in the order of uh, the committees that we had on our agenda today. Um, Amy, are we gonna have the board members uh, unmuted so we can, how are we gonna do the motion? Just confirm. So board members, you should all be able to unmute yourselves. I'm getting some thumbs here, good thumbs. And I would. Oh, we got a thumbs down from oh, Rogers. I can assist here. And a thumbs down from Regent Sheehy. Okay. As well as Bob. Well, I think all the regents. There we go. I have a thumbs up. Okay, there's John. Now we should. I'm in. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Is everyone in? Okay. <laughs> thank you, Amy. All right, we're going to start with. Uh, the Budget Administration and Audit Committee agenda. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent uh, agenda, consent <coughs> items A through B. So moved. Uh, moved by Regent Dombrowski? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion or corrections from members of the board? Uh, is there any comments from the campuses? If so, please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if joining by phone. Uh, seeing none, is there any public comment? Again, raise your hand, uh, use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine. Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to action item A, present law budget 2023 biennium. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Regent Tuss. Is there any comments from members of the board? Is there any comments from the campuses? Again, please raise your hand uh, over, over Zoom or dial star nine. Seeing no uh, comment, is there any public comment? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Action item B, long range building program priority list 2023 by NEM. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, moved by Regent Dombrowski. Is there any comments from members of the board? Uh, is there any comments from the campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Uh, motion passes. Action item C, request to increase tuition and fees, fiscal year 21, Dawson Community College. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, moved by Regent Sheehy. Is there any discussion or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, is there any d discussion or comments from campuses? Again, please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if joining by phone. Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed, same sign. Uh, motion passes. Moving on to action item D, request for authorization to design and construct a student wellness center, MSU Bozeman. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. So moved. A move by Regent Nystuen. Is there any comments or discussion from members of the board? Is there any discussion or comments from campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Uh, motion passes. Action item E, request for authorization to increase the building facility fee for the Student Wellness Center, MSU Bozeman. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Regent Miller. Is there any discussion or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, are there any comments from the campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. Those, all, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. <clears throat> what are we on, E? E. All right, we'll move on to action item E. F, sir. F. E. F. So, I like it. I think we're on E. Facilities fee for the wellness center? We're on F. We're on, we're on F. F. Sorry, 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 F. Uh, <laughs> uh, a request for approval to re restructure the ASUM student activity fee, University of Montana, Missoula. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved, uh, moved by Regent Miller. Any comments from members of the board? Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Regent Tess. Yeah, if, if I'm not mistaken, I, I, and I can't tell based on what's on the screen here, but I, I believe that this is the 
one of the two proposals from ASUM and the University of Montana relative to the ASUM student activity fee. And I think that this one has to do with extending the student activity fee to, to those students who are taking uh, fewer credits, uh, one to six, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that is correct. So I, I have some concern with this and I apologize for not bringing this up um, during discussion earlier. I, I just wonder, uh, I'm wondering out loud about the nexus between having these students that are taking perhaps even just one credit and the activities that these uh, that these fees will be will be funding, and whether or not that group of students is really going to utilize those services, um, I perhaps may reluctantly support this. Um, but it's a discussion that I, um, I again I apologize for not bringing it earlier, but I I think it's an important uh, issue. Thank you, Regent Tuss. Uh, any other further comments, uh, Regent Sheehy? Paul, if I heard correctly, this is an opt-in as restructured. So it used to be an opt-out and they could just say, we're, we're not gonna do this. And so everybody at the beginning of the semester was opting out. And then later in the semester, they realized, I want to use the gym. I want to use this other stuff. And it was too late to opt in. <laughs> so this gives them the opportunity to opt in at the beginning of the semester, pay a prorated fee and also have their own access to the various services that are provided. So I will support this based on the information provided today. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Any other uh, comments from members of the board? Any comments from the campuses? Again, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom or dial star nine if joining by phone. Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to action item G, request for approval to increase ASUM student activity fee, University of Montana, Missoula. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, moved by Regent Tuss. Is there any discussion or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, is there any comments from campuses? Is there any public comment? Uh, seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Moving on to the last action item in uh, the budget committee meeting, uh, request for authorization to execute a lease for a shop warehouse on behalf of MSU Miltech, MSU Bozeman. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, moved by Regent Rogers. Is there any discussion or comments from members of the board? Is there any comments uh, from members of the campus community? Any public comment? Casey, can you reiterate which one we're on? Sure, Regent Sheehy, we are on uh, action item H. Oh, okay, thank you, sorry about that. But, uh, is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will uh, call for a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Uh, motion passes. Okay, let's move on to, there are no action items in the two-year education and community college committee. Uh, so we'll move on to the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee agenda. We've got four items. Uh, first item is action item A, request for approval to revise a Board of Regent Policy 504.4. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, Regent Sheehy. Okay. Uh, a move by Regent Sheehy. Is there any comments from members of the board?
Is there any comments from campuses? Is there any public comment, any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Action item B, mission statement review, University of Montana Western. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, moved by Regent Miller. Is there any comments from members of the board? Any comments from the campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Uh, next item is action item C, level two proposals. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Regent Dombrowski. Uh, is there any comments from members of the board? Any comments by the campuses? Uh, any public comment? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Uh, last item for the day, action item D, request to plan proposals. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Regent Sheehy. Is there any comments from members of the board? Any comments from the campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. That concludes uh, the board meeting's action items for today. And we are near completion of today's, uh, today's meeting. Next up on the agenda, the last item is the annual election of officers. I will turn that over to Commissioner Christian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you all are aware, Article 4 of our bylaws calls for the election of officers, a chair and vice chair, uh, following the next gathering of the regents uh, after May 1. And so we were at that time to uh, elect uh, new or reelect officers. And at this time, I would like to entertain nominations. So we'll take these one at a time. We'll start with the chair and then we'll uh, elect a vice chair. Um, so at this time, I'd like to entertain nominations for individuals to serve as chair. Regent Rogers. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I would like to nominate uh, Casey Lozar to continue as chair of the board. I have really appreciated Regent Lozar's approach to the role of chair over the last year, uh, especially his steady, balanced style and his financial wherewithal. Uh, given his solid performance, I feel strongly that consistency and leadership during these challenging times will best serve the interests of the Montana University system. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rogers. Are there any other nominations for regents to serve as chair? Any other nominations? Seeing none, I will close the nominations and we will uh, call for the election. So at this time you have a nomination before you for uh, Casey Lozar to serve as chair. Is there any comment on that nomination? Regent Sheehy. 
I'd, I'd like to thank Casey for his service over the last years um, and uh, compliment him on the runnings of the meetings and how well things are going. I'd also like to take this opportunity to buttonhole Casey for a, a promise or two before I vote for him. Uh, <laughs> a couple of things. Uh, I beseech you to delegate a little bit. These are trying times. And you and Paul are both doing a lot of different jobs on behalf of this board. And it's kind of nice in this setting to look around and, and you've got a strong cast here. Um, Joyce and John and Bob and Brianne can all serve in different capacities. So uh, I support your leadership and I ask you to look around and delegate a little bit over the next year. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Any further comments from the board? Any comments from our campus communities? Again, raise your hand uh, through the Zoom or press star nine. <laughs> Is there any public comment? Any public comment? Seeing none, you have uh, the nomination in front of you to uh, elect uh, Casey Lozar as chair for the upcoming year. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Congratulations, Chair Lozar. Thank you for serving. Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, I would like to uh, open up nominations for individuals to serve as vice chair. Are there any nominations? Regent Miller. Yes, I'd like to uh, nominate Regent Paul Tuss for the position of vice chair. Um, having watched Paul and learned from Paul over the past year, I think he's done a fantastic job. Um, he has seven more years in front of him now, so who knows where to go from here, but good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Regent Miller. Any other nominations for individuals to serve as vice chair? Seeing none, I will close the nominations. And at this time with the nomination in front of you for Paul Tuss to serve as vice chair, I would open it up for comments. Any board members wish to comment? Regent Sheehy. Thank you. I'd like to thank Paul for his service, not just in this office, but in all of his prior offices. And I make the same suggestion to you that I made to Casey, which is you're serving in a lot of capacities and um, maybe in this second eight year term, you'll uh, might be time to say no to just a few things, not this one, but maybe some of the other things. Um, and one other request that I have as a member of the board is that I think it falls on the vice chair to be the communicator of uh, OG's communications and the commissioner's communications to the leadership uh, that's always been the link in the chain that we receive communications from. So I'd, I'd ask that you keep that in mind um, as you serve again in this office so ably. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Any further comment from board members? Seeing none, is there any comments from the campus communities? Seeing none, any public comment? And again, if you're on Zoom, raise your hand, or if uh, you're calling in on the, the uh, phone line, press star nine. Any public comment? Seeing none and hearing none, we will uh, uh, call for the vote. Do you have in front of you a, a nomination to elect Paul Tuss to serve as vice chair for the upcoming year? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Congratulations, Vice Chair Tess. Thank you for serving. Mr. Chair, the election's completed for another year. I turn it back to you. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you to the members of the board uh, for the, the election of the officers. Uh, I appreciate Regent Sheehy's uh, candid remarks. Um, and I always appreciate being buttonholed. So thank you. Um, I, your, your comment is duly noted. Uh, 
And congratulations uh, to Vice Chair Paul Tuss for another year uh, in the position. Uh, maybe just a, a couple final comments before we close today's meeting. I, I wanted to circle back to the opening remarks that I provided uh, as relates to sort of the, the agility and the flexibility and the, um, the focus that our administrators across the system, that our students, our students' parents, the staff and the faculty have put into sort of responding to the disruption from uh, COVID-19. And we're, we're certainly not out of the woods at this point. And we're going to be going through a, a number of conversations at the campus level and across the system and, and, and identifying the best ways to find that balance of protecting uh, our student in our, our campus community and the communities in which they live, while at the same time offering that high quality uh, education and in-person education uh, that we've always uh, offered to uh, Montana citizens and our friends from out of state who attend our, our campuses. So uh, in advance of, uh, of the adjustments and the change, and as we, as we really monitor uh, the impact of the pandemic, I just really wanna thank everyone for being agile and flexible and, and thoughtful and intentional about how we do what we do for the state of Montana. Um, and I look forward to uh, a, a meeting with the board members, uh, planning meeting here in a few short weeks. Uh, so between now and then, I hope everyone stays healthy. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Commissioner, the meeting is concluded. Thank you all. You survived a day of Zoom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See all Thank soon. You. Thank you. I thought you did a great job with this, Amy. It worked very smooth. Yeah, way to go.